Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the Luffy Fanfix, back with the amazing fanfiction. This is series of, what if Luffy time traveled with immense powers? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. The wind raced, seemingly wanting to catch up with something. The battlefield was covered with corpses, blood trailing from it and burnt putrid smell filling the air around. It was eerily silent. The only sound that could be heard was the shallow breathing of someone, lying on his back looking up to the sky. His eyes were void, tear trails across his cheeks and blood smeared across his face. The ever-present smile on his face was gone. Only thing remained was the emotionless face yet it contained thousands of emotions. It was as if he couldn't express how he felt. Then a small smile broke on his face. Guys, we did it. We reached laugh tail his voice was raspy and dry. He coughed up some more blood. No one replied. His comrades were dead, lying somewhere in the pool of blood. They had lost. It wasn't their way. They didn't usually lose that easily. But the enemies were strong. Strong beyond their comprehension. Some of his crew fell so easily, it was almost laughable. Some put up a good fight. The upper echelon of their crew maintained their own fight some extent. But the distraction between their crewmates falling and the power difference that still was apparent led them to losing their lives. Only one remained. Losing his crewmates and family had cracked something inside of him, something so powerful that the control of his own body was taken away. He was numb to the happening, only coming to control after it all ended. That power obliterated almost all the second half of Grand Line. It felt like the energies around them that is trapped flowed through him, something like an ancient god. But he didn't know, nor did he care. Apparently, the power was too much for his body to handle. He knew, he knew he was dying. Some part of his mind whispered that he had achieved his dream. But he knew it was useless without his family present. He had always wanted to die without regret, something that had been his motto for entirety of his life. Even at the face of his death, he wanted to laugh, like one another who held this same title. But he couldn't, not when all his family couldn't achieve their dream. He felt regret and sorrow. He wanted to cry, yet his eye sockets were empty of tears. He felt his life fading out, his mind echoing only thing that he wanted right now. If only I could have saved them, if only they could have achieved their dreams, if only I had another chance. Perhaps, because he wanted and willed it, or it was just the mysterious wish of the energies all around him, the place glowed bright white, enough to blind anyone present in the vicinity and suddenly, he was gone. Monkey D. Luffy, the second pirate king, one known as Joy Boy, traveled across the stream to an unknown destination. Luffy woke up, or rather confused as to why he was sleeping in the first place. He looked around, which was dark, he could hear various beeping sounds. He turned to his left to see many devices hanging off his arm, face. He tore them off and got off the bed he was sleeping in. When his feet landed on the ground, he was assaulted with agonizing pain across his body. He fell to the ground and screamed as he couldn't control his pain. His body started to morph, and his head was burning in pain. His head was filled with broken images, of which he couldn't understand quite well. He knew it meant something, but he was filled with too much pain to care about them now. His screams attracted audience, as the door suddenly opened, and light blinded him as he was in a dark room. His legs and hands started to grow a bit until he reached 6'3", which felt strangely familiar. There was a certain power that coursed through his body, but it felt constrained and left him feeling weak. He started remembering two different streams of memories, one reminding him of Ace's death, War of the Best, Whitebeard, Akenu, Sengoku. Another one reminding strange yet familiar names, Trafalgar Law, Duflamingo, Kaido, Big Mom, I. The pain again grew high. His vision started blacking out, but he remembered one thing that was consistent on both the streams to get stronger. He came around to consciousness once again after a while. He looked around to familiar faces standing. Traffy, how are you here? Luffy exclaimed. Trafalgar Law was shocked to say the least, and his face twitched at the nickname that was given to him. I had assumed you wouldn't know who I was. And my name is Trafalgar Law, not Traffy. Law yelled. He was shocked to see Luffy at least a foot higher than before, almost rivaling his own height. Luffy though didn't react much to what Law said. His paid wasn't completely gone, yet it was much more manageable. Where am I? Luffy questioned. You are an Amazon lily right now. Boa Hancock brought us here because you were in a critical condition and we had to save from Marines after. Er, well that happened Law said, trying not to bring up the Paramount War. What happened? Why would I be an Amazon Lily? Luffy was confused, and nothing made sense. Well, after your brother died, there was no place that we could safely provide you treatment compared to being under the protection of one of the warlords. Law explained. Luffy's face morphed into serious frown. He could remember everything vividly. Impel down, the war, Ace's death. It all felt so recent and so distant at the same time. He certainly felt grief and sadness on losing Ace, but it also felt like he had come in terms with his death. While Luffy was pondering upon the issue, another figure entered the room. 
Jin was covered in bandages and his wounds were healing well all thanks to the expertise of Dr. Trafalgar Law. Upon hearing the door opening and closing, Luffy looked up and he had a huge grin on his face. Jin, the rubber man jumped and hugged Jin in the blink of an eye. Jin laughed and hugged back, relieved to see Luffy in normal state rather than throwing tantrums. Luffy Kun, how do you feel? Do you still feel pain? Jin inquired. I feel fine, a bit weird if I say so myself. My head hurts a lot still, but I think I could manage. My memories are a bit jumbled, and I feel like I'm missing a lot of things. Jin frowned. Now that he thought about it, it was weird that there was pretty much no reaction other than the frown was given when Law mentioned about Ace's death. He was unsure whether to be happy that Luffy couldn't remember much about the traumatic experience or to be sad that Luffy couldn't grieve properly about the death of his brother. While Jim was contemplating about this predicament, rustling sounds were heard and a large boom followed up. A cry echoed through the air. Everyone in the room visibly tensed. Luffy's senses screamed of a powerful presence nearby, yet it felt so familiar. Everyone rushed outside to see a sea king floating on the sea. It was dead, blood flowing from its head. A figure climbed up the rock shore nearby. He wore no shirt, as he was carrying it in his hand along with his overcoat. He wore red trousers with a green hilt carrying a katana. He was old, his hair and beard white. His glasses reflected the sun, a vertical scar running through his eye giving him a rough look. When he turned towards the ship, collection of gasps was heard. Grin broke into Luffy's face. D Dark King Rayleigh. Rayleigh was swimming towards Amazon Lily as his boat was destroyed by the storm. As he neared Amazon Lily, he felt a familiar presence. He was happy that the reason why he swam all the way was alive. But something was wrong. His presence was enormous, similar to his own. The power rolled off of him was massive even miles away from where he was. As he closed in, the presence grew and grew. Rayleigh didn't really know what to make of it. He supposed he could make his confusions clear once he met him properly. Luffy jumped up and reached the shore, ignoring the protests of the doctors on the crew. He was really happy to meet Rayleigh. He immediately went and hugged the old man. Others were shocked not only by the antics of Luffy, but also the fact that Rayleigh was laughing merrily and hugged back. Rayleigh's mind was working miles a minute, as it was processing the enormous amount of power that Luffy's body contained. He couldn't sense this the first time they met in Sabai. He was thinking of various reasons as to why such changes occurred. Old man, what are you doing here? Luffy asked. Rayleigh snapped out of his musings and looked properly at Luffy. He could see he was grown a bit taller. I came to see you Luffy-kun. And I have a lot to discuss with you he replied. Jin finally came out of his shock. It's an honor to meet such a great legend Jin said, clearly a bit nervous. Rayleigh acknowledged him with a nod and said, The Night of the Sea, Jin, I have heard a lot about you. Meanwhile, Luffy felt something missing. He looked around and finally spotted what he was searching. Trafalgar Law held his straw hat. Within a blink of eye, he moved near Law. Law was startled to core. He had never seen someone move so fast. These didn't go unnoticed by someone. Hey Traffy, could you give back my hat? Luffy asked. Law realized he was still holding on to it and gave it to him. Luffy received it with a wide grin on his face but didn't put it on. Luffy looked at Law and bowed his head. Law quickly realized where this was heading. Stop. What were you going to do? Law yelled. Luffy looked up confused. I wanted to thank you for saving my life. Don't. I am sure we will meet again somewhere in the future. I guess you could tell your thanks then. Law felt guilty a little for manipulating him like this, but he shrugged it off. He wasn't a saint, he was a pirate. He had to use his chances. Luffy said nothing but just nodded with a grin. Law nodded back and ordered his crew to prepare for leaving. Some whined about leaving the island of beautiful women when they haven't even had a chance to go inside, but compiled under the glare of their captain. The place was busy, constant rustling could be heard, orders thrown out and people were working as fast as they could to complete the work. The castle was happy that Luffy was awake. The person who was probably the happiest was pacing back and forth waiting impatiently for the cooks to be done. She is considered as the most beautiful woman in the world, Empress of Amazon Lily and Pirate Empress, Boa Hancock. As the cook gave his signal about the food being ready to serve, she immediately rushed to the carriage which she uses to travel. She had prepared a banquet worth of food just for a single man, the man who she fell in love with. Man of her dreams and the thought of him brought blushing on her face in full force. She heard from her messenger that he was finally out of his deathbed and was awake. She couldn't wait to meet him with his goofy grin on his face. As she reached the shore where the ship was anchored, she spotted Luffy along with Jin and another person who looked familiar. But she completely ignored them as she made a straight march towards Luffy, comical hearts present over her eyes in adoration. Luffy, I am so glad you are awake she said gushing over his health. Luffy beamed at her which made her swoon and dance comically. Hancock, I am so glad to see you. Thank you for helping me infiltrate into Impel Down and for providing me with the key back during the war. 
If not for you, I might have not gotten the chance to meet Ace one last time the final sentence was said with a sad smile on his face. Hancock blushed at the thanking. It's no problem Luffy, I would do anything for you. And it was true. Luffy was immediately attracted by the smell permeating from all the food that is brought there. A huge roar was heard, and everyone turned towards Luffy. It was his stomach. He unabashedly laughed and immediately went to eat. Everyone smiled at that scene. It was good to see him behaving normally after Ace's death. Rayleigh, though, was confused. He had expected some commotion. He wasn't sure if the thing he had wanted to accomplish by coming here would happen. Once Luffy finished gulping down enormous amounts of food, he looked towards Rayleigh. Rayleigh motioned him to sit in front of him. He then stayed silent for some moments before he started to talk. So Luffy Kun, what do you plan on doing now? Rayleigh broke the silence that was spreading around them. I want to meet my crew and set sail again Luffy replied. Rayleigh looked disappointed by that answer, but he had expected it. But what Luffy said next was not on that list. But I don't feel this is the correct time to meet them. As a captain, I am supposed to protect them. But, as much I want to be there, I cannot be with them all the time. I don't feel they are ready for this journey yet. Rayleigh's eye widened and small grin etched his face. This was going better than he expected. That is a very mature way of thinking, Luffy Kun. But what about you? What are you going to do about this? I think I am going to train. I am going to improve my hacky and devil fruit powers. Luffy replied, unaware of the shock that Rayleigh felt. How is he supposed to know about hacky? I suppose he could know about that by listening to others when he was in Amazon Lily during the few days of his stay. But still that doesn't explain why he said improve his hacky rather than start his training. Rayleigh's mind was working as fast as it could. I think I have to keep that aside for the time being and continue on with my plan. He thought, Luffy Kun, if you aren't opposed, may I propose a plan? Of course, it is up to you to decide whether if you want to do this or not. Sure, old man. What is the plan? Luffy replied. Luffy knew old man had way better planning and decision making compared to him. You were supposed to meet again with your crew after three days, right? After receiving a nod from Luffy, he continued, instead of meeting again after three days, why don't you postpone it to two years? Luffy barely thought about it before nodding. I think that makes sense. They can train in the two years. He bobbed his head. Rayleigh mused that he has had way too many surprises on this occasion that he didn't expect. He thought it was better to go with the flow rather than trying to question everything. Perhaps he underestimated Luffy's knowledge. Yes, we could go to Marine Fort again and do a ritual to pray for the dead so to speak. It would also prove that you are not really dead and provide a message to your crew. Rayleigh finished his explaining. Luffy beamed. This was a good plan. This could provide a message to his crew that he wasn't dead and that they had to train for the new world and that he wanted to pay his respects to the Whitebeard and Ace. I think this is a great plan. Let's do it. Luffy exclaimed. He was excited to go already. Rayleigh laughed at his prochi's excitement. The marines in the marineford were busy fixing the broken. Island, there were marines running all over the island, shouting out commands as well helping those who were injured. Reporters were around the island taking pictures, interviewing higher officials about the outcome of the war. I am sure the marine would probably shift their headquarters to somewhere else a reporter spoke, but now might not be the right time. Yes, you are right. After the war, many pirates started to migrate more into New World and the pirates are more active than ever. Another replied, Ah, uh, speaking of that. Here is another squad which has come back after their mission he said spotting a marine ship entering the headquarters. But unlike other ships, the ship turned and started to go around the island rather than going to straight to docks. What are they doing? A marine yelled confused. The confusion turned chaos when they heard a cannon going off. People started panicking and started running around in the hope to avoid the explosion, but the explosion never came. A blank. But why would they do that? They are acting weird the reporter questioned. Marines started gathering around as they heard the blank shot. Has the warship tried to contact us? A marine captain yelled. No sir his subordinate replied. This is impossible. One yelled. Who had binoculars in his hand? WH. Why is he? What is it? The captain asked. It's Straw Hat Luffy. The marine yelled. Commotion started around with reporters gathering around for the interesting piece of news that they might get. Send that marine warship to bottom of the ocean the captain ordered. Yes sir his subordinates yelled and moved to work. Cannons fired from all the directions towards the ship. Fishman Jujutsu, sea current lifter. A massive wall of water rose in front of the warship, stopping any incoming cannonballs and preventing the ship from getting damaged. Is that sea knight, Jinb? There is another man on board sir. The marine yelled. The cannons fired again and the said man was on board with small pebbles on his hand. He threw the pebbles with precision on the path of the cannonballs. It intercepted the cannonballs on its tracks and made them blast in the air. Do you don't tell me, that is the living legend, former first mate of Roger Pirates, Dark King, Silver's Rayleigh. The Marine yelled. Others started shivering in fear. Just the aura of the Dark King was enough to make them almost piss on the spot. The ship showed no signs of stopping. 
Why aren't they stopping? A reporter questioned. They are circling around the entire island. It's like a funeral at the sea a marine answered. You miserable pirates. How dare you mock us the marine yelled and ordered the marines to fire at the warship again. Cannons fired from all the directions again. This time it hit the warship and fire started around the ship. But there were no signs of pirates. Just when the marines were about to breathe the sigh of relief, two figures landed on the island in front of the marine. Marines were shocked and tightened their hold at their weapons. It's Jin and Dark King Rayleigh. A marine yelled. They are on the island and are still alive. As the marines were gathering, another figure landed in front of them with a huge bang. The floor on the bottom cracked heavily with smoke flying on all the directions. As the smoke cleared, they could see Monkey D. Luffy standing in all his glory. He looked completely fine, almost as if he suffered no injuries from the battle that happened a few days ago. He stood at even more impressive height and marines felt chill running through their spines as they looked at his eyes. They looked as if they were blazing from the fire present from the sun. The marines stood in silence for few minutes before they gathered their wits and went to attack the three pirates, but they were no match for the three. Marines soon started to fall at a very fast rate. There weren't enough backup present in the island. Luffy started to run towards the ox bell present in front of the main building. The reporters followed him from a far distance, curious to see what he would do. Luffy grabbed the rope tied to the clapper of the bell and started to ring it 16 times to be exact. It marked the end of the old era and start of a new era. He then got down and went to a crack that was present in the island due to the war. He removed a packet of roses and dropped it down in the hole. He then placed his hat on his chest and closed his eyes in silent prayer. Reporters started taking pictures of him as this was a huge news. Torino Kingdom Chopper was tired and bruised, but he was happy now that the humans and the birds were willing to cooperate and live peacefully. Now the first thing he had to do was get back to Luffy, to Sabati. He slowly woke up and stood. He walked towards the entrance and opened the door. He immediately spotted a newspaper. He rushed towards it in the hope of finding something about his captain. As he expected there was some news about Luffy on that newspaper. Oh, is that so Luffy? I understood. He said, tears falling from his eyes. Also how did he get taller so quickly? Chopper questioned as he moved towards the center of the village. As Chopper reached the town center, he spotted the village leader talking to an old lady. He went there and waited for their conversation to get over. Finally, the man turned towards Chopper with a smile on his face. Chopper San, what can I do for you? He asked. Um, I know it's selfish of me to ask you this, but can I stay on this island for two more years and perhaps study the different medicinal plants present here? Chopper asked, bowing his head. He hoped they let him stay here. There were many things present here that could help him with the training. Instead of rejection, which he thought he would get, the man beamed at Chopper. Of course, we would be very glad to have you here for as long as you need. Now it was Chopper's turn to smile. It was a chance that he wouldn't miss. He would get stronger and provide support for his captain by studying all kinds of medicine present in this island. This was his promise. Boyne Archipelago. Yuzop was overweight. His eating did not stop until he heard the news of Ace's death. He tried again and again to escape this monster of an island, only to fail miserably. But that didn't make him give up. Not when his captain needs him to be with him. After his god knows how many tries, he sat under a tree, taking some rest as he was completely out of energy. He then heard a squawk. He looked up to see News Ku bringing newspapers. He took one from its talons and paid it whatever food he had, as he was out of bullies. He opened the newspaper to see his captain's face on the first page. He immediately understood the message. This was fine. He would use this chance to get much stronger. He also spotted Heracles sitting on a tree branch observing him. Heracles Sensei, please teach me whatever you know Yuzop yelled. He had to start his training from somewhere. Knowing about different things present in the island was a good start. Karakuri Island Frankie was messing with some devices present in the lab of the great scientist Vegapunk in the hopes to find something that could help him get out of this island. As he was looking at the blueprints of various devices, the news printer on the lab started printing again. He glanced at it and spotted the news about his captain. He immediately snatched it and started reading. The message was very clear. He was excited. What better place to get better other than the lab of Vegapunk himself? Perhaps he could build a laser. Tequila Wolf the revolutionary was cleaning up the aftermath of the fight that happened in the island. Robin was sitting in a carriage, warming up herself while thinking about the events of war. It was heartbreaking that she couldn't be there for the man who protected her and saved her from killing herself and the marines. She boarded the ship which the revolutionaries invited her and sat in the deck. She didn't go inside the ship. Not that the revolutionary were not trustworthy, but it would take more than a ride for her to trust someone. A revolutionary came out with a paper in her hand. Robinson, I think you should see this he handed the paper over to her. The moment she spotted image, she deciphered the message. A small smile formed her lips. She was weak, running away from marines and taking cover in pirates. That wouldn't do anymore. Not when she had to prove herself worthy to her captain. 
Not when she had a dream that she had to fulfill. She would become stronger. No, she would become much more. Sky Island, with Uria. Naomi was not out of the shock. Guilt over washing her. Constantly reminding her that she wasn't present when her captain, her best friend needed her. Currently she was in the home of Herdas. As she was preparing to leave, the sound of paper being delivered reached her ears. She went out to get the newspaper. As she looked at the newspaper, she understood what the message was. She went back inside the house to bargain. Ahum request Herdas for a home to stay in the Wathuria for two years. Herdas San, as you requested me to stay here for some time, after some serious consideration, I think I can stay here for some time before leaving Nami said, batting her eyelashes cutely. Herdas was confused. After a few moments, he realized this was her way of requesting permission to stay there for a while. He shook his head in amusement and asked the reason for the sudden change in mind. Luffy is an idiot. He doesn't know how to navigate in the sea. He doesn't know anything about sea. He will get lost and die if I cannot navigate him to the end of the sea. He needs me I also need him left unsaid. But Herdas understood. That is why I need to learn about Grand Line and New World as much as I can. I also get better at fighting so I could support him and help him achieve his dream. Tears were flowing freely from her eyes as she stared at the endless sky. She would do it, no matter hard it will be. Nakamura Island. Brooke was currently sitting at the cage, silent tears escaping his eyes. Not that he had eyes. He wanted to get out of here and get back to Sabai, but he couldn't, considering all his possessions were taken and he was being projected as a moving skeleton in a carnival. At least the guys who imprisoned him were making money. The requested newspaper name his way, and he opened it to see any news regarding his captain. He understood the underlying message present in the paper. Uh, Luffy Sam, I understood. I will become better and improve my music more it was a promise. A promise that will provide the path in completing another promise. Kamabaka Kingdom. He was beaten up and bruised. The constant fight to escape this island was something he couldn't give up. He was blaming himself for not being strong enough to stop Kuma from sending him to this hell. He would have to soon defeat these queers and escape. He spotted a news coup carrying a newspaper. He noted the message present on the newspaper. He understood why the captain took such decision. He also wanted to get stronger in order to protect everyone, especially the girls. But also, he silently cursed as he was stuck in this hell. But that wasn't enough to deter him from the path he wanted to take. He will get stronger. He will get much, much stronger to protect his crew and achieve his dream. He will also make his cooking better so he could cook the ladies much more delicious food. Eva, could you provide the recipes for me learn? Sanji asked. Ivankov smirked. Why of course, but we cannot give it anyone who requests it. Either you become a queer. Or you must defeat 99 queers present across this island to get the recipes. What? That's absurd Sanji yelled. Oh, not only that, if you accept the challenge, my people will try to put a gown on you all the time. So, you must not only escape from them, but also get the recipes by fighting them Ivankov said. This was borderline evil, but he didn't care. You bastard, Sanji shouted. He supposed it wasn't easy to get this. Fine, I will do this. I will get all the 99 recipes. He said with determination shining his eyes. He will get stronger. Sanji Kayan. Queers yelled. Sanji shivered. It's going to be a long journey. Kirigana Island. Perhaps it was a stroke of bad luck. Perhaps not. Zoro was lost again. He went looking for sea to get out of this island. But the island kept moving. Is it the same palace? Or is it not? Zoro thought, looking at the castle. Nah, it's definitely not Zoro grinned with absolute surety. He heard a crash behind him. He looked to find Perona lying face down on the mud. Who sleeps out here? Why are sleeping here? Zoro asked. Perona's face twitched. It was because of you idiot. She yelled, venting out her frustration of searching for this moss head for hours just to find him near the island. Is your sense of direction that bad? Zoro blushed in embarrassment. It's none of your issue. Why did you even come here? I wanted to show this she held up a newspaper with Luffy's picture on front. Zoro immediately snatched it and started looking at it. He saw the tattoo on his hands meant something, but he couldn't figure it out. He had to think on it. Times two hours later, he still couldn't figure out what the message meant. Doesn't mean he is going to give up. Times three hours later. Nope. Times four hours later. Not yet. He knew he was close. He heard sounds of someone fainting near him. He couldn't care. Times five hours later. He finally deciphered it. He understood what the message meant. He was weak. Being the vice captain meant he had to take care of the crew at the absence of the captain, but he couldn't even defeat a single warlord. How was he supposed to defeat bigger threats that was obvious to come in the latter half of the Grand Line? If he was to achieve his dream, more importantly if he wanted to make his captain achieve his dream, he had to get stronger, much stronger that he could stand by Luffy and defeat any enemy that comes their way. A while later, he was in the castle, bowing before his goal, world's strongest swordsman Dracul Mihawk. What are you doing? Mihawk asked, disgusted by a man who he deemed worthy of his succession bowing before him. 
Train me. What? Are you asking your enemy for instruction? I think I overestimated you Mihawk replied, disappointment evident in his voice. I want to get stronger. Get out of here. I have no use for a boring man who couldn't even beat the baboons present in the island. Blood dripped from Zoro's chest. If you are asking about the baboons, I beat them Mihawk eyes widened at the information. He beat them. The only enemy present here is you. But I am not fool to think I could beat you here. That is why I need to get stronger. I don't understand. You see me as enemy. Yet you seek my guidance. Why? I want to beat you Zoro replied. Mihawk started laughing. You want me to train someone who wants to kill me? This is just foolish. But I think you found something that is more important than your ambition. Oi ghost girl, treat him. We will start the training once you're recovered. Mihawk said ignoring the protest of the ghost girl. Zoro's face brightened and a smile broke on his face. 3D is crossed out and 2Y is visible. Oh yeah, there is a tattoo on his arm Perona said. Yes, we made a certain promise to meet each other after three days. But that didn't happen. Zoro said, 3D crossed out meaning three days. Then 2Y means, two years. Oh, two years. The meeting will be two years instead of three days. Even if we rush now, we are not ready for new world. We need to get stronger and meet again, no matter what. Zoro said, it would be hard pass, but they would do it. They are the crew of next pirate king after all. Amazon Lily, after the crazy adventure, hoping that the message that he intended to pass was received properly, they returned to Amazon Lily. Rayleigh and Luffy requested Hancock to take them to an island near Amazon Lily, which was called Rusukana. Jin, are you sure you want to go now? Luffy asked. Jin was standing on a whale. Yes, Luffy Kun. Then, thank you for everything Luffy said. No, I should be the one to thank you. Even though I am ashamed that I begged you to free me from the prison. I am sorry Jin bowed his head. No, don't sweat it. Luffy waved off. I wouldn't have made to Marine HQ if it wasn't you. So, show your face. You're right. There might be something I could do for you in the future. In any case, let's meet again at the Fishman Island after two years Jim replied. Sure. Luffy waved him off. Rusukana Island. Don't worry Luffy. I will bring you delicious food three times a day without fail with meat Hancock swoon. Excited at the prospect to deliver delicious food for Luffy. No. Hancock Rayleigh interrupted I cannot allow you to bring food and spoil his training. Hancock turned her head towards Rayleigh. Anger barely simmering on the surface. Why should you be the one who decides what I should do for Luffy? I will turn you into stone depending on your answer Hancock questioned. Holding Rayleigh's nose hostage. For food, we have it in river, lakes, mountains, plants and sea. Rayleigh replied. If you can't do that kind of survival, you cannot live the life of pirate. This island is perfect for Luffy's training as it has 48 seasons per year. He is correct Hancock. I want to train seriously and become very strong. Even though the prospect of delicious food interests me, I don't want it. Thank you for the offer. I have already experience on living this kind of life. Luffy said, drool leaking a bit. He quickly wiped it and grinned at Hancock. Hancock frowned a bit at the rejection, but quickly brushed it off and rushed near Luffy. If it is for Luffy's sake, I think I can do it. But how would I not see you for two years? Sadness was visible clearly on her face. Hem, Rayleigh-san, can she visit me once in a month? Luffy requested, hoping he would agree. Normally Rayleigh would have rejected it. But the power levels of Luffy were high for some reason and his guts told there wasn't much he would do here. And the hopeful expression of Hancock cannot be ignored. All right, once a month only. But you should promise you wouldn't bring any food or deliver him in between the meetings Rayleigh said. Hancock immediately agreed with several nods. Not that she had any intention of following the food rule. Then Luffy Kun, I think it's time for us to go. All right old man Luffy thanked Hancock and her crew for everything again. With the promise of meeting them again after a month. Luffy, please be safe Hancock prayed. As they were walking inside, Rayleigh pointed out something to Luffy. Luffy, ought to remember that tree. It is the safest place on this island. Even the beasts are afraid to come near it. He said pointing out a tree, which had a huge, pale white bark and leaves spread out like mushroom at the top. Luffy noted it. As he looked around, he could spot various animals, which also had extinct animals similar to those in Little Garden. It had various types of dinosaurs, tigers and elephants of huge sizes. Almost everything felt huge. But Luffy wasn't intimidated. Rayleigh stopped at a point, which was a huge opening. This place was said to be inhabited once. But they all were either destroyed or left this island as the wilderness was too crazy to support those kinds of human settlement. Rayleigh explained. Now, I wanted to ask you something. Rayleigh said. Sure, go ahead old man. Why did you mention that you wanted to improve your hacky? Did you have prior training about hacky from anywhere? He questioned. I am not sure. I know what hacky is. I also know how to use them. But they all feel. Weird, it is like I have learned about it somewhere, but I don't remember how. I also know I didn't know about Hacky prior to Marineford War. It feels like something has unlocked inside me, Luffy said, frowning a little. 
You know how to use all the hackies, including conquerors? Rayleigh asked, bewildered. Yes, and also other things with my devil fruit. Luffy answered. Hmm, perhaps can you demonstrate me your hacky? Rayleigh questioned ignoring the part about devil fruit. He will come back to it later. He didn't want to doubt his protege, but things leading up to this pointed out that he didn't have any knowledge about hacky prior. And learning hacky is not an easy thing. It would take years for someone to learn the basics of it. Yeah, sure. How about on that elephant that is trying to attack us? Luffy asked. Rayleigh nodded. Luffy went forward and closed his eyes. He concentrated on his observation hacky. The elephant is going to try to hit me on my left side with its trunk Luffy said. Rayleigh's eyes were wide as the elephant was still quite a bit far from Luffy. It took almost 15 secs for the elephant to come near to Luffy. As it spotted him, it swung its trunk, exactly mimicking what Luffy said earlier. Left foot forward, right middle swing Luffy said while dodging the previous hit. Similar to the first time, the elephant swung its trunk on the middle from the right. Rayleigh was in awe as well as shocked that not only did Luffy have observation hacky, but he could see almost 15 seconds into the future, which was a form of advanced observational hacky. Luffy continued to dodge the hits that the elephant was attempting to make. I meant attempting, as Luffy was constantly switching his place way before the elephant could perform its hits, confusing it. Finally tired, it stopped its attacks and charged right at Luffy with its right foot directly coming to stomp him flat, but Luffy raised his right hand, black sheen coating it in a golden aura covering his hands. As the elephant came down with its foot, Luffy's hand barely touched it before the elephant was blasted behind far away, crashing into several trees. That was Ryu Luffy mentioned. Once again, Rayleigh was astonished. Not only did Luffy know the basics, but the advanced form of armament Haki, also called Ryu. Wait Ryu. Luffy Kun, how did you know about the word Ryu? Rayleigh questioned. Luffy shrugged. No idea. It just came into mind while I was doing this. I was fighting with K. Luffy clutched his head in pain as he couldn't complete the sentence. Rayleigh watched this with silent contemplation. He knows something was up, but he couldn't completely point out what was the cause. He looked at the elephant, which he was sure that it was dead, or rather very injured. The aura that flared when Luffy hit it was very potent. Luffy Kun, that wasn't your full power, was it? Rayleigh questioned. Luffy shook his head. Nope, I had a lot more to show. But I don't think there is much that could provide me a good fight. Luffy trailed off. Rayleigh felt a strange excitement. Then, why don't you fight me? I think you can go all out considering this island is free from humans. You won't hurt anything that's important. He felt sorry for the animals dot 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 maybe. Perhaps not. Oh, sure. Let's do it Luffy said, excitement visible clearly in his face. Rayleigh drew his sword in a well-practiced manner, a black sheen coated it, red aura covered it, with black and red lighting traveling down the length. Luffy clenched his fists and brought it to a fighting stance. It was covered with hacky and golden aura raging on it. Similar black and red lighting traveled and expanded into the horizon. Rayleigh's eyes widened for a second before he composed himself. The kid also knew the advanced version of Conqueror's hacky. Perhaps this won't be an easy fight after all. A silent befell on the battlefield. It was eerie and unnerving. Both the fights were calm, but their eyes were sharp, contesting that to an eagle. The animals around them seemingly held their breath, locking their eyes on the new strangers to the island. The silence was broken suddenly by a huge boom that rocked the island. The sword and the fist clashed each other, or rather the oars clashed. The fists weren't touching each other. Lightning was flashing around. Breaking trees apart and the animals close to the vicinity went unconscious. Both tried to get the higher ground but simply it was stuck in the same position. Rayleigh narrowed his eyes and pushed the sword, forcing Luffy to jump back to prevent himself from getting cut. They clashed again, with Luffy swinging his leg, trying to attack Rayleigh in his waist. Rayleigh brought his sword and kept it vertically, stopping the leg. They continued to exchange blows, with Luffy shifting into gear two and sometimes gear third. Even though they seemed to be equal, it was clear to them that Rayleigh had the upper hand. They locked again into a power struggle, but Rayleigh got frustrated and forced through the clash with his sword nearly aiming for Luffy's head. They both panted, pausing their fight. Luffy Kun, I can still see that you are not going out fully with your power. Why hold it? Is it some form of mockery? Rayleigh questioned. Luffy immediately shook his head. No, I was warming up. I couldn't immediately access it considering it feels like this is the first time using hacky. Luffy said, but now I think I can do it. Let's fight again. Luffy brought his hand up to his mouth and bit into it. He started blowing into it, causing his body to inflate. Smoke covered the place as his body started to cover in hacky. Gear fourth, bound man. Gamu Gamu no. The smoke immediately cleared up, Luffy dashing forward with impossible speeds. Rayleigh brought his sword up to block the strike. It was more powerful than he expected. Kong gun. Luffy's hands compressed like a spring, shot out into full length, increasing the power of the punch with the tension present in his hand. Rayleigh flew back several meters, crashing into several rocks before skidding into stop. 
He looked at Luffy, who was covered clad with red hacky, bouncing on his feet. A round halo made of smoke formed around his neck and black lightning traveled down and around his body. They clashed again, with Luffy using his Rhino Schneider move, which was blocked by an uppercut from Rayleigh. Now, Rayleigh not only used his sword, but also started using various techniques that he learnt during his travel and his speed matched Luffy easily. They exchanged blows after blows, with both getting hit several times. Luffy was hit more than Rayleigh, which still meant that Luffy wasn't up to Rayleigh's full power yet. A strong punch on the mid from Rayleigh sent him back crashing into some trees. TCH, it looks like this isn't going to be enough to match him. I think I have to use that Luffy said. Rayleigh looked at him confused as to why he stopped, but then he felt it, an enormous spike in the aura. An interesting sound ringed through the battlefield, sounds of drumming filled the air, power resonating with it. Rayleigh brought his sword up, a grin present on his face. He was excited to fight with something that held so much power. Smoke covered Luffy as his went through his transformation. As the smoke cleared, Rayleigh could see the transformation. It sent a wave of nostalgia upon him for some reason. He then realized it was something he read about in Laugh Tale. Gear 5th his body was floating in air, his hair and eyebrows completely white. The previous smoke halo turned into fire, and it was swirling around him, his face etching a wide grin. It was similar to that of his captain. His expression was goofy, yet the power was not. Then his body moved. No, it blinked into existence before Rayleigh. His fist clashed into his sword and bent it into weird angles. Rayleigh's eye widened a bit, before he poured more hacky and fought with renewed vigor. They clashed again, Luffy's legs spinning like a pinwheel. They continued with their hits, the world around him were bouncing like castle, because of Luffy's power. But it could be seen that both are getting tired. Rayleigh then did something that was unexpected to Luffy. He brought his sword through an upper middle swing, but in the middle of the swing, he changed the tactics and hit Luffy with all his hacky in his head and continued with another hit with his leg, knocking him out. Luffy woke up after a while, the concussion on his head almost healed. It throbbed lightly, but he ignored it and sat upright. Rayleigh was sitting on a log opposite to him, cooking meat. His mouth drooled at the sight. Apparently, Rayleigh also noticed that he was awake and invited him to eat with him. He sat in front of him and started gulping down food at impossible speeds. After all he was very tired with the sparring. So, Luffy Kun, you were way better than what I thought you would be. Rayleigh started. I thought you wouldn't know much, if anything at all about Haki. Your records before the war also pointed out the same. I don't know how you learned about so quickly. Not only that you also know advanced forms of it. Luffy just nodded. Rayleigh continued, I am not sure what to make of it, Grand Line is a vast sea. I have seen a lot of things and experienced many, but I don't know how to classify you. Luffy agreed. He also felt weird about this. It felt that he knew how to fight like that. He felt like he experienced fighting and improving in the middle of the fight. That is also why it felt natural. Yet, for some reason, it didn't feel like he actually earned it. My mind feels locked up. It is like I couldn't access some of it. If I think, my brain hurts Luffy complained. I am not entirely sure about why that is happening, but I am sure you will figure it out. But there is one thing I am sure from the fight. Rayleigh said, Oh, what is it? Luffy questioned. I know that you devil fruit isn't Gamu Gamu no Mai. While you were knocked out, I thought about the devil fruits that I read in the book. I don't remember reading about Gamu Gamu no Mai. The grin and the heartbeat when you transformed into your dot 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 gear fifth was something else Rayleigh said. Luffy felt confused. His entire life, he always thought this was Gamu Gamu no Mai. Sure it wasn't the best power in the world, but he was content with it. But now, that heartbeat reminds me of something that I came across in my travels. But I think I will have to think a bit more about it before confirming. Rayleigh said, So, should I not call my fruit Gamu Gamu no Mai? Luffy asked, You decide what you want to call your devil fruit. He'll try to find about the original name anyway. Meanwhile, let's talk about our training. Rayleigh said, Luffy sat straight. This was something that he came here for, to train and get stronger. If I have to be honest, you have great strength, enough to stand among the top, even in New World. There isn't much I can train you on about, Rayleigh said. Luffy felt a bit disappointed at that. He had an inkling that this would be the case. Luffy was a shrewd in observation, especially with power. He was reckless, not completely mindless. That doesn't mean there isn't anything to teach at all. You could learn basics of different fighting techniques that I know of. You could also learn to use a weapon. Especially a saber or a staff would be useful for your fighting style. Rayleigh mentioned. Luffy frowned at the mention of studies, but then lit up at fighting techniques. True, there were a lot of things that he still didn't know. Going about just jumping and relying on instincts is not going to help him always. He also had used bow staff during his early days. It always felt fitting. But later on, after Sabo's death, he didn't feel comfortable using it. Perhaps he could use it now. Your hacky is good, but still could be improved. I reckon, by the time we end this training, you will be very powerful, only to be contested among the top players of the new world. Rayleigh said. Luffy nodded. 
That sounded very nice. If what it takes to protect his crew is to be the strongest in the world, he would do it. Then, let's all old man, wait. Luffy paused Rayleigh and ran up to the safest place in the island. He placed his hat and the Viva card that was given by Rayleigh. Zoro, Sanji, Nami, Robin, Usopp, Chopper, Frankie, Rook. I promised to become much stronger so that I could protect your dreams and reach our goals together Luffy said. It's a promise. He went back to Rayleigh and smiled. Let's start old man. Yeah. It's Rayleigh Sen dot 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 and oh, is it Master Rayleigh? Or Professor Rayleigh? Whatever. Rayleigh said. And hence began the training of two years. It was pretty clear to Luffy soon that sparring and learning with Rayleigh was no joke. It was pretty hard, considering there was no breaks in between. There was a power difference at start, but Luffy's growth was very high. The gap soon started to get less. Luffy started to win more. He learned the basics of Rokushiki, even though he had the base knowledge of Soro. The rest were very useful to learn. His speeds in Gear 2 were very high, almost rivaling the speed of Kizaru. He also learnt various forms of martial arts, which included fishman karate. Manipulating the water molecules present in the air to achieve the desired effect was astonishing. He completed most of this in two months, which was surprising to Rayleigh. He locked his devil fruit powers with sea stone and forced him to use only physical strength with restriction and hacky for the next two months. Suffice to say, it felt like he came back to square one again, but his resistance to sea stone increased drastically. When the restriction for hacky lifted, his hacky felt much stronger. He concentrated on increasing his observation range and his future sight. This was also when Rayleigh dropped the truth about his devil fruit. Luffy Kun, after observing your gear fifth form for two months, I think I am sure about what it is. Rayleigh said. Luffy was pretty excited to learn the real name of his devil fruit. I think it is the Hito Hito no Mai, model Nika Rayleigh said. It is a mythical Zoan devil fruit. Mythical Zoan ha. Huh? That's so cool Luffy gushed. Rayleigh continued. Luffy Kun. I know you hate knowing about the One Piece and treasures, so I won't spoil about it, but I know this is something you must know if you want to get strong. Luffy gulped. Yes, he didn't want to get spoiled. It would ruin his fun, but his desire to get strong was larger. So, he nodded. Every devil fruit has a will. It is the representation of people's belief. This fruit, by some impossible odds, fell into your hands. This was the fruit we learnt while we learnt about the true history of the world. Rayleigh said. Luffy listened with rapt attention. It represents the will of warrior of liberation sun god Nika. Though the user's body gains the property of rubber in combat, it is only limited by the user's imagination. Meaning, it is only limited by your imagination. It is supposedly the most ridiculous power in the world. Saying Luffy was in awe would be an understatement. Imagine having a god as your fruit and having Rissik. Whatever power in the world. How cool is that? So that means, I can do whatever I want. Luffy questioned. I don't think you can do everything. There has to be some restrictions. But you won't be able to know unless you try it. Rayleigh winked. It was a huge revelation. If anyone got the wind of such fruit in existence, they would do anything to get their hands on it. But then not all could access its full power, not as it was mentioned in the diary of him. But if it was Luffy, he could do it? No. He will do it. He will become the embodiment of Joy Boy of the New Era soon. Not that Rayleigh would mention that name to Luffy. Luffy's training was coming along spectacularly. His strength and power had increased exponentially. It was thanks to Rayleigh giving him clue about his devil fruit. His hacky's power increased too. Increased would be an understatement, but it is what it is. His weapon, which was something surprising that he found. He found it during his exploration in the ruins that was left behind by the previous settlement. Apparently, the weapon was the perfect conductor for his use. It could change its shape as it could conduct the power of Luffy's devil fruit. He trained it to use both as a staff and as a sword, but his sword usage was very preliminary, and he preferred to use his fists for the most part. He usually keeps as a bracelet which could be retrieved for use. It was around 10 months of training. The regular visits from maidens from Amazon Lily didn't stop. Hancock in particular visited Luffy very regularly and they talked for hours until someone had to remind them to stop. No one liked to do that job as not to incur the wrath of Pirate Empress, but they still did. Luffy was naturally a very social person with surprising depth in his knowledge. He usually is goofy and playful, but he was charismatic. His natural charisma and leadership skills flowed out of him in ease. While he was happy to talk to an experienced person like Rayleigh regularly, Without someone else other than him to talk to for days was boring. That was why he enjoyed spending his time with Hancock and his sisters. Hancock stopped blushing every time Luffy mentioned her name, but she was still completely heels over him. Luffy was still completely oblivious to it. Or it could have been that he had no interest in having romantical relationships right now. But that didn't deter him from enjoying the time together. The overflowing power from Luffy made them feel safe like they are in a protective cocoon of embrace. They brought him all sorts of food during their visits. Safe to say Luffy awaited their visits every time. Somewhere else on the Grand Line near Amazon Lily. 
The seafloor rippled, and waves rose and clashed against each other. Four marine ships were against a ship, which had submarine look on it. Storm brewed and rain started pouring. Pirates were attacking marines, bodies dropping on either of side of the ship. Eventually the pirates got the upper hand and captured a marine ship, completely defeating the marines inside it. But it wasn't fast enough. TCH, you guys are slow. It took you so long to take down a marine ship. A deep voice rumbled. Pirates around him shivered. One of the braver ones stepped in front. W what do you mean? We took down the marine ship pretty fast he said. Though if looked closely, he was shaking. That was fast. You guys have no sense of time. Sebastian, Garam, Knighton, show them how it is done the voice said again. It belonged to world destroyer Brindy World. A veteran pirate, who was deeply feared by the marines. He had a bounty of 500 million dollars bullies. Due to the commotion caused by Luffy during the Marineford War in Impel Down, he was one of the criminals who escaped from the pits of hell, level 6 of Impel Down prison. As the captain ordered, all the three mentioned jumped up, while the younger brother of Captain, Biajack started a stopwatch. Garam dashed towards the marine ship, carrying his huge cube-shaped hammer. He landed on the ship to the left and swung his hammer in the mast of the ship while dodging several bullets and swings from the marines. Being the shipwright of world pirates, he knew how to sink the ship pretty quick. He made the mast into cubes, which dropped down on several marines crushing them. He then dropped down to the spine of the ship, keel and did the same. The whole ship broke down into several chunks of cube, dropping into oceans carrying several marines with it into the deep down. Knighton was a short elderly woman, but her age didn't determine her strength. She landed on the ship to the right and made quick work of all the marines present on the deck with her quick and efficient hits. Sebastian was very huge, blue-colored skin and had the features of a fishman. He wore sunglasses and his strength was probably the stronger out of the three. He landed on the middle ship splinters of wood fly and hit the marines close by, piercing them. He punched the ship right in the middle, splitting it into two. The ship started sinking and marines fell overboard. All this happened in 30 seconds. Biajack clicked the stopwatch to stop. Brindy World nodded, impressed. He expected nothing less from his crew. He turned towards the sorry excuses of his remaining members. Did you see that? That is exactly what I expect from my crew. If you couldn't do that, you can leave he said. Some of the crew tried to leave but was shot in back by grains of sand enhanced hundred times by his devil fruit power. I never said you would get out alive, though Brindy World said grinning. Others shivered and trembled in fear, laughing nervously. Luffy jumped as he dodged an attack from Rayleigh. His physical strength was increased drastically, to the point normal cuts from swords and punches without didn't even scratch his skin. His normal punches destroyed trees and stones into dust and splinters. Of course, Rayleigh's monstrous strength proved its worth as he could still keep up with Luffy. But ultimately Luffy was the one who won the fights most of the time. Luffy was currently training the range of his observation hacky while fighting Rayleigh and trying to solve basic math. One would say fighting Rayleigh or training observation hacky was the harder thing to do. But for Luffy, it was the math. Rayleigh was giving him monumental tasks of basic arithmetic operation, but he had no aptitude of any sort for studies. He gave up on that task and just concentrated on fighting. The fight soon ended with Luffy gaining the upper hand and took away Rayleigh's sword and they both decided to stop the session. So, Luffy-kun, what was the answer for the expression I gave? Rayleigh asked. He already knew what Luffy would answer. No idea. I tried to solve it. But it was too hard Luffy said, no regret whatsoever present on his face. Rayleigh sighed. He should probably stop giving things to read to Luffy. The only thing Luffy absorbed like crazy was comics. He read all sort of comics and tried to replicate the things, which for a normal person would sound like a crazy idea, but with Luffy's devil fruit, there were many things that he could replicate. They had over 15 dozen comic books laid around the safe zone. Not that any animal dared to go near Luffy or any of his belongings. They were resting on the safe place when they both felt someone entering the island. Luffy got up and started running. It was a familiar presence. He was excited to meet her, but he couldn't sense her sisters or most of her crew. As he drew closer, he saw her standing in the place they regularly meet, impatiently waiting for him. She knew he had sensed her, like it happened every time. Hancock, how are you? Luffy shouted in joy. Hancock's face bloomed meeting her beloved. I am so happy to meet you, Luffy. Hancock swooned. Where are Sandersonia and Maria? Luffy questioned. Hancock frowned. They were supposed to go ahead. As it took some time for Hancock to send a mail to world government and talk to the officials about her not coming to the fight for world government. A few hours earlier, Hancock was pacing in her room, waiting for everyone to finish the preparation to go to Rusukana. It took about six hours to get to Ruskana from Amazon Lily. As the preparation were complete, there was a flutter of sound. She looked around to see a bat flying in. It was pretty clear who sent it. It would be perhaps something about her monthly spending or pirated apprehended by her. She could probably ignore it and send it later. She saw the red stamp on it which got her attention. 
She got curious and opened it. It was a summon, summon for her to fight against world pirates. She couldn't care less. She would ignore it and perhaps try to set, ahem, convince the authorities later. She had important job, which is to meet Luffy right now. But before she could tear the letter, Grandma Nyan stopped it. She and Hancock started to argue on about the issue of losing her warlord status if she continued to ignore world government's orders. Hancock ordered her sisters to go ahead and get Luffy his food, while she sends a reply to world government and then comes in a different ship. Hancock sent that she wouldn't be attending the fight due to her poor health conditions and then started her journey to Ruskana. Back in the present, Rusukana Island, they were supposed to come here before me. I had some work, so I finished it and then came in another ship Hancock replied. Ha, huh, if they did, I would have noticed it, but I couldn't sense them as far as I could. Luffy replied. His range was pretty impressive, covering as far as 100 nautical miles. Hancock wasn't too worried, as she trusted her crew to handle simple things. She opted to wait for them as she conversed with Luffy. As more than two hours crossed, she started to get nervous. Crazy things started to go through her mind. Luffy tried to distract her by telling her about various things. But he also felt uneasy about the situation. They both saw a ship coming in the horizon. As it drew closer, they realized it was the Kuja pirate ship. It was battered and damaged very heavily. Hancock's nervousness increased when she saw the sorry state of her ship. As the ship anchored, a crewmate came out of the ship. They realized it was Marguerite. She was very heavily injured and bruised all over the place. Blood was flowing from various cuts over her body. She fell, breathing heavily. Hancock rushed to her side and lifted her head to keep in her lap. Even if Hancock was very demanding and arrogant as a captain, her caring nature equaled her might. Marguerite, what happened? Why are you so injured? Hancock inquired. Hancock-sama. They attacked us. They took Maria-sama and Sandersonia-sama as hostage, she replied, breathing heavily from exhaustion. Who are they? Who dare to touch our crew and think they could escape the wrath of me? Hancock raged. They called themselves world pirates. The captain was very powerful. Both tried to attack and defeat him, but they weren't powerful enough and got defeated. He wanted to tell yourself a message she gasped out. What is the message? Hancock asked. Her rage was reaching peaks. Not only did that immiscible idiot dared to hurt her sisters and her crew but also took them hostage. Her conqueror's hacky, which she usually keeps it under control, was lashing out due to her anger. But it didn't affect Luffy even a bit. Marguerite was sweating but she wasn't affected much. He said he would wait for you, since he wanted to show to the government that their warlords were no threat to him and that he would kill them if you didn't arrive within a day. She conveyed the message. Hancock's anger was simmering in surface. It would be a good opportunity for her to teach the world not to mess with her crew. But this would provide to be a bad decision on her part, if she knew. Let's go. We don't want to waste the time. I will enjoy my time killing that bastard, Hancock said. But before that, let's get you and others treated. She said, Rayleigh arrived by that time, and they explained the situation to him. The three started treating them with what basic medical knowledge they had. The crew's doctor, after some time of resting, took over the job with the three helping him. After two hours, they were ready to set sail again. Luffy, I am sorry that we have to cut our meeting short. I'll have to get back my sisters. I will definitely return, and we will spend more time together later. Hancock said, as much she hated to leave Luffy, she had no choice in this matter. She had to rescue her sisters. She could only hope Luffy would understand. What are you talking about? Luffy questioned. Hancock looked at him confused. I am coming with you, you aren't leaving alone. Definitely not with these guys injured so much. Luffy Kun, you said you won't leave the island until the training ends. Rayleigh voiced his opinion. Yes, but this is a very important issue. Maria and Sandersonia are in danger. I cannot leave Hancock alone to rescue them, Luffy replied. Rayleigh sighed. There was nothing he could do to stop him from leaving. He would say to come back alive. But there wasn't much threat that was present in this part of the sea. Are you sure, Luffy? It was Hancock who questioned it. While she knew Luffy was very strong, stronger than herself, some part of her mind didn't want him to get involved and get hurt. I am sure he replied with a huge grin on his face. They are my friends after all. Hancock was once again reminded why she fell in love with this man. His caring nature for his friends and family being one of many. They boarded the ship and started their journey towards the predestined coordinates. It took about two hours to reach there. While they were nearing the destination, two were having a fierce quarrel on the ship. I will fight Luffy yelled. No Luffy, you have to understand. I know you are very strong, but I want to do this myself. He issued a challenge to me directly. It would be demeaning my position as a queen of my subjects. If in case I need your help, I will call for you. I think I can handle this, so please let me do this. Luffy didn't like the argument, but if Hancock thought she could handle him, then he would let her. After all it was her sisters that she wants to rescue. He would observe. If they were to be in danger, he would step in. No one will die on his watch today. 
They stopped at the destined coordinates, but nothing but the sea was visible as far as the eye could see. Hancock started to panic, but Luffy stayed calm and sharp. He had sensed several presences under the sea while they were about ten minutes from the destination. The sea suddenly parted, sending water in either direction. Huge's ship rocked back and forth as waves got frenzy. A massive ship rose out of the water. It had a big cannon to its front, and it was several decked, having a modern look to it. So, you came. Pirate Empress. Aurora. I can't wait to see you die in my hands. It will serve a good reminder to those marine dogs that they shouldn't underestimate us. World's voice sounded from the ship. His brother was standing near him, watching several screens. Where are my sisters? I swear you will die painfully if anything happens to them Hancock shouted, her voice carrying the rage that was present. Sister, why did you come? Maria's voice sounded from the speaker, it is unsafe. You must go back. Our lives are not worth your risk. What the hell are you talking about? You guys are my sisters. It'll definitely save you Hancock said. Don't say such things again. Just hold on. I'll come soon. Barororo. She thinks she could defeat us. How lame world said to his brother. But his brother didn't reply. Rather he was busy watching the screen. He spotted a young man with a straw hat donning his head. He looked thin but something about him screamed danger. Sebastian. She will come through you first. Don't make it too long. Finish her quick. World ordered. Yes captain. He'll finish in two minutes. Sebastian said. She doesn't look strong anyway. Hancock's vein twitched. She would enjoy making that fish suffer. She jumped up and landed on the deck of the other ship. Sebastian came out, puffing his muscles up, putting on a proud display. Hancock wasn't impressed. Miro Miro Mello she said, putting up a seducing display and trying to make him a stone. But Sebastian wasn't affected, as he didn't turn into stone like he is supposed to. Hancock paused it and looked at him. He was grinning like a fool. He took out his sunglasses. It could be seen that his eyes had two vertical scars, and his pupils were white, indicating he was blind. Boa Hancock's power primarily relied on her beauty, as the enemies produced the feeling of love and lust. They are susceptible to her fruit. It was also perhaps why the fruit was dangerous in her hands as she was deemed as world's most beautiful woman. Sebastian rushed forward, hacky coating on his hands and tried to punch Hancock on her head, but it was stopped midway by Hancock's raised foot. She applied Barrest of Hacky, which showed her physical prowess. She pushed him and started to attack him with her own advances. He lifted his cambo and dashed towards her, but she dodged and tried to hit him. Camouflage Sebastian vanished in air, leaving behind a mirage of himself. Hancock was surprised. Sebastian appeared in air behind her and swung his arm towards her. She was too late to protect fully. She held her hands in front of her in a crossed position and received the attack head on. She flew towards the main deck, breaking the wall and fell on the floor but she recovered pretty quick. Sebastian clicked his tongue. Time was running and she was proving to be a tough opponent. He jumped in air and ducked in his body. He started to spin mid-air, similar to a wheel, and advanced towards Hancock. Hancock stood, her anger was barely held. Her legs covered fully in armament, shine reflecting the sunlight. Perfume femur. Magna her leg crashed with his head, breaking his skull and sending him flying towards the window through which World was watching. He looked a bit shocked that she defeated Sebastian. I am disappointed in you, Sebastian he said as he watched his body fall down the cliff onto the deck. Just wait world, I'll come for you Hancock's voice rumbled. World just laughed, uncaringly. While this was going on, a few parties were watching from afar. There were three marine ships standing at the distance, watching the fight and relaying the information to Navy HQ. Another party was sitting in a coffin-shaped boat, watching the scene with disinterest. One more was watching from a boat, closer to the ship of world. It was the ship of warlord, Buggy. Buggy-sama, Pirate Empress seems to be fighting the world pirates. A crew member relayed the message. Buggy was observing the fight with a binocular. He was a coward who didn't want to get dragged into a fight with someone who was a very powerful pirate during the times of Roger. That was his logical mindset. But the greedy part of his mind thought of another plan. He wanted to take credit for the fight that the Empress was fighting, forgetting that the Marines were already relying live messages to the HQ. He ordered his crew to slowly creep up to the world's ship. Hancock rushed inside the ship. There were various tunnels inside, which was confusing her. She was eventually led to a room, her senses overpowered by the smell of medicinal herbs. She looked around to see if someone was present. She spotted an old-looking woman, but her observation flared warning, telling the woman was not easy to deal with. Knighton heard Hancock entering her room and turned to face her. Haha, welcome pirate empress. It's true, your beauty is unparalleled as they say she started. However, I have cracked the secret to your power. You won't be able to petrify me she boasted. Hancock just listened not replying. Eventually Knighton got frustrated. Hancock raised her hands and fired her mellow beams. Knighton immediately turned around and gulped down a bunch of what looked like a mix of medicinal herbs and leaves. She immediately started coughing and gauging. 
but she was surprising left untouched by the mellow beam as her focus wasn't on Hancock. She just raised her eyebrows at the weird strategy to escape from her powers. See, I have not turned into stone. My secret recipe worked. When I eat that medicinal concoction, it overrides my lust on you, hence negating the effect of your fruit she laughed. It must be awful for world government to have someone like you as a warlord. Move, I have to get to my sisters. Hancock commanded, but Knighton just laughed. She drank a green-looking liquid and sprayed it all over Hancock, making the clothes burn away due to some acidic reaction, leaving various parts of Hancock visible. You must be so embarrassed to move now. I'll defeat you. I am the Kanpo Kenpo master. Knighton laughed confidently. She drank another liquid which made her look younger. She rushed towards Hancock and started attacking her with her legs. But Hancock just dodged everything. Pistol Kiss Hancock shot a heart-shaped bullet at Knighton, forcing her to use herbs as a shield. She smirked as the pirate empress's attack didn't work. I am as strong and attractive as you Knighton said boastfully. Then could you do me a favor? Hancock asked, her face morphing a cute pose. Knighton blushed storm at that sight. Please shut your bloody mouth. Knighton realized and started eating so many herbs, but she couldn't resist Hancock. No matter how much she tried, she was too attracted by Hancock and finally vomited all the stuff she ate. She is so beautiful Knighton started to murmur as she started at Hancock. Miro Miro Mello Hancock used her devil fruit and petrified Knighton, ending their fight. TCH, another useless crewmate. I am going to finish her on my own world said as he exited the room, ignoring his brother's protests. Buggy entered a weird room, where he was cornered by Garan. They were doing useless banters. Buggy trying to defuse the situation while his crewmates trying to escalate and boast their captain into fighting the guy. The situation got out of hand as the huge guy swung his hammer on Buggy, converting him into a cube. He then tried to hit Buggy several other times. But Buggy somehow managed to dodge it and return to his original form, though his body parts were scattered across the room. The first thought that came to his mind was to run away. But the cheering from his crew gave a boost to his ego and he went straight into the battle. He shot a miniature version of Buggy Ball from the heel of his shoe. It combined with the compressed cube of air and caused a massive explosion along with smoke rising from all the sides. This was the exact moment Hancock entered into the room. She didn't waste any time as she proceeded to kick Garam and turn him into stone instantly taking the enemy's distraction to her advantage. As the smoke cleared, Buggy's crewmates saw Garam lying on the floor and Buggy standing victoriously. All they could think was to cheer him. They neither noticed the grey-coloured stone formation on his body as he was lying on his face down nor they noticed Pirate Empress getting out into another corridor. It was interesting that they had more focus on Buggy compared to the most beautiful on the planet. Hancock panted as she stood in a room that was dark, with spikes along the wall. She saw the cage that was present at the top, which held her two sisters. Her anger spiked again at the beaten and bruised state they were in. She desperately wanted to go and get them free. But she couldn't as the obstacle which was the sole cause of this whole issue stood in front of her. World was standing in front of her, laughing like a maniac. He was an imposing figure, with large arms and tiny legs. He wore a horned helmet, and chains around his chest. I have been waiting for you, Pirate Empress Boa Hancock. It's true that you are beautiful. Well, it would be a sad thing to hurt such a pretty body. He said with a smirk. Hancock raged. It was a look she hated to see on men. Shut up. I'm going to make you regret touching my sisters. Hancock yelled and dashed forward. She covered her leg with powerful hacky and tried to kick him. But World vanished and dodged the kick. Hancock's eyes widened. He's fast. She felt his presence behind her. As she turned, he was already closing in. She crossed her arms and covered with hacky. But she underestimated his strength. More more. Hundredfold punch his punch was very powerful as she was launched back into the wall. She heard a pop as her shoulders dislocated and her forearm bone broke. She cried in pain. World's laugh sounded in her ears. She gritted her teeth to prevent herself from giving that man any more satisfaction. She slowly stood up and focused. She could hear the cries of her sister, but she couldn't lose here. Their life is on the line. One arm hung on side as she had no way to control it right now. She applied armament and rocketed forward. They both clashed again and again. But it was clear that World had the upper hand, being an experienced fighter. Hancock's devil fruit wasn't of much help as he blocked much of it with his hacky. They both stopped. Hancock was breathing very heavily. While World still looked fine, with only tiny scratches, Hancock had major bruises and bleeding heavily. She started feeling dizzy. She had underestimated her opponent. Or it was perhaps her overconfidence in her abilities as well as the fact many men fell in her love-lust trap. She subconsciously knew it was both, but mostly the later. She hated herself for that. She geared up for one last hit, mustering up all her hacky and focused on her leg. She went for a kick to his head, hoping to knock him out. But World dodged it very easily and punched her heavily in her stomach, making her cough out blood and fall to the ground. She was barely conscious. She could see the dreadful and pale faces of her sisters. She had failed to save them. 
She could also feel the lustful gaze of world. She was lying on her stomach. She tried to feel the cloth on her, but she couldn't. She looked up to see world's widened eyes. He had seen them. He had seen the slave marks on her back. One thing she wanted none to see, that she would die before someone sees them. But right now, someone saw them. She could already feel so many malicious intentions brewing from his mind. He was saying something, yet nothing reached her ears. She was hyperventilating. She wanted to die. It felt so wrong. All the training, all the hard work she put in was so that she would not be in a vulnerable position like this again. She wanted to erase her past. She did not want to be taken advantage again, but here she was. She had failed both of her sisters and herself. She could only hope they didn't hate her and forgive her for the failure. She saw World clench his fists. Perhaps he would knock her out and have his way with her. She closed her eyes as World's hand drew closer. Tears flowed from eyes freely as she awaited the attack. But it never came. She bleakly opened her eyes to see someone she loved. Monkey D. Luffy was holding her in a bridal carry, far away from where World attacked. His face had a serious look, but the moment his eyes laid on her, it softened. He had understood, perhaps. She looked at him, her eyes telling him to kill her. But her heart was not. It wanted to live. It wanted to be free from shackles. It wanted to run away from all this and just be one with C. It was perhaps one other thing she had in common with the straw-hatted man. He laid her down softly, before removing his vest, showing of his amazing chest and abs. But she wasn't focused on that. She only concentrated on his face, on his eyes. It held so much depth and it continued to have much more. He put the vest on her, covering her body. You are too stubborn for your own good, he said. His voice was soft, so understanding. It is not bad to call for help. I am your friend. He smiled. It looked so bright to her. It was akin to a god looking on her. Luffy's usual goofy self was gone. Now it felt serene, compassionate. Don't lose your will too early. You are not going to die so easily. You have to live more, live freely. Branding doesn't matter. They can't touch you again. Not with me here. They have to kill me in order to reach you. She didn't realize she was crying until he wiped it with his hands. Don't worry. Nothing is going to happen to them. Rest now. You have done your part. Leave it to me. He spoke. And she would. She trusted him. Trusted him with her life, now and forever. She closed her eyes with a small smile on her lips. As she closed her eyes, Luffy's entire demeanor changed. Gone was the serene, young man. Now what stood was a monster. The straw hat covered his eyes. Suddenly the pressure around them dropped and the temperatures went cold. A massive presence filled the place and several miles around them. World started sweating heavily from the pressure filling the room and even if the temperatures were cold, his body was hot. The figure on the coffin-shaped boat snapped his eyes open at the presence. It was powerful, very powerful and very familiar. He had felt it during Marineford, but now it is on a whole new level. A small smirk played on his lips. He thought he would have to interfere, but now it seems there was no need. Perhaps he could return to his home and increase the training. At this pace, their captain is going to leave them all behind and go very ahead. World was nervous. Fear and dread filled him as he felt the huge presence from the straw-hatted man. W who are you? He said, kicking himself mentally for stuttering. Black and red lightning started dancing around him. My name is Monkey D. Luffy. I am going to be the king of pirates. World's younger brother, Biajack entered the room. World, I have heard about him. He is the brat that was responsible for breakdown of Impel Down and he fought in Marineford to save his brother Port Gaz Diaz. Oh, so, he is the one who failed to save his brother. World said, one part of his mind screamed at him for taunting the opponent who certainly is very strong. But he ignored it. Yes Luffy replied, no emotion present in his voice. I couldn't save my brother, but now I have precious friends and family to protect. That is why you will die here, he said. Maria and Sandersonia sucked in breath as they heard the dark tone of Luffy. Though, don't get too overconfident brat. World yelled as he charged at Luffy with armament present in his hand. More more, hundredfold gatling punches rained down on Luffy. Yet he dodged it all with minimal movement. He looked bored. World stopped his punches and got behind Luffy to kick him. But Luffy stopped it with just his hand, no armament present. World's eye widened at the power display. His physical strength was monstrous, enough to stop his hundredfold kick with just his hand. Are you done? It was the same emotionless voice that he spoke with. World's anger spiked and he started to go crazy with his attacks. But none phased Luffy. All right, it is time to end this. Luffy said. He drew back his hand and pulled. Gamu Gamu no. Luffy's hands caught in fire. The air around superheated. And it rotated around the fire in the shape of tornado. Red Hawk Luffy hand snapped forward at superhuman speeds that World couldn't even see it coming. World's eye widened when he looked behind the straw hat at Luffy's eyes. It was burning with fire, giving it a golden red color. It was impressive and terrifying to look at. But he didn't have enough time to look at that as he was hit with the punch which caused his insides to burn. Luffy's punch hit him in the sternum and ribs, piercing the lung and heart. He rocketed backward and the spikes along the fall punched holes into him further. 
His brother yelled and cried in despair. He tried to attack Luffy, but his frail body couldn't even scratch him. Luffy just jumped up and broke the cage that held Maria and Sandersonia and caught them before landing safely. He felt the ship being attacked from marine ships outside. He motioned Sandersonia and Maria to escape the boat as he carried Hancock. They all arrived safely at the Kuja's boat, and the crew doctor immediately started treating Hancock and the sisters. Luffy was unharmed, but he was strangely silent. He looked at it. It had black swirling with grey linings. He found it when he was training in sea with the Sea Kings. One of them just randomly dropped, which strangely felt weird as he never had seen anything like that. He knew what it was, as he had eaten similar one before. But this felt different. It was attracting him to eat it. He felt strange connection with it. He didn't understand. During the fight between Hancock and World, Marine had quarters, though, so Buggy and Hancock are fighting World Pirates. A Marine soldier commented as he talked through the Den Den Mushy. He was receiving the news on World's fight against Hancock, who sent her unwillingness towards joining the fight as a World, which was surprising and confusing. Her sister's hostage, Marine received more reports. The people currently available at the headquarters was one Vice Admiral, who was the only one who could order them on further situation. A Marine ran towards the Vice Admiral's office and knocked the door politely. He heard a come in and open the door. He was a tall, light-skinned, lean, yet muscular man with short dark hair, a beard, sideburns, and sunglasses. He had a spoon sticking to his cheek, which was comical, yet his expression remained neutral. The Marine saluted the Vice Admiral, getting a nod back. What is it? He asked. Vice Admiral Virgo. We have received reports on Pirate Empress Boa Hancock engaging in a fight with World Pirates. Virgo was a Vice Admiral and head of G5 branch of Navy. He was also secretly a member of Don Quixote Pirates. Why did she choose to fight him? Didn't we receive a letter of her unwillingness to participate previously if I am not wrong? Virgo asked. World was a dangerous pirate. He was in the level 6 of Impel Down, before escaping the chaos that happened during Marineford War. It didn't make sense why Hancock wanted to fight World suddenly. They said that they heard World talking about taking Hancock's sisters as hostage the Marine said. Ah, that would explain why she is fighting. While Virgo had no personal vendetta against Hancock, her attitude towards his captain infuriated him, and he was sure she would never be one that would willingly join their new era of pirates. She could only prove to be a thorn later. He didn't think someone like Hancock could defeat World, it was a set case. But World might be distracted by their fights that they wouldn't notice marine ships firing at them and sinking them. It would be a two win at one stone. They could also make the Kuja pirates subordinate of Donquixote pirates by saving the crew. Prepare to fire at the ship. World must be defeated at all costs Virgo ordered. The marine hesitated. But sir, what about Hancock and her sisters? He asked. Are you questioning my orders? I am sure they might escape from the attack. We must hit World when he is distracted, Virgo said. The Marine, sufficiently intimidated, immediately ran away and conveyed the order. What? We are supposed to fire at them. Are you sure that's the order? The Marine commander on the warship asked. Yes, that is the order from Vice Admiral Virgo. All right, we will do it. While the Marine commander was sad to see such beauty die, she was pirate at the end of the day. Men, prepare the cannons. As the marines fired, obliterating the ship that was in front of them, one involved was watching clearly, so clearly what could have happened if she was in that ship any longer. They wouldn't hesitate. They were world government's lackeys after all. As the ship slowly sailed back to Rusukana, Luffy was outside, watching as the wave hits the ship and rocking side to side. He was no stranger to killing. While he never willingly killed anyone till now, he has hit several marines on the spots which was instant kill. He just never looked back on them. But he actively involved in not hitting those he actually fought, which showed his willpower to hold back. He desperately wanted to kill people like Arlong, Luchi and that Tenrubito. But the temptation was always overcome by him. But this time, it went out of control, and he actually killed someone. Was it perhaps because the guy saw what is on Hancock's back? Or was it because it was him that was strangely feeling his bloodlust out of control? He didn't know. He wasn't much smart, but his feelings were always on place. His intuition pointed out that he was feeling something off, that he was forgetting something. He didn't know what it was. He wasn't going to whack his brain on it now, but he would find about it eventually. Luffy-sama, Hancock-sama wants to meet you, a Kuja pirate said. All right, I will be there Luffy replied with a smile. When Luffy entered her room, Sandersonia and Maria was sitting near the bed, all bandaged up. Hancock was lying on the bed. She also was bandaged in various places. Her face was pale and tear tracks were visible on her cheeks, which indicated she was crying. Yo, Hancock, Sandersonia, Maria, how are you guys feeling? Luffy asked. I am feeling good Luffy, Sandersonia said. Same here came from Maria. I am feeling good in terms of physical health Luffy. Hancock said, blush spreading across her cheeks. Shishishi, that's nice to hear. So, you wanted to meet me? He asked. Hancock's face dulled. 
It was the same with her sisters. Yes, first, I wanted to thank you for saving my sisters and my life, Hancock said earnestly. Yes, thank you, Luffy, the sisters echoed. What are you saying about? We are friends. Of course, I will help. He said laughing. Is that so? I am happy to hear it. Hancock smiled. I put my pride before my sisters, and it cost me. I should have been more aware about fighting such monster, but I underestimated him and overestimated my ability. At this rate, I won't be able to protect anyone. Hence why I have a request to ask you Hancock said bowing her head. Huh? Luffy tilted his head sideways. What is it? Aye. The ship reached Rusukana, and they saw Rayleigh waiting on the shore. Luffy eagerly jumped towards him. Hancock's sisters also came out. Sandersonia, Maria. How do you feel? Rayleigh asked. We feel fine, Rayleigh said Maria replied. That's good to hear he replied. Rayleigh, let us continue the training. Luffy yelled enthusiastically. Yes yes, Rayleigh replied laughing. Marine headquarters, did you receive any information on who died on the ship? Vice Admiral Virgo asked. We received the word that world died. His body was confirmed in the wrecks. But we couldn't confirm the death of Pirate Empress the Marine informed. Hmm, how peculiar Virgo said. Did she escape? Or did she die so brutally that her body parts couldn't have found? Virgo didn't know. Okay, I will inform the higher-ups about this. Do not mention anything about the potential death of Pirate Empress. Let's just inform that she disappeared after fight. Virgo ordered. What should I do about it, Rayleigh? Luffy asked. You say you feel like it's calling to you? Rayleigh asked, raising his eyebrows. Yes, I don't know why, but it's weird that I feel that. Hmm, normally I would say don't eat, but I will leave it up to your decision. Rayleigh said. Luffy looked at it for a few seconds before shoving it into his mouth fully. He then realized it was a bad idea as the awful taste made him gag. Then his entire body lit up in fire. Rayleigh, alarmed, jumped back into a safe distance to watch what was happening. This could very well kill his prodigy and there would be nothing he could do to save him. A primal scream tore from Luffy's throat and he felt his entire body in pain. Luffy's hair turned white and danced like flames. Luffy's eyes were white as the scream continued. Rayleigh's eyes widened as the white flames from Luffy's hair rose up to height and another flame also rose up. But this was in complete contrast to the first flame. This was the blackest of blacks and it battled with the white flames. The area around him was destroyed and half of Luffy's body was complete opposite to the other. Images flashed in Luffy's mind. Images of him returning from the two years break, meeting his crew, Fishman Island. The images stopped. He found himself in his mindscape. It was a room with half the side painted black and the other completely white. He sat up, thinking about the images he just felt. He didn't know why he saw them. Was it the future? Was it past? Was it just imaginary? What was the fruit he just ate? Luffy didn't realize he wondered that aloud. The information flowed into his mind, causing his eyes to widen like crazy. He could feel that this is going to change how he behave. Before he could ask more questions, he felt himself falling into a void. He tried to grab onto something, but he couldn't. He closed his eyes, falling into the darkness. Rayleigh could see the black flame and white flame joined together instead of fighting each other. Luffy's scream stopped, and he started to float in air. The flames rotated fast around each other, it was beautiful to see. Rayleigh thought he saw scales on Luffy's body before it disappeared. Luffy's body grew a bit, his muscles become big until it ripped of his current vest. His thigh and leg also become more stronger by look. After what felt like hours, but only two minutes, Luffy fell onto the ground, breathing heavily. Rayleigh ran towards his protege. Luffy Kun, are you alright? Rayleigh's concern was evident on his voice. Luffy coughed a few times, the gag taste still presents on his mouth. He fuzzily opened his eyes. Rayleigh stifled a gasp on looking his eyes. It was no longer just black. It contained a golden ring around his iris, with black filling it. The golden ring felt like molten lava flowing inside his eyes and the white and black parts looked like flames dancing around and heating the lava. Yes, Rayleigh. His voice was hoarse but was broader than usual. Just a bit tired. Thank God. Rayleigh breathed a sigh of relief. I am going to sleep for some time. Luffy said. Before Rayleigh could reply, Luffy was out cold. Rayleigh's sweat dropped. How does he do that? How could he sleep so fast? He questioned himself. After ten hours of sleep, Luffy finally found himself awake. He looked around, but his nose was attacked by the smell of meat getting cooked. He got up and ran towards that location. Rayleigh, can I have some? Luffy spotted the man cooking the meat. Rayleigh just laughed out loud. Of course, I still don't know how you sense the food getting cooked while you sleep. He said, Shishishi Luffy laughed while grabbing a big piece of meat and started eating it. So, how do you feel now? Do you feel anything different? Rayleigh asked. I feel fine. I also feel much more powerful, which I know why. Luffy said. Oh, did you come to know what fruit it was? Rayleigh asked. Yes, it is the. Luffy revealed the name of the fruit and its powers on a base level. 
Rayleigh's eyes were as wide as saucers. It was the fact that the original fruit of Luffy held unimaginable power, but combined with this, it would be unstoppable. This was on its own very powerful. If Luffy could train himself to access at his will, they would be very few who would be able to match Luffy on a fight, very doubtful that anyone could win. Do you realize the potential you have in your body? Rayleigh asked. Yes, I have to train so much, else I might harm my own friends and family. Luffy replied. Then, let's not waste any more time and start with it already. Rayleigh said. Luffy jumped up excited for a spar as always. Revolutionary headquarters, Baltigo. What? So, world got defeated by him? How sure are you? Our marine spies said a different story. A revolutionary asked. We are very sure. While the ships were busy on focusing on the world's ship, we silently infiltrated the ship and witnessed the whole thing at live. The other person replied. All right, I will convey this to Dragon San. The revolutionary went towards Dragon's cabin and knocked twice before entering. But he couldn't find their leader. But he spotted Nico Robin reading some files there. She turned towards the revolutionary. Um, sorry to disturb you, but is Dragon San available? He asked. He just went out for some work. Is there anything important to inform him? Robin asked. It is not important, but I think he might want to know about this. The revolutionary said. If so, you can tell me. I will inform him when he returns. Robin replied. Um, okay sure. I think you might also want to know as it involves Straw Hat Luffy. The revolutionary said, gaining Robin's interest. He then proceeded to convey the events of fight between Luffy and World. I will inform this to Dragon San. You may leave. Robin said. The revolutionary nodded and left. You grew so much within such quick time huh? I guess I have to ramp up my training Robin thought to herself. Somewhere in paradise. Is that so? Straw Hat Boy did that. A voice replied. Yes, I see. Thank you for the information. He cut the call. Tell him I called him here he ordered one of his maidens. You grew so much in this short time. I see the dragon's blood is very strong after all he thought to himself. It was time to increase the training. Another six months ran by quickly. Luffy's progress increased exponentially. Rayleigh won barely any fight anymore. It was on an odd chance that Luffy's handicap was so high that he couldn't function well did Rayleigh had any chances of beating him. Rayleigh was sure Luffy would beat him even in his prime at this stage. The New World monsters were at a huge level, but Luffy now could match them easily. There was around 10 months left before the two-year ends. There was nothing that's left for Rayleigh to teach. Luffy was sufficiently powerful to face anything that will be thrown in his way. It was up to Luffy to decide what to do for the next 10 months. So, Rayleigh you are leaving? Luffy asked while biting through a piece of meat. Yes, there is nothing left for me to do here. I will be returning to Sabai. I will await your return in 10 months. He spoke. Done. We will meet again in 10 months then. Luffy said smiling widely. What do you plan on doing? Rayleigh asked. I think I will be traveling back and forth to Amazon Lily often. I have a request to fulfill there. I will also be training my other devil fruit as much as possible. It can still be erratic. And it has changed my emotions a lot already. I want to be in control as much as possible. Luffy replied. Oh, I see. Then good luck. We will meet again. Rayleigh waved his goodbye and swam away. Okay then. I guess I will wait till Hancock comes to meet me again. He said and promptly went to sleep. Hancock, are you sure you want me to do this? He asked. Yes, Luffy. You are the only one who I trust with this. And also, you are much more powerful than anyone present on this island. There is no one else in better position than you. Hancock said. Flashback. Hence why I have a request I have to ask you Hancock said, bowing her head. How Luffy tilted his head sideways what is it? I want you to be our sparring partner. Hancock said. What? Me as sparring partner? Luffy asked. Yes, you are the only one who I trust for that. Others might try to take advantage of it, but I know you will never do like that. So please do this. Hancock asked. Huh. Okay sure. Luffy said. Hancock slowly rubbed the tears out of her eyes and smiled. Flashback ends. All right then. Come at me Luffy said, his hand getting a black coating. Hancock grinned and charged. Luffy, it is time. The ship is waiting for you Marguerite yelled. Yeah, I'm coming. Luffy said. He walked towards the big tree at the foot of which was his hat and the Vivre card. Man, has it been two years already? He said to himself, looking at the hat. He grabbed it and walked towards Marguerite. Marguerite loaded her bow and drew it towards the three huge animals that looked intimidating. They were slowing approaching her with drool dropping from their mouth. Oi Luffy's strong voice rumbled. Watch it, she is my friend. A glare and those animals were subdued, falling at the feet intimidated. Amazing, he is like the king of the jungle. Maria commented. And my king as well Hancock swooned. Marguerite breathed a sigh. Luffy, ship is ready to sail at any moment. Okay, thanks he said and walked towards the animals. I became friends with these guys, so I couldn't eat them. They look so delicious though, he said, salivating at the thought of eating them. The animals let out a small whine. Don't worry Luffy, we have plenty of food at our ship. Hancock said, 
This might make me a thoughtful wife in our future. I don't think I'm going to get married, but thank you for the food. Luffy replied. Uh, I can't stop loving you even though you are so bitter she cried. Rayleigh left this island almost 10 months ago. He must be waiting for you at Sabati to meet you. Yes, he had taught me everything he could within that period. Luffy replied. He was wearing a blue vest which exposed his arms and abs. He was around 6'7 in height. He wore a blue trouser, his calves visible. He had black coat donned on his shoulders with golden trimmings. It was fluttering, giving him a strong and intimidating look. Many Kuja pirates had pink cheeks but covered it in order to not face their empress's wrath. All right, let's go Luffy said, putting his hat on his head completing his look. Luffy, before that, I have a request for you Hancock said. What is it? He asked. I want to join your crew she replied. Hey, Luffy yelled. She was afraid. She was afraid of his refusal. They bonded close together during the training. It has though nothing but increased her love for him. She knew he didn't really think of romantic interests now. But she also knew that wasn't the real reason why she wanted to travel with him. She realized months ago that there was a dream. A dream she buried within the depths of her mind when she was enslaved. Then her dream was to only become free from the hellhole that she was in. When she was freed, she became the queen of her land. Her people became important. She buried it deep under the piles of other things. She had been in fights before, but thanks to her unnatural physical power or her expertise in her hacky, or the most important of all, her devil fruit and her beauty made it possible to escape the fights without major injuries. But perhaps for the first time when she actually was close to death, it made her regret. While she didn't regret the fact that she lived for and with her people, she regretted that she never gave her dream a chance. Perhaps it was the fear of getting captured and letting the world know that she was a former slave of the world government. She didn't know how her people would treat her if that truth came out. She knew that was a scar that would never heal. Also, there is also that her kingdom might not be safe when she travels. But now, she is sure that there is factor that is going to be a major power in the world. She was sure that the factor will protect her island. Her sisters also grew up to be a major reckoning force. Their spars with him have improved their abilities to such extent that it will be safe to leave the island in their hands for now. Her reasons to skip on her dream had suddenly vanished. The new vigor to explore the world had borne anew in her heart. The call of sea was too much for her to ignore anymore. She knew she has to do it. Her dream of exploring the vast seas beyond the paradise. But it was all possible because of one man. From his entry into her world till now, it has always been chaotic. Yet she learned to like it, she has come to love it. He was a stranger, then he was barely an acquaintance. But that turned very quick into love. At first it was something she was stranger to, even though having a literal fruit named on it. The more she spent her time with him, the more she realized what it was. At first it was just a crush, which she realized later on how idiotic she behaved. But safe to say, she truly loved him now. His strength surpassed hers by several magnitude. His natural charisma attracted everyone and all. He was a captain, his leadership skills were nothing but the top. And moreover, he was kind. Kind to those who are his friends and family. He saved her when she was at the lowest of her life. Now she would gladly serve someone whom she is ready to dedicate her entire life to and trust her kingdom with her sisters. Sure, but why suddenly? Luffy's voice broke through her musings. Hancock's face gained a beautiful smile and she wanted to jump around in joy. I want to explore the world. It has always been my dream to do so. And what better way to do it other than being on the side of the future pirate king? Hancock said grinning. Luffy laughed at that. What about your crew and your kingdom? Luffy inquired. They will be fine. My sisters are strong enough to handle most of the things thrown at them for now. The marine power is less at paradise now and they are focused more on the new world. If it is very important, I hope you will let me handle it. Hancock asked. Shishishi, don't worry. I won't let anyone hurt this island. After all, this is one of my crewmates' homeland and it has my friends. Hence I will protect it. Luffy's golden ring and his orbs burned with determination. His black coat fluttered in air, perhaps indicating his will has been heard and acknowledged. Tears flowed from her eyes at the promise. Hancock was beyond ecstatic at the declaration. She learned the truth behind the devil fruits of his during their time training. She had already witnessed the power behind of one transformation. Now, that the will of a god has been acknowledged, she only feels pity for the future opponents. Maybe. Sister, are you sure about this? Maria asked. They have already talked about this. They were sad that their sister was going. She was happy about the fact that she is going to follow her dream. Yes, I am sure. I trust you guys to take care of the island. Hancock said smiling. The sisters nodded. They would promise her that. They wouldn't have to intimidate Luffy into taking care of their sister. They already know she is in the best hands. Salem wrapped around her as she rested her hand. Then Luffy, let's board the ship and go to Sabayati. Sure, let's go Luffy replied, excited. He couldn't wait to see how much everyone has grown. Sun shined, though most of it was stopped by the thick canopy of branches covering the islands. The lumps of islands were covered in flush green grasses, the roots of the trees running deep into the land. 
producing bubbles through its perspiration. The bubbles rose up higher into the atmosphere and popped. The sound vibrated as a figure slowly walked towards an uphill. Sounds of sword hilts hitting each other, reverberating as he walked. Shaki's rip-off bar. It has been two years. It went fast now that I think about it. Shaki commented as she served a drink to her husband. I can't wait to see how much they have grown in these two years. Don't be hasty Rayleigh said. We don't even know if they all can get together safely first. They are very infamous throughout the world now. The sound of door opening was heard by them. Rayleigh didn't look up and continued drinking his drink. But his face gained a surprised look. Oh, you are the first one to arrive here. He commented. The swordsman at the door grinned. What? No one arrived yet. He spoke. They never change. At a certain bar, pirates who have survived and beaten their way through have started gathering here in the droves again. The arrival of Kid Drake and the rest two years ago was exciting. Now that the generation is making its waves in the new world, I also want to do that. But there are only a few rookies who have their bounties above 100 million. A pirate was talking to his comrades as he was drinking. It is pretty surprising considering after that way. There was none who heard from them. The straw hat pirates who everyone thought was dead appeared suddenly on this island. And not only that, but they also plan on recruiting. They plan to expand their crew and go wild in the new world. He said excitedly. Maybe I should also apply for it he said holding out a poster which had the crossbones of the straw hats and a text which said that it is recruiting. Don't be a fool another guy reprimanded. It clearly says people who have bounties over 100 million only. A woman perked up at the mention of straw hats but didn't show any more reaction. The marines changed the location of the marine HQ the barkeeper said, gaining the attention of the women. You know where it is. Is it at Marineford which is next to this place? She asked. They had switched its position with the G1 branch which was on the next side of the red line. This was the decision of the new fleet admiral who replaced Sengoku. He wanted the HQ to be on the Sea of the Four Emperors. Thanks to that, the threat of HQ was removed and the number of lawless areas in this island has risen. It is too dangerous to roam outside alone. He said sighing. So, that's why. I thought this place seemed wilder and rougher when compared two years ago. She said. She was Nami, the navigator of the Straw Hat Pirates. Who, did I miss here? Or you said it wrong. A rough voice bellowed out in the bar. A measly 55 million bounty. A scream was heard as a gun was shot on a pirate's leg. Go back and read the poster clearly. I said 75 million at the least he said. He was the captain of the Straw Hat Pirates, Monkey D. Luffy. This was a fake imitation of the real ones though assuming the position as the original one was assumed dead. How merciless. Straw Hat Luffy someone in the bar commented, sweating from the fear. It's no use, they have a history of achievements. The pirate was shot dead on the forehead again by him. Hey Frankie, how many people have showed up so far? He asked sitting back on the couch. About 1,000. And over six whole pirate groups have joined us completely, including 50 people with bounties. Frankie said. And two of them are rookies who have made names for themselves having bounties over 100 million. They are famous for killing marines. Wet hair caribou and blood splatter corbu he said they are brothers each of bounties. 210 million and 190 million. They are going to come in handy Luffy laughed. The others in his crew with him also laughed. We will keep gathering more too. He said, hey old man, bring me the most expensive sake you have. He then spotted Nami. Ah, and the woman who has been sitting over there. You look you are lonely by sitting and drinking all alone. Come over here he said licking his lips. That's a fine one he thought. No thank you she rejected, having no interest in even glancing at the direction of those imitating fools. I am waiting for a man. The others in the bar looked shocked at the declaration. They were praying that she would stop talking without thinking and just join them. Life was more important than whatever pride she had. Whoa whoa, listen to that guy whatever he says. He is the straw hat Luffy. He is the crazy pirate who charged into the War of Summit two years ago. Remember, the barkeep tried placating the issue by taking Nami in to listen to them. Ha ha ha, waiting for a man. Whoever he is, he will fall on our captain's feet and beg for mercy soon. Now get your ass over here Sojking said. I will only say once more. Got it. I got no interest in you. So, I am not going to drink with you. Nami said with disgust visible plainly on her face. Understood. Straw. What was the name again? A vein bulged and twitched on Luffy's face. And he loaded his gun with a click. My name is Straw Hat Luffy he growled out and pointed his gun at her. Another woman placed her hand on his gun and gently pried it from his grip. Let me take care of this captain her voice was sickly and too sweet for liking. She advanced towards Nami and placed an arm around her shoulders and pointed the gun at the temple of Nami. But Nami didn't look intimidated at the slightest. She was short and had her orange hair flowing out like a mop. Now listen here, you have two options. Either to accept Captain Luffy's invitation or die. She said, by the way, just for your information, I have a bounty on my head too. I am the cat bugler Nami. Don't you forget that. The fake Nami said. Nami didn't reply but just continued drinking her drink. 
Another figure opened the door and pointed his weapon at the Nami. Special attack. Green star he said in a low voice, barely audible to anyone. He released a green ball through his kabuto which traveled and hit the ground below Nami. Devil he said. And a monstrous looking plant grew from the ball and grabbed Nami with its mouth. It looked like Venus flytrap plant but bigger. Ache. Nami yelled as she went up into air what is this? She shouted. Hey, what is going on? Luffy said in shock. A plant? Help me. Captain the woman yelled for help. The mystery figure sat beside Nami, who was staring at the scene happening at the bar. Hey, girl he called out. Nami turned towards the man. He was wearing a hat and wore a bag around his shoulders. Will you drink with me? He used a finger to lift his hat and reveal himself as Yuzop. Nami's face bloomed into a huge smile and immediately hugged him. Yuzop, it's been a long time since I saw you. Look at you, you have grown so much. Nami gushed. Yuzop was standing a foot taller. His chest and arms looked ripped. His muscles looked chiseled, and his overall figure looked pretty strong. Well, you seem to be blossomed as well Yuzop managed to blurt out. That skinny guy was the one you were waiting for. Frankie of the Straw Hat Pirates commented. Though the guy had poor eyes, as Yuzop no longer looked skinny as he used to do. The plant had moved towards the rest of the pirate group, seemingly having consciousness, and wrapped several of its stems around the pirates. They were now hanging upside down. Did you do that? Nami asked, pointing at the plant. Yes, that is my new weapon, Pop Green. I did more than just stare at the ocean for the two years, Yuzop said. He crossed his legs and pointed himself. Sorry but, I no longer belong to the weakling trio with you and Chopper anymore. I have become a true warrior he said grinning. Hey kid, don't tell me you did this, Sojking said. What? Sojking? Hell, Yuzop exclaimed. Ignore those guys, Yuzop Nami said and started to pull Yuzop outside. Let's go somewhere else, I have something to ask you about. Hold it, don't you guys know who I am? Luffy yelled at the duo. Hey, Luffy, Yuzop said, shocked again. Yuzop then threw a bag full of coins to the bartender, paying for Nami's drink and went out. Get those two, we gotta make an example of them for trying to hurt us Luffy yelled. Oi, what are these black bubbles? Frankie commented sweating. The said bubbles popped and black clouds poured out of it and mixed with several other clouds, darkening the interior. Luffy's face paled and he felt the air pressure drop. The whole bar exploded in brilliant light as several lightning hit the pirate group and the bar altogether. Several bystanders and shoppers looked shocked and confused at the scene. Seriously, you were in Sky Island, Yuzop exclaimed as they walked away from the scene. Finally, the lightning died down and the door opened slowly to reveal the charred and smoking form of Luffy and the Straw Hat Pirates. Find those two and kill them Luffy growled out the order, his face visibly angry from the previous stunt. Grove 44, Shoreline, a man clad in black suit jumped out of the ship. His eyes wandered around until it locked on the feminine species of humanity. His eyes turned into hearts, and he started jumping around in joy. Ah, uh, it's a woman. A real woman. Sanji cried. This island contains real women, just as I imagined. The women around him started to get away, and distance themselves from this perverted man. Viva Sabati. I need Lady S. Sanji cried as he ran towards them. The woman screamed and tried to escape from him. Sanji Kai in a coarse voice sounded from behind, stopping him on his tracks. The voice made him shiver and he turned around to face the Akamas of Kamabaka Kingdom. Looks like we have to say goodbye, Sanji. We will miss you. We will be seeing you. They said and gave him a smooch. Sanji looked pretty disgusted at it. He pointed them his middle finger. I never want to see you guys again. But thanks for bringing me here. Convey my regards to Iva he said and stared running into the island. You know what they say. Boys are pretty wild like that. They pretend to hate the girls that they like. I don't think I'll ever stop thinking about him one of the Okama mentioned. Wait for me Nami-san. Robin-san. The manly Sanji has returned from hell he yelled while running. Grove 13, Shaki's Bar. The first one here was that idiotic swordsman. The seas are going to be rough for our restart, Sanji said. The second one to arrive was Frankie. He came about ten days ago and went straight to the ship said Shaki. Sanji was relieved to hear that Sunny was safe. He was worried about leaving the ship and attended for a long while. But it seems his worries were for naught. Not a single scratch on her. I finished coating her too and he did a great job too, said a voice behind him. It was Rayleigh. Call it a badge of honor. I regret nothing I done, Duval said, who was in bed due to various injuries. A year to recovery his subordinates chorused in the background. Duval tried to wink, but it came out as a grimace. We owe you a big time, Duval. I didn't realize you were so dutiful, Sanji said but Duval thought that he was called as handsome and felt so proud of himself. I went through a lot and faced the wrath of nature, but I stood on my ground and protected the ship from those bloodthirsty pirates, day after day after day. I was hurting all over, but I kept on fighting Duval said while his crewmates cried hearing the sad story. And Nami showed up third Shaki continued. On hearing this Sanji started to swirl as he was very excited to meet the ladies. Blood poured through his nose at the excited thought. 
Yuzop arrived fourth, Chopper was fifth, who arrived yesterday, and you came after him. Brooke came to this island for a concert. So, in total, there are seven of you on the archipelago. Shaki said, only Nico Robin and Luffy is yet to arrive on the island. Rayleigh said, it's no easy feat to reach this island. You guys are really an amazing bunch. Still, I can't believe you trained Luffy. He must be very powerful now. Sanji commented. Rayleigh smirked. Oh, he is. I can't even imagine how powerful he is now. Rayleigh said. Sanji got a bit confused at the smirk Rayleigh gave. But his thoughts wandered off to the ladies and blood started to pour again. I can't wait to see how much they have grown Sanji commented while others sweat dropped. Somewhere on the island. Reporting from Sabadi Archipelago. We have located Nico Robin. A cipher Paul agent spoke through the Den Den Mushy. Don't kill her. We need her alive the voice from other side ordered. Nico Robin was wearing sunglasses with a backpack. She mingled with the crowd and managed to escape from the followers without much effort. She was holding a bunch of flyers. Brooks concert. Straw hat pirates recruitment. What is going on here? Robin wondered out aloud. Grove 33, a concert hall. Can't you do anything for us? A man whined. I am sorry, but the tickets are sold out. This is the Soul King Brooks final live concert. The concert hall is packed full the ticket seller said. Manager, let's make this the greatest concert ever. A voice sounded. He had black shirts and floral patterned pants. He also wore heart-shaped sunglasses and party hat. Definitely, you are the king of soul music. This is going to make us a lot of money. The manager, who had long arms with two elbows, exclaimed, Before the concert, I have something important to tell you Brooke said. What is it? Rook. Rook. The audience cheered as the star of the show walked in on the stage. I am all bones. Let's make this show the greatest ever baby. Brooke yelled into the mic. The nerve of him to say such thing. I will make sure he will regret his decision. A voice plotted darkly in the background as the concert started. Grove 47. Oi, Zoro, Sanji, Robin why are you ignoring me? Chopper said as he walked behind the two guys. The two guys who belonged to the fake straw hats tried not to show their discomfort of being followed by a talking raccoon as they continued to walk towards the meeting place of them. Sanji picked some bounty posters from his pocket and shuffled through it until he found what he was looking for. He motioned Zora to come closer. Look at this. This is the real Tony Tony Chopper of the Straw Hats. He said, I think when they got separated, the pet got stranded on the island and now it thinks we are its guardians. Then let's ditch this fox and get that. It will make us look more authentic. Zoro said. Robin tried to kick out the fox which she held and tried holding a banana in front of the real chopper in the hopes of making him their pet. But two guys appeared from nowhere and picked up Robin in a sack. The other two guys looked shocked at this but made no move to stop that. Chopper was terrified at the kidnapping and yelled at the two guys to do something. But they didn't move and just said that they wouldn't risk fighting those guys, even if their crewmate was captured. Chopper yelled and cried, then finally turned into his reindeer form, and ran away, unaware of two guys watching this scene behind the wall. Navy Branch G1 The Straw Hats are on the Sabayati Archipelago. A voice rang through the Den Den Mushy. Yes, and they seem to be recruiting. The marine officer, who was observing the whole scene reported to the G1 branch. Contact headquarters, if they are really alive, we'll need the reinforcements right away. The commander ordered. Aye aye sir, we will do that immediately. Sabayati Archipelago, why did you shoot her? A man asked, lying next to his bleeding fiancé. What did we do to you? What, you got a problem with me? Luffy asked. The man tch had but didn't reply anything. The man glared at Luffy which angered him. He cocked his pistol and pointed at the man. Boy, stop that. A voice sounded from behind. Luffy whirled around to see who dared to stop him. He looked at two people, one of which was carrying a huge bag. They wore thick hooded sweaters which covered half of their faces. One had a mustache, while the other one wore a mask. The masked one whispered something on the other's ear and they both nodded. The masked one stepped forward, which looked like that the person was challenging the pirates. How dare you to stop me? Luffy pointed the gun at the masked person and shot it, but it was easily dodged. Suddenly, the whole area felt the pressure around them dropping. A burst of pressure hit Luffy and his crew, knocking them out. Others around them stared at the scene with confusion. How did they get knocked out? Before they could ask, the two vanished from the scene, leaving the others more confused than ever. That was a bit reckless. The masked figure commented. Yes, but I just simply wanted to interfere in that. It looked bad the other person reasoned. Yes, but I told you it wouldn't be good if we were to attract the attention of marines before we boarded the ship. The masked figure sighed. Yes yes, but you are amazing that you came up with this plan the other figure said. Flashback. Luffy, I have packed everything that we will need for the next two weeks. Hancock said pointing at the mountain of a bag that was behind her. That is too much. Grandma Nyon yelled. 
Hancock had the decency to look embarrassed. After removing many unwanted things, Luffy lifted the bag, which still looked big as it contained several things of Hancock and food for Luffy. Luffy, where this Hancock said as she handed over a fake mustache to him. Luffy looked at it confused. Why should I wear this? This will help in boarding the ship without getting noticed. This way we won't get the attention of marines before we leave this island, she said. And I of course, will be wearing this, she said as she took out a mask which fit her face. Everyone thinks you are dead, but thanks to what happened two years ago, the whole world knows your face. If you're discovered, it will make it hard to get off from this island. While Hancock, you are so brilliant Luffy commented as he smiled at her. She blushed up storm under his gaze and simply wore her mask to hide it. If you are in need of something, Kuja pirates will come for your aid Maria said. Sister, please take care of your health and be safe out there Sandersonia said, tears falling from her eyes. Yes, try not to get hurt. I know you are strong, but there are monsters out in the sea left unsaid as Maria wiped her tears. Hancock nodded and blinked away her unshed tears. Luffy, please take care of our sister Maria said one last time. Okay, thanks for everything Luffy said grinning. Flashback ends. Oh, stop it Luffy, you are going to make me faint from your compliments Hancock complained, but she was red in face. Luffy just laughed and continued forward. They both strode forward, with the intention of going to Shaki's bar. Luffy spotted two guys, one with yellow colored hair and other green hair. Oi, Sanji, Zoro Luffy yelled as he walked towards them. Hancock was confused as those two looked very different from the bounty posters. Their auras had barely any power, but she shrugged and walked towards them along with Luffy. After all, he was with them the longest. If he was sure, she wouldn't question it. Two years can change many things. The two in question looked towards the strangers whom they have never met, calling the names of the identities they wore. Sanji and Zoro exchanged a look, sweating slightly. How are you guys? It's been two years since we met Luffy started talking excitedly while the other two were nervous, which didn't go unnoticed by Hancock. Haha. <laughs> yes, it's been long. Was it? Sanji laughed. As he woke up, his head felt groggy and unstable. He sat there for a few moments, which seemed to clear his head. He slowly stood up to see his crewmates waking up as well. It was the Luffy of Straw Hat Pirates. First a guy with long nose and a woman wearing a bikini insults me and hurts me. Now a guy with mustache and a huge back and a masked person somehow made me lose my consciousness. As anger grew with every word he spoke. Find them and bring them. I don't care what you do, but I want to kill them. He said. His crew immediately nodded and called others. Sanji picked up the Den Den Mushy and he listened to the orders. His face paled when he realized that the two that his captain mentioned were actually with them. He quickly cut the call and joined back into the conversation. Do you know where the others are? Luffy asked Sanji. Oh others. Why yeah, let's go there Sanji stuttered and walked towards that place. Grove 46. The Straw Hats intend to gather the pirates they recruited at Grove 46. A marine relayed the information to G1 Branch. Evacuate the citizens immediately. The pirates are gathering at Grove 46, we will enter the lawless zone. All hands prepare for battle. The branch commander roared out the orders. I am going ahead of you guys. Another voice sounded as the branch commander turned around. Sentamaru-san. I am taking PX5 and PX7 with me Sentamaru said. What? You are using the pacifistas? The marine commander asked. Of course, you guys are underestimating the straw hat pirates. It's been two years. They will be definitely stronger than they were. They are far superior to the bullheads that are gathering on the island, Sentamaru said. The commander gulped and nodded. Grove 17. Sunny, we made you wait dot 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 for two long years Robin said as she approached the ship. I am glad you are safe. Ah, uh, look at the beautiful woman over there a voice sounded from the ship. Isn't that our archaeologist Robin? Silence rang through the grove as they both stared at each other. It was Robin who broke the silence. You haven't changed a bit, Frankie. Oh, what are you saying? I have changed all right. Look at this body. Behold the greatest transformation of all time, beyond human comprehension. Frankie exclaimed. He was standing with his huge hands, which were cubical rather than cylindrical. His shoulders were also huge and spherical, with BF-37 tag on it. Robin just shrugged as she jumped into the ship. Her feet didn't feel the wood, but rather the coating over the ship. It felt bubbly and bouncy. So, this is the ship's new coating. It feels like jelly. Robin commented. Yes, Rayleigh's a genius. We can sail to the depth of the sea. Isn't it wonderful? Frankie clashed his huge fists again. I want to see Rayleigh already. Robin said. Oh, you went to the bar. What number are you? Frankie asked. I am the eighth. Luffy is the only one we are waiting for. Robin said. Oh, that's great. Then we will be heading out pretty soon. I've finished the maintenance with all the new weaponry too. Frankie laughed. Usopp and Sanji came by already. Frankie said. Usopp went to get fuel and Sanji's buying food. Robin then asked about Brooke's live poster. Yes, I have heard about it. He went from being someone who was traveling in a dark sea in despair to an international star. 
Maybe. He won't want to be a pirate anymore Frankie said with a somber tone. Grove 42. Hey, fisherman, how's the catch today? Can you sell anything to me cheap? Sanji said into the shop. He heard a voice behind him yelling something. What's wrong? Sanji inquired. Uh, he is gone. The green-haired guy. The fisherman said. There was this guy with three swords. He said he was bored and wanted to go fishing. I told him to wait on the boat while I prepared things. He had green hair and three swords. Was he wearing a sash as well? Sanji asked. That's right. He also had a scar on one eye. Do you know him? The fisherman asked. Sanji rolled up the poster of Zoro and showed it to him. That's him. Are you his friend? He asked. Sanji cringed. W well, we are acquainted I guess. I saw him sleeping on a pirate ship that was next to my boat. I yelled him to come down, but it was too late. The ship was coated, and it is probably on its way to Fisherman Island Fisherman said. That idiot Sanji said sweating. I thought it was strange that he got here first. I should have known he would get into trouble. He then turned to the fisherman. Well he will probably be fine. It isn't that easy to kill that guy. Anyway, you got any fish for me? He said. Meanwhile, a group was gathering near the edge of the cliff. Hey, look at that. Something huge is surfacing a guy said as he pointed out at the bubbles. A huge galleon rose up from the sea. It's a huge pirate ship they yelled. It looks like it has been cut into half. Don't be an idiot another guy commented. No one could cut such a large ship. You. A voice gasped out, needy for air. He looked at the figure that sat on the mast of the ship with its sword drawn. Ruined out dream of entering the new world. Fate. Consider that a payment for kidnapping me the figure said, as he slowly sheathed his sword. Ah, look. He is back. Well, whatever. It's not that I care Sanji said puffing the smoke from his cigarette. Phew. Looks like I got on the wrong ship. Rorano Azoro said. Wiping the water of his face. Grove 35. Robin, where are you? Chopper yelled as he ran through the streets of the grove. I can't believe those guys, Zoro, Sanji. They used to care for each other so much. Now they don't even care that Robin has been kidnapped. I have to tell this to Luffy immediately. Hey, Chopper. A voice yelled in the crowd. Chopper turned to search for the voice. Hey, here. Yuzop shouted as Chopper looked in his direction. Yuzop. A happy smile bloomed on his face. Chopper, look at you. You have grown. You will be a lot easier to ride now as well you's upset. How have you been? It's so true. You are so soft as well. Nami appeared on his side, cupping his face, and rubbed it against hers. Nami. Guys, I am so happy to see you Chopper cried. Wait, I am glad to see you, but Robin has been kidnapped. She is in trouble Chopper said frantically. Yuzop and Nami looked at each other. Hey, Chopper exclaimed. Those guys were imposters. Oh, come on. Robin has been running away from the world government for 20 years. Do you really think she would let them take her away in a sack of all things? Nami said, exasperated. Yeah, I thought the smells were also weird. Chopper said, now I am just getting mad. How dare they, pretending to be us. It's not like we are famous. Those jerks Chopper commented blushing and laughing with the usual dance of his. But Nami stopped it by hitting him lightly on his head. Why are you so happy? It can't be helped that Luffy's is very famous for his stunts two years ago. We are famous in a bad way Nami commented as they rode towards the ship. Grove 41. Hey, I'm going to the shore. I want to go fishing. Zoro said as he walked along with Sanji. No way. Sanji declined. I'm not walking with you because I want to. If I let you go on your own, you will just get lost. Moss Head. HMPH. Number 7 telling what number 1 to do. Zoro sighed. What? You're ranking us according to when we got here. It's a miracle that you got here first Sanji yelled. Sure, whatever. Number 7 Marimo. They both got into fighting stance, with Sanji's leg blazing with fire and Zoro's sword getting a black sheen. The passerby got away from the air getting thick around them. Zoro swung his sword at Sanji, who stopped with his leg. They both started to exchange blows. Grove 33. Stop it right there. The concert is hereby cancelled. You are suspected of being the second captain of Rumbar Pirates, also known as Humming Swordsman, Brooke. On top of that, we also have information that you're one of Straw Hat Luffy's crewmates a marine yelled at Brooke who was standing on the stage, ready to perform his encore. Soul King Brooke, you are under arrest. The crowd started whispering to each other. Then he started crying at the mention of arrest. It's all over, Brooke. The manager came onto the stage with a gun pointed at Brooke. You betrayed us. Let's all die together. He is a pirate. But they said Straw Hat Luffy was dead. People yelled at Marines. Backup band and dancers. Would you please join me for one last song? Brooke spoke. Don't worry. My music has power after all. Are you insane? It's over Brooke manager yelled. Thank you helping me for the past two years, manager Brooke said. This island has the memory of our defeat, but it is also the island of new beginnings. He then faced the crowd and brought the mic closer. Straw Hat Luffy, dead. Brooke said, the crowd going silent. That's ridiculous. Tell the whole world. Straw Hat Luffy is alive. Brooke yelled. He'll be the king of all oceans one day. 
It's not fitting for him to have a calm departure. Oh baby, listen to my last soul. The New World Brook yelled as the crowd went crazy. They started to push the Marines out from the concert dome, wanting to listen to his last song. The news reporters were in a frenzy as they relied on this news to their headquarters. Grove 17. He's incredible. Usopp yelled as they looked at Frankie's new transformation. Chopper was literally in air due to his excitement. You're a robot. Can you shoot laser beams? What about missiles? Chopper barraged down questions after questions. Calm down, Chopper. You will have a heart attack. Usopp exclaimed. Robin. Nami called out, coming down from the cliff. Nami. You look great Robin said. Nami looked at Frankie and her nose scrunched up in disgust and she sweat dropped. What happened with his body? Nami asked. Robin shrugged. What has he been doing for the last two years? Nami asked herself. Frankie, can you show me the weapons? Chopper asked excitedly. Don't be stupid. I won't do the main event until Luffy's here Mecha Frankie said in a robotic voice. Sending both Chopper and Usopp jumping around in excitement. Hello, Straw Hats Rayleigh said as he and Shaki walked down the cliff. Rayleigh, and Shaki. Nami exclaimed with a smile. The situation on the island has changed. Rayleigh said. The Navy. That's right. They think the imposters are real straw hats and they have mobilized their forces. Shaki said. I know because I have tapped into their communications. I've warned Brooke at Concert Hall. He should be coming here soon. Really? He is giving up being a star. I knew he had guts. Frankie said. Mommy, you're the navigator, right? I am going to teach you how to control a coded ship. It is vital that you learn it well. Rayleigh said. Mommy nodded, full of determination. I'll do my best. Rayleigh, Luffy isn't here yet. Usopp exclaimed. Don't worry, Luffy will be more than fine. He is already on the island, and he is projecting his massive presence like a beacon. He also brought someone with him that I may have expected to come along with him. Rayleigh said with a smile, and he looked towards Shaki. Shaki looked confused for a second but understanding passed through her face and she grinned at him. I gave a baby transponder snail to Sanji, and he is with Zoro now. Frankie said, good, but they'd better hurry. The Navy is getting close. Luffy is the only one we haven't found yet. Shaki said as she gave them a Vivra card which would lead Luffy and the mysterious person to them. Grove 42 would be a good place to anchor your ship. Have everyone assemble there. It might be a little rough but it's time to put the past behind and start anew. Rayleigh advised them as they agreed to it. Grove 33. We are in state of panic here. When we tried to arrest Soul King Brook, his fans started rioting. A Navy commander informed it to someone through the Den Den Mushy. In the meantime, one of Duval's crewmate picked Brooke up from the concert hall to Grove 42 where the crew was waiting for him. Grove 41. Two were fighting like blazing infernos clashing with each other. Blows after blows were exchanged among them. They both stopped and panted for air. Ha, huh, looks like you have learned some sword swinging skills Sanji commented. Yeah, looks like your leg has hardened a bit more as well Zoro said. They both were ready to go at it again when the Den Den Mushy started ringing. Understood. The shore of Grove 42, isn't that right? Sanji asked. That's right. We'll meet up there. Frankie answered Sanji through the Den Den Mushy. What was it? Zoro asked. Let's see. Navy come. We go ship. Run. Got it. Sanji explained as if he was explaining to a baby. That got Zoro mad. I thought it would be easier for a muscle head like you to understand. Sanji smirked. All right. I am going to cut you up later. By the way, don't you feel the massive presence on that island there? Zoro said as he pointed at the Grove 46. Yeah, island, noisy Sanji replied. Grove 46. Reporting from Grove 46, the Straw Hats are gathering here. I can confirm the identities of four captains. A marine said into his Den Den Mushy. Gashed Albion with a bounty of 92 million bullies. Lip service Doughty with a bounty of 88 million bullies. Wet-haired Caribou and his brother and co-captain Blood Splatter Corabu. If they all team up with Straw Hat, it would be. The marine stopped at a sound coming behind him. He whirled around to see Caribou hovering over him. Hey, hey, did you just summon soldiers here? Caribou voiced out as he picked up the soldier by his neck. And no, but I was about to the marine stuttered, because that would be very bad if you did that. I might have to paint the entire plaza with your blood, he said with a dark grin on his face. He dropped the marine and addressed his brother. The marine tried to get the gun on his back, but suddenly Caribou turned towards him with a maniacal grin on his face. He got a stick out of nowhere and stabbed the marine on his shoulder. Oh Lord, have mercy. Forgive this foolish soldier who tried to kill me with a pistol. That's enough Caribou Luffy's voice sounded on the plaza, and everyone turned towards him. He is here, it's Captain Luffy. Many shouted and cheered. Let that insignificant soldier be. Look around. You may not know each other, but as of today, you're all my vassals. You are all straw hat pirates. He yelled and many started cheering about his glory. That means, when I become the king of the pirates, you'll all share in the spoils and the glory. But to make that I need every one of you to work and fight for me. He said, I summoned you all here for one reason. 
Your precious boss has been insulted by a bunch of nobodies. They are still on this island somewhere. Find them and bring them to me. Luffy ordered. Aye aye, Captain. We will make them pay the pirates chorus. But two years is a long time. You guys are a lot quieter than you used to be. Luffy wondered aloud. This mustache guy seems to know the real straw hats. Who is he? Sanji said. Don't know, but keep your mouth shut. The masked person seems to be glaring at us for some reason Zoro commented. They all reached the Grove 46, where their crew was gathered. The duo breathed relief when they saw Luffy with several other big-time rookies. Captain Luffy. Sanji called at the fake Luffy who was standing up at the platform. Call me big boss, you fools. He yelled. Aren't these the guys you were looking for? Sanji asked. Hancock's face twitched. So, these guys were imposters. They were running this whole thing on her beloved's name. She pulled aside Luffy quickly and whispered to him. Luffy, these guys are imposters who are running this entire thing on your name and your crew's name. The Sanji and Zoro are not real. Luffy's lips twitched, and he smirked. I know, I have sensed that they are fake the moment I saw them. I just wanted to have some fun Hancock gaped at Luffy. Truth be told, Luffy knew they were fake because of the random memories that popped up when he ate the fruit. He wanted to confirm that they were actually real or just some random dream. But now he knew it was dream, yet it still irked him that he didn't know why he was getting these flashes of memories. Hancock just smirked back and stepped back. She would let her love have his fun. No one here could even touch him, let alone hurt him. If they had such thoughts, they would have to fight their way through her for that to happen. The fake Luffy's face morphed into a huge grin. This would be perfect opportunity for him to use. Listen up men. He yelled we found two of the culprits. We'll start by teaching them a lesson. And the rest of you take note. This is what happens to anybody who defies me. Before anything could happen, many marines started to swarm into the island. Hold it right there, pirates. A marine yelled. Straw Hat and his underlings, surrender now. They have blocked us. We have nowhere to run a pirate yelled. Navy. Well, it is not a problem. Some of these men have bounties over a hundred million. Luffy said caribou. Koribu, use that marine on the floor as a human shield and get us out of here. He ordered, Big Boss, I'm afraid that's impossible. He lied to us about summoning the navy caribou said as he drew a long sword from his inside, courtesy of his devil fruit. And no please, don't do it. I, I was telling the truth the marine begged. Caribou brought his sword up and with one swing, he beheaded the marine completely. The rest of the plaza were in shock. Marine shocked that one of them was beheaded ruthlessly in the middle of the area. Luffy was shocked that his orders were ignored and now he had to think other ways of escaping this situation. Hancock and Luffy were indifferent to this situation as they merely observed what was going on. They have no intention of surrendering it seems the marine captain growled out his words. Destroy the pirates, he yelled, and the marines charged into action. He he I smell blood, Caribou said, licking his lips with his long tongue. Stupid navy, our boss is straw hat Luffy. The man with a bounty of 400 million a pirate shouted as he charged into battle. A marine charged at lip service Doughty, but he was subdued easily without any effort. The marine captain who witnessed the death of his fellow comrade swung his sword at Caribou, but it sunk into his skin as it became all muddy. The captain was at a shock you are a devil fruit user. At first the marines were getting hit heavily as there wasn't a way for them to defend from the pirates, but a sound of charging and laser being fired sounded in the area as all turned towards it. Marines gained a hopeful look as they looked the scene. Pacifistas. A pirate screamed as he ran away from there those are the human weapons from the Paramount War. What are they doing here? Pirate. Straw Hat Luffy confirmed a robotic voice sounded as the pacifista locked onto the straw hat. They dispatched the strong pirates like lip service Doughty with ease. We are in big trouble. Big boss do something pirates yelled as they looked at the stage. Only to find him not there. Only the mustache man and the masked person was there. Hurry up. We're getting out of here. We can't fight something that can take out Doughty like it's nothing Luffy said as he ran. But he couldn't run far as he bumped into a pacifista and sent Amaru on his way. Oh, see there. Big Boss is going to fight. A pirate shouted. Get him. Show him what a 400 million bully pirate can do. Sentamaru looked confused. Why are they calling you Straw Hat? Hey, do you know who I am? Step aside unless you want me to kill you. I am the son of Dragon. I am Garp's grandson. I have a bounty of 400 million that's all he said before he was smashed in his head with axe by Sentamaru. You're not Straw Hat, you piece of trash. What? The pirates yelled. Big Boss. Now I get it. These fake Straw Hats had them fooled. But by the looks of it, you all are going to be arrested here, Sentamaru said as everyone looked shocked at the revelation. PX5 identify him. Bounty 26 million bullies. Pirate, Triple Towns Damala Black. The fake straw hats ran away as they were identified as imposters. But due to some luck, the real straw hat also happened to be here, Sentamaru said, once again sending the plaza into silence. PX5 detected him when we entered into this area. Target him PX5, Sentamaru ordered. PX5 opened its mouth and fired a laser beam. 
Luffy lazily dodged the laser beam, causing a huge explosion behind him. The thick sweater fell, revealing him in all his glory, with his cloak fluttering behind him, giving an intimidating look. Hey hey, be careful Luffy drawled. My food is in the bag you know. He grinned at the marine. Th that's him. That's similar to the face on the wanted poster. A pirate yelled. I it's him. It's straw handle UFFY. Previously, target him PX5. Sentamaru ordered. PX5 opened its mouth and fired a laser beam. Luffy lazily dodged the laser beam, causing a huge explosion behind him. The thick sweater fell, revealing him in all his glory, with his cloak fluttering behind him, giving an intimidating look. Hey hey, be careful. Luffy drawled. My food is in the bag, you know. He grinned at the marine. Th that's him. That's similar to the face on the wanted poster. A pirate yelled. I it's him. It's straw hat L U F F Y. Ah, uh, he is the real straw hat Luffy. We have been messing with the wrong guy. The imposter pirates shrieked in fear. Don't get discouraged. We came here expecting the real one anyway. The marines picked up their weapons and got ready to charge at him. Awa, you really want to get in my way again? They said it will be hard to leave if I get into trouble Luffy said with a nervous voice. But his face was completely opposite as he was grinning like a fool. Luffy, we may have to leave from here as soon as possible. It wouldn't be wise to get into a big fight here Hancock whispered into his ears. Man, you are no fun. I really wanted to fight some guys. Luffy pouted. Hancock thought it was cute and almost wanted to let him have what he wanted. But she had to stay strong and get him into the ship. Don't worry. Unlike two years ago, I am now officially a Navy soldier and you are officially under arrest Sentamaru replied back. Get him, PX5. The pacifista shot out several laser beams at Luffy who dodged it with minimal effort. Hunt too slow. He said. The pacifista charged at him, but he vanished from where he was. The pacifista skidded to stop, searching for Luffy. He appeared above the pacifista with stretched hand. Gamu Gamu no. Rifle his hand shot at the pacifista at impossible speeds, hitting it in the head. There was a pause in the area as the pacifista stayed in air for moments before it crashed in the ground making a huge crater in the place. It dug down about 30 meters into the ground before it exploded making the place fill with smoke. He didn't even use Haki. How did he do it? Is it all just his physical powers? Sentamaru said, shock evident in his voice. One hit, and such a large explosion. The pirates who were gathered at the place yelled together in shock. They haven't seen someone with this much power. Just a simple punch was able to take down something that easily took down pirates who were worth 100 million. Chishishi, later then. I think I will be seeing you again probably, Luffy said to Sentamaru as he picked up the bag and started to run away from there, with Hancock following him. Hey, uh, Luffy, a voice called out from a distance. Luffy grinned as he recognized his voice. Luffy, it was you. Why are you always in the middle of some problem? Sanji yelled, but there was no anger present in his voice. You, Zoro, Sanji, long time no see. Luffy had already sensed them when he entered this island, but meeting them was a very happy occasion. That's Roronoa Zoro and Black Leg Sanji. I knew it, they are alive, Sentamaru said. PX7, stop them. PX7 jumped in front of Zoro and Sanji and charged its laser, but it couldn't attack them as they were faster. Sanji vanished and charged into the pacifista, and Zoro unsheathed his swords and swung at the pacifista. Zoro cut the PX7 into several horizontal pieces and Sanji's vertical kick broke those pieces and crushed them into pieces. There was no indication of a robot being there as there was only a big pile of metal left. The shocking part was that this all happened into seconds, as it took some time for many to even process what happened. Sentamaru was the one who was shocked. She had expected them to be powerful, but never did she think they would be so powerful to make something which was very strong like Pacifista into a pile of garbage. I cut him Zoro said. I made it into that metal garbage Sanji argued. Hancock's sweat dropped as they both were correct. It's the straw hat pirates. The pirates screamed. They are definitely real this time. They're nothing like the imposters. They just witnessed a giant robot turned into a metal pile. Though none of them were able to comprehend what really happened in between as it happened so quick. Who is that Luffy? Zoro asked pointing at Hancock, who is still wearing her mask and cloak. Tashishi, surprise. It's our new crewmate. I will introduce when everyone is present in the ship. Luffy laughed. Zoro nodded. His captain was special when it came to picking up crewmates. So, whomever it was, as long as it isn't someone like that pervy cook, he would try to get along with them. By the way you are number 9 Luffy Zoro mentioned. He had to. After all he was number 1. Shut up. Mosshead. Luffy, everyone is waiting on the ship. Let's go. Sanji said. Yosh. Let's go. I want to meet everyone already. Luffy replied happily. Marines. It's pirate hunter Zoro and black leg Sanji. Though he isn't anything like what that poster looked. But everyone get ready. The whole crew is on this island. They all are alive. Let's capture them. A marine captain yelled. Luffy started to run, but immediately paused when he sensed something. 
He had felt that aura several times. He turned and faced the direction of the aura. Rayleigh was sitting on the hilltop, looking down with a huge smile on his face. Rayleigh, Luffy shouted in joy, his golden rings brightening. The rest of the crew also stopped, and they smiled at the scene. I came to see to see how powerful you have become. I can safely say you are more than ready. Rayleigh said with a grin. Your powers are even more refined than before. Yeah, Luffy confirmed. He had trained of course. Rayleigh then looked at the masked person, of whom he knew the identity. I am happy that you decided to do this. You will need this for yourself. Go, the sea is calling you. Hancock nodded, silently thankful that the mask was covering her face. It wouldn't be good for the world to see her becoming all teary. Thank you for the two years. Luffy yelled with a grin. Haha, it's out of your character. Hurry up and go. Rayleigh laughed. Rayleigh, I am going to do it. Luffy looked up. The whole plaza became silent. Wind whooshed and his cape fluttered in wind as he adjusted his hat. His eyes burning with determination, glowing an ethereal glow. I'm going to be the king of the pirates. Luffy shouted. The whole plaza seemed to shake. Marines seemed to be struggling to even stand. No one but Rayleigh and his crew noticed the soft glow of Luffy when he declared his dream. Zoro and Sanji smiled. It was their captain's dream, and they would be standing with him when he achieves it. Hancock smiled as well. She would always stand by his side. Rayleigh's eyes glistened. He knew Luffy would do it. He would achieve this and more. He felt proud that he took such a person as his apprentice. He may be feeling sorry for his future opponents. Probably. Luffy picked up his bag and started running again. His crew following him. The marines started to follow them. But a huge wind cut divided the land into two, trapping the marines on one side. D. Dark King Rayleigh. The marines yelled as they saw the man standing on the other side of the line. It's my apprentice farewell. Don't spoil the fun. Rayleigh said, his face turning dark. I advise you not to cross that line. The marines gulped and shivered at that tone. The marines tried attacking the crew from other side. Oh, they have us surrounded it seems Sanji commented. The marines gathered up into lines, hoping to stop the pirate group from escaping. But they all started to fall on their knees collectively and started to mutter things. I knew you guys were behind this. Why are you still here anyway? Perona asked. She was floating in the air, holding a plush toy with several ghosts flying behind her, thanks to her devil fruit. Sanji immediately started dancing around here and trying to get close to her. Perona shrieked at the closeness that the blonde cook was exhibiting and moved away from him. Anyway, try to escape as soon as possible. I saw marine warships coming this way Perona informed. Nami San, Frankie San, Robin San, Usopp San. Brooke yelled as he jumped into Thousand Sunny. You really gave up stardom huh? Can't believe it. Frankie laughed. This brings back so many memories. Brooke laughed. On this occasion, Brooke closed his distance between him and Nami. Can I see your pan that's all he said before he was kicked on his face by an irate Nami. I didn't show it two years ago either. Now just shut up. Nami yelled. Yo ho ho, my chest is shaking with joy. Not that I have a chest. Brooke laughed, while convulsing in the deck. By the way, where are the others? Chopper went to get everyone else. Robin said. Hey. Chopper yelled enthusiastically Luffy. Zoro. Sanji. He was very happy to meet the actual crew. He was flying on the giant bird which he helped during his stay on the island. Whoa. Chopper. Luffy laughed. This is my friend. Get on. Let's go to ship. Everyone is waiting. Chopper said. They all got on the bird, and it took off into the air. They reached the ship pretty quick. Hey, everyone, I brought them. Chopper yelled as they descended down on the ship. Luffy was sporting a huge grin on his face as he jumped down onto the deck. You guys look more like men now. Frankie commented as he laughed. Luffy, we missed you. Brooke and Yuzop cried. At last, we are all together. Hey, Nami shouted in joy. Robin smiled widely. Unfortunately, Sanji couldn't handle this as he fainted with blood sprouting off his nose. Sanji, Chopper yelled in concern. Nami went and hugged her captain tight, while the person near him silently fumed. She was also nervous. Seeing all these guys, who had spent their time together a lot, made her nervous that she wouldn't be accepted within the crew. F Frankie. Ew. Luffy had stars in his eyes as he saw Frankie's new transformation. Hug. I don't really get what this is about, but save it for later. There is a warship that's approaching us. Nami yelled. Luffy stopped the warship he was doing, immediately turning serious. Oh, they want to stop us. Luffy's tone made everyone their shiver. This was something new. The Luffy they knew would have never talked like that. It only intensified at the look on his face. His eyes were glowing with power. One of his irises was black while the other one was white. I will show them what it means to oppose us he raised his hands, black substance coating it. It looked like flames dancing on his arm. Death rush. The black flames left his hand at hyperspeeds and hit the marine warship. Nothing felt like happened at first, but then the whole ship exploded in flames, which also was black. Straw Hat shivered at the sudden chillness which enveloped the ship. Brooke's eyes widened at the familiar chillness that he drew upon. Not that he had eyes. The marine ship entirely sunk into sea. 
No visible survivors. The sudden chillness left them, and the temperature returned to normal. What was that? Nami breathed out. I will explain everything soon. Let's first get going into the water. Luffy ordered. Why yes, you are right. Frankie said and jumped into the water. Others started doing the preparation. All while somehow completely forgetting about the stranger that was on the ship. Did you guys defeat every marine while on your way here? Yuzop asked. No, many were still coming this way. Chopper replied while treating Sanji. Well, I don't see any of them coming after us Yuzop said, confused. It's our chance to head out into the sea. We are in luck Frankie said. Yuzop shrugged and went back to work. Meanwhile, on the islands, we are encountering gigantic beetles. We cannot move a marine captain reported to the G1 branch while trying to avoid the insects. I wish you luck Yuzop on a figure whispered. I'm sorry, but our weaponry has been soaked due to sudden downpour another marine reported. Don't use lightning, we don't want to hurt civilians. Herda said. Nami was a good girl, I wish her all the best. Hey how dare you turn down our invitation. And Akama said as they charged at the marines. We are held by. An unexpected emergency. A marine reported crying. All right, we have removed the buoyancy pouch. We are going to submerge. Everybody, man the sails. Nami ordered. Are we getting underway, Nami? Luffy asked, tapping his foot impatiently. Yes, yes. Go ahead, Captain. Nami replied. All right, guys. There's a whole lot of stuff I would like to say to you. But I will say two things before we set sail, Luffy said. The whole crew paid attention to him. It was silent, but everyone was grinning. First, I want to thank you for going along with my selfish request for the last two years. Luffy said. It won't be the last time either Sanji said smiling. Yeah, you have always been like that. Yuzop commented. Luffy laughed. Second, I want to introduce you all to our new crewmate. Luffy said and several eyes turned towards the mask-wearing person. EHH, why the hell didn't I notice them before? Yuzop said. Chopper and Brooke nodded. Remove your mask. Luffy said and she obeyed. As she slowly removed her mask, several faces went into shock, disbelief and some blushed. Zoro and Robin didn't blush but was shocked to see someone like her on the ship. Chopper was confused as to why everyone was shocked. Nami and Yuzop were shocked, gaping at the pirate princess with a small pink dusting on their cheek. Frankie just laughed at the absurdity of the situation. She is. Nami stuttered but couldn't form words. Zoro sensed her power with his observation hacky, grinned. He couldn't wait to spar with her, his eyes showing a maniacal gleam. Hello everyone, I am Pirate Empress, the most beautiful woman on the planet, Boa Hancock. Honestly, you all should bow down. I will be forgiven of any crime, because a soft voice clearing behind her, and she winced. She had reverted back to her old state, her instincts telling her to be dominating. But she quickly stopped that. I look forward to traveling with you all she squeaked, internally scolding herself for blushing slightly due to embarrassment. The crew looked with slight fear and awe, but there are few who were looking at her with amusement, namely Robin and Frankie. It took a few minutes for some to regain their conscious. One had to be woken up forcefully, though he did nothing more than just glance before turning into stone again. Hancock did a double take on herself, thinking it might be her awakening. But looking at the crew, she could tell this wasn't out of normal. L-U-F-F-Y You can't possibly mean Boa Hancock, the warlord, Nami started. Former, huh, I am a former warlord, now I don't work for the world government. She answered, but anyway, are you really going to join our crew? Nami questioned. Based on the, all the recruitments that Luffy did, she was far from the weirdest. That is something considering there was a cyborg, a reindeer, a skeleton for God's sake on their ship. But she did question his ability to attract these kinds of people into his region to say. Boa Hancock is considered to be one of the most powerful women on the sea. She is also the envy of many women as she is considered the most beautiful woman on the sea. Which, after seeing her, many on the crew may agree. Shishishi, yes she asked me to let her join my crew, so I said okay Luffy's voice broke through her musing. Of course, he would say yes. He tried to make a tree join his crew once, so of course he would accept the request of someone who is very powerful and beautiful. Did he fall in love with her? Nami didn't know, and she couldn't find any such signs on him as he was almost his goofy self, laughing and with his wide grin etched on his face. But she did look at the face of the pirate empress and saw her looking at Luffy with a wistful expression on her face. Her face slightly red, but the look on her eyes were very different. Interesting Nami mused. This would be a good topic for them to talk during their private girls session, assuming Hancock would join that is. And she wasn't the only one thinking of this as other female on the crew also picked up on the signs. And also, she may have come to a conclusion of what it is, but that wasn't surprising considering she was a scholar and an assassin. She could judge someone's emotions easily. As they were talking, the air in the bubbles slowly filled and now it completely enveloped the ship. They were ready for submersion as conveyed by the navigator. Yosh. With that, Luffy took a deep breath set sail to Fishman Island. He yelled and the crew cheered. 
The ship slowly sunk with its sails unfurled and started going deep into the vast ocean. Sabadi Archipelago, Lawless Zone. Brother, it is hard to dig here. Horibu complained as he continued to dig into the place. It is to be expected as this place consists of lot of roots. Caribou replied as he watched the five kneeling figures in front of him. Please spare us. It's our captain's idea. He made us do this. They complained. They were the ones who belonged to the imposter straw hat crew. Why do you think I joined straw hats? Caribou asked in a low voice, sending shivers down the members kneeling. They couldn't answer in the fear that he might do something. I wanted to kill them from inside. He answered his own question, slowly advancing towards them. He grabbed the face of the fake Sanji and slowly lifted him while enveloping him with mud. Thanks to his devil fruit, fake Usopp tried to stop it by firing his gun. But it was of no use since the bullet just sunk into him instead of harming him. H. He is a loja type. They yelled, realizing they had no way to harm him or escape from their impeding death. Grove 46. We couldn't do anything. How many times do I have to tell you that? Sentamaru complained as the marines were slowly cleaning up the aftermath of the recent fight. The Dark King stood in our way. Not even Uncle Kizaru could get past him easily. Some escaped in the distraction along with some fake straw hats. We captured the rest Sentamaru continued his report the straw hats severely damaged two pacifists. It's the same prototypes that cornered them two years ago. Their specifications and strength haven't changed, but those pirates have. In the two years, they have grown much more powerful than we expected. Report this to the Navy headquarters. Straw Hats has made complete recovery and are entering into the new world, somewhere in the Sabadi archipelago. They are already gone, Hashaki said, smoking a cigar. Monkey Chan and others are much more mature and stronger now. You were watching, Rayleigh asked. Of course, I am their fan after all. She replied, are you thinking about the past Ray? Ha ha Rayleigh laughed. I suppose so. Hey, that's a nice ship. A voice yelled across the deck. Rayleigh raised his head to see who it was. Huh, it was stolen. My house burnt down, so I live here he replied. Really, what is your name? The stranger asked. Rayleigh raised his eyebrows at him. Rayleigh, I am Roger. This meeting is fate. Rayleigh, let's change the world together. The man laughed. The world, who do you think you are? Get lost Rayleigh laughed. Maybe. There is no coincidence in this world. Maybe everything that happens is inevitable. Luffy has grown much worthy of that hat. It might not be a bad thing. To live just a little longer Rayleigh teared up. Shaki smiled. It was true, they would try to live a little longer. Beneath the seas of Sabadi Archipelago. We are already far below the surface Robin commented as she looked around to see various sea creatures swimming around. We are sinking deeper and deeper. Are you sure water won't get in? Chopper commented. Worried about the potential of drowning deep under the sea. The world of people seems so far away that it makes me nervous Nami said. The ocean is so pretty. Luffy commented. These views were very similar to the memories and visions he experienced previously. He couldn't completely understand how it seemed so similar, but he could tell it was somehow related to him and this journey that they were partaking. Zoro tried to catch his face by slicing through the bubble, but he earned a bump in his head, courtesy of Nami. Robin questioned about the strength of the bubbles, which Nami explained, you can even shoot cannonballs or sea king attacks and the bubble won't burst. We just have to be careful not to put too many holes, otherwise we should be fine. Oh, then we can't put too many holes, huh? Sad. I wanted to catch a lot of fish for future consumption. Luffy pouted. Though, by the thought of food, he remembered something. That's right. Since Sanji is down, we can eat the food cooked by Kyujo pirates. Luffy said and the crew cheered at the thought of food. Hancock stayed silent. Awkward being at a strange place and not being used to people around her being so cheerful. There is something I want to tell you all. Frankie started. Everyone became silent, apt with attention, listening to their crewmate. Hatch I suffered injuries while trying to defend our ship, same as Duval Frankie started. He got severely injured and had to go back to Fishman Island for treatment. That is also why he couldn't come to help us guide these waters. Many of the crew looked somber at this. They were sad and happy that the ship was at good hands. But those who defended at their sake got hurt badly. That is not all. There is another person who defended our ship. The man who sent us away two years ago. One of the seven warlords of the sea, Bartholomew Kuma. Sunny didn't even have a scratch on her. Frankie said, as many of you may have figured it out by what Rayleigh said about him, he actually saved our lives. I am grateful for it, but I don't know what his motives were doing so Zoro commented. I hope we find out one day. Yes, but now he is just a mindless weapon of the marines Frankie commented with a slight bite in words. Big brother, Straw Hat's ship spotted dead ahead. Toribu said, bowing in a wrong direction from his brother. I can see that. He <laughs> he. I guess we will get to meet them after all Caribou commented licking his lips with glee. How deep are we? Luffy inquired. He was looking around the deep with awe. He felt a strange sense of foreboding that something was about to happen. His hacky stretched and he felt them. He felt a lot of auras coming at them. 
It was at this point that both Sanji and Zoro felt something approaching them. They were calm, Sanji sat up, playfulness and dirty thoughts gone. He wasn't being serious as he sensed that those auras weren't a match for him, but that didn't mean he let his guard down. The crew noticed the sudden shift. Robin narrowed her eyebrows and she felt it. She still had a long way to go to match up to Zoro and Sanji. Luffy on the other hand, was completely otherworldly. Ready, men. Caribou yelled. The crew cheered. He would finally be a big enough pirate that everyone respected. But for that to happen, it'd be easy to just destroy that ship. But that's no good. No one would know who killed them. I will have their heads cut off and bring them back to the surface. Then the whole world will know my name. There's something at 6 o'clock. What is that? Yuzop yelled as he noticed a shadow approaching them. There is a ship behind us. He yelled. It's headed straight for us. The massive ship collided with the Thousand Sunny. It started to push it aside due to the sheer force that it collided with. They are gonna break up the bubble. Who are they? Nami yelled wait. Is that Yumamo? Aren't Yumamo of the Arlong Pirates? Nami asked. The huge sea beast slowly looked towards Nami and her imposing figure. It started sweating slightly. It then shifted its vision towards the captain of the ship who was standing behind, watching the sea devil with curious expression. Though there was a certain glint that made the sea cow sweat heavily and breath raggedly, it shrieked and ran away, dragging along the ship behind it. Follow my lead. Fortunately, or unfortunately Caribou was the only one who jumped on the Thousand Sunny to ambush them. He 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 now is the time, they are confused. Let's kill them he didn't see the ship being dragged along the sea cow, leaving him alone on the ship. Oh no, Captain Caribou is still on the enemy ship a crewmate yelled. Big brother, Caribou yelled, though it was for naught. Give him a nice greeting, won't you? And then let's kill him sweetly, Caribou said but was confused as he didn't hear any affirmations or sounds from his crew. He turned back to see no one from his crew apart from him were present on the ship. His face became comical. And he started sweating buckets at the impending dread that was about to happen soon. Frankie stepped forward and gripped him by the body. He then raised him to toss Caribou into the sea. Stop. Don't do it. Don't throw me in the sea. Caribou begged. It's too cruel. Frankie just tossed him inside the ship against the railing. Who are you? Aren't you the captain of that ship? Zoro inquired. No, no of course not. I am not the captain he replied. Shit. That's Roar Noah Zoro. He looked around the crew with pleading eyes. But when his eyes landed on Hancock and Nami, it turned lecherous. His eyes became heart-shaped, and he licked his lips. Though, we got two cuties here. You must be that's all he got to tell before Sanji planted a foot on his face. Sending him crashing into the railing again, Sanji calmly turned to face Hancock and Nami, and he started to bleed from his nose fiercely, sending him flying into the bubble. You're becoming a real nuisance. Yuzop yelled. Luffy calmly approached Caribou with neutral expression on his face. None but Hancock and Robin noticed the expression on his face. What is your name? And why did you have that sea cow with you? Luffy asked. I am Caribou. That sea cow. Experienced underwater travelers use beasts like that to pull their ships for them. He choked out. Though, really, Luffy smiled. But then it turned serious. Now what should we do with you? Hmm. Luffy put his hand on his chin, mimicking a thinking position. Let you travel with us on this ship. Hearing that, Caribou's face brightened, and he grinned, thinking he could escape from these pirates easily, but what Luffy said next made the grin disappear. Or should I kill you for intruding our ship not only in the underwater, where the bubble has a risk of popping and endangering my entire crew, but also looking at the female members with that look on your face? Hmm. Luffy's eyes shone golden, and the entire crew held their breath. This was the new side of their usual goofy captain. They would need to ask about this after this, but for now, it all depended on their captain's decision. Zoro was particularly happy about this development. The usual Luffy would just let whoever it was walk free from this unscathed as no one was hurt. But he would never think of the potential of the crew being hurt in the first place, nor he would be intimidating towards their opponent unless any member was in danger. This behavior, while usually as fine as no one would hurt any crew, and everyone were stronger to defend themselves, but it failed to put an intimidating picture towards their enemies. It always presented a fun and weak-looking image to them. Caribou was sweating, his face drained of all blood, looking pale white. At the first instance, he thought the slim-looking captain, who obviously left a lot of opening for attacks, but this was completely different than what he expected. Then again, he was wrong in messing with a pirate worth 400 million bullies. And no, please don't kill me. I it was a mistake. I'll do anything to make you believe me that I won't harm your crew. Please, he begged. At this point, this was the only way he may escape. Anything. Hey Nami, what should we do with him? I'll let you decide the punishment for him. Does he die or does he live? Luffy turned towards her. Hey hey, you will choose the first option, right? Right, I get to kill him, right? How cool will that be? It's been too long since I have killed someone. I want to see him die, his blood flowing around. But no, no that will dirty Sunny. I will do it outside in the water. Please can I, do it? 
Naomi gasped. Luffy's one eye was completely black, flames burning from his eyes. Bone chilling cold enveloped the ship. Oh oi Luffy, what are you talking about? Usopp stammered out. Zoro and Robin's eye narrowed. Sanji took a deep breath from his cigarette. Frankie and Brooke looked alarmed. Chopper was hiding behind Nami, both scared from the crazy visage of Luffy before them. Hancock looked worried. She knew what the cause behind this was. Even though he continuously tried to suppress this part of his newer devil fruit, it was hard to control with spiking emotions and his crew suddenly put under danger. This was one of the minor episodes, as he had much more violent ones in Amazon Lily. And no Luffy, let's not kill him for now. H he may be useful, Nami said, stammering. Luffy frowned. He shook his head, his eyes returning to normal. Aw oh man, not again with this. I thought I had it under control. Luffy faced his crew. Sorry, you guys. It is something that I will have to explain for you guys to understand. Which, I will do now. Frankie, why don't you put this guy inside a barrel and lock him tightly? He is a loja devil fruit user after all. Frankie nodded and did the same. Caribou looked relieved at the escape. Though he was alarmed that the captain of this crew knew about his devil fruit, Frankie placed him at the back of the ship, where he wouldn't hear the conversations happening in the crew. He tightened the lid with sea stone nails, weakening the devil fruit user. Luffy hopped onto the higher deck and the crew gathered around him. They were wary and curious about the supposedly new power that Luffy gained and his new behavior. Uh, where do I start? Luffy started thinking. It happened while I was in Rusukana. I saw this strange fruit which I felt like it was tempting me to eat it. While I thought it didn't affect me much, it was certainly having some effect in my emotions. When Hancock's sisters were kidnapped by a pirate named World, I went to rescue them, where I killed him in rage. That's where I realized this fruit was having much more impact on me. I was certain at this point that it was a devil fruit. Robin's eye widened, so did Nami's. Don't tell me. Yes, after consideration with Rayleigh, who also revealed something else about my original devil fruit, said it was a risk that I could take. So, I ate the other devil fruit. Luffy rubbed his hand on his neck nervously. B but how are you? Still alive? Robin said. I have come across rumors that people who eat two devil fruits will die a gruesome death immediately after consumption. So how did you? Yes, about that. It has to do with what the devil fruit was. It anchored myself to the living world, while my soul actually crossed the plane. So in other words, I am almost an immortal. Luffy explained, everyone's eyes widened save Hancock, who already knew about this. What is the devil fruit that you are talking about? Robin asked, dreading to know the answer. It was, Hito Hito no Mai. Model, Shinigami Luffy said, earning gasps across the deck. While normally consuming this with any other fruit would have killed me. It has to do with my original devil fruit. What? But, it's just Gamu Gamu no Mai, right? It's a normal Paramisha devil fruit. Nami said, well, about that. There is no Gamu Gamu no Mai in this world, as there was never a recorded one. I never knew the actual name of my devil fruit until Rayleigh mentioned it. But, why wasn't it recorded? Nami questioned, because it was erased from the history. Luffy said as Robin gasped at the implications. Why you don't mean, the world government? Robin said, covering her mouth. Yes, they tried their hard to erase the name from the history, but they couldn't as long as the name was widespread in the world. The actual name of my devil fruit is Hito Hito no Mai, model. Nika, Nika, I have heard of the name. In Skype your Robin said, he is said to be the warrior of liberation. Yes, I am the sun god Nika and also the god of death Luffy said, and the rest of the crew turned pale. To possess a devil fruit containing the name of one god in itself is something very crazy. But to think he possessed two of them, they could only feel pity for their future opponents. Why you are joking, right? Usopp said, his hands trembling due to fear. Though I gain rubber properties and fight due to the Nika fruit, it isn't limited to that. Luffy said. None of them questioned his claims as they witnessed the crazy power while they were being attacked by the marine warship. Those two fruit balanced out each other, creating a perfect middle ground for me to work in. Though it does have certain drawbacks, as you witnessed a few moments before. I get all crazy with my bloodlust. And my morality doesn't really stop me from killing anyone who wishes to harm something or someone that belongs to me His eyes gained a dark look, sending shivers upon the spine of the crew. That explains why I felt similar chills to when I used my devil fruit brook set. Anyway, it is not something you have to worry about, as I won't hurt any of you guys. Luffy smiled, and the crew felt assured that it was true. Their captain would never hurt them. Zoro grinned. His captain having two devil fruits and being almost immortal would make their journey easy. But that is not what he would want. He will have to train harder to catch up to his captain so he could stand by his side fighting the monsters of the new world. It will be harder journey from now on. But I promise I will do everything in my power to make sure no one hurts you guys Luffy said with determination in his voice. The crew grinned. Everyone should put on a coat. It will get cold soon Nami announced. Usopp and Brooke ran off to get coats. Chopper smiled as he had natural coat on his body protecting his body heat from escaping. 
Robin also went inside along with Nami to get coats. The rest of the crew had no need for coats as their skin were pretty resistant to heat and cold. Luffy questioned Nami about going straight down into the ocean rather traveling along the sea currents. Nami explained that going straight down would only cause their demise as there are active volcanoes at the bottom of the sea. I heard that deep current flows near the ocean floor. If it were to carry you all the way to the bottom, you wouldn't see the light for 2,000 years, Brooke explained, shocking the members of the crew. But it only made Luffy more excited about the prospect of adventure. Nami wanted to explain about the sea currents which helped them to carry the ship to the bottom of the sea. But the rest of the crew shrugged it off with comment of a mysterious current, infuriating Nami. They then saw the downward flowing waterfall which is supposedly a part of the sea current which they were traveling in. Hey Frankie, are you sure it's okay to go into this current? Nami asked nervously, looking at the big waterfall leading into darkness. Don't worry, Thousand Sunny is a ship made of jewel tree atom wood. It is the ultimate ship. Frankie grinned. Luffy sensed the oncoming threat. Although he already kind of knew what was going to come, certain that those memories giving him insight on what was about to happen, Hancock was the next to sense it, judging by the way her body stiffened ever so slightly. Zoro and Sanji also seemed to sense something. As Zoro calmly placed his hand on the sword hilt and Sanji woke up from his supposed rehabilitation from not being exposed to girls for two years. Oi, look down below. There is something there. A monster. Yuzop yelled in fright. That's a kraken. Nami gasped. Yuzop and Chopper ran around the deck yelling in fear. The kraken was a large octopus-like creature, though each of its tentacles were about the size of 100 elephants put together in a stack. Luffy's eyes got a glint and Hancock noticed it. She could only sigh as the glint was no good. She could barely guess what Luffy wanted to do. Well, that's big. I got a great idea. Let's tame it. He grinned. Some cried in shock. Others just smiled at the usual craziness of his. Nami tried to hit him in the head for his crazy idea. But he was taller than he was before the war, so she could only hit him in the shoulder, which still had no effect on him. Robin calmly started drawing the octopus. They heard commotion behind them. They looked back to see Mamu and the pirate crew coming at them at full speed. Before they could close in, a huge tentacle swung at them, destroying the whole ship at instant and injuring Mamu. Then the tentacle swung at them, aiming to break the ship like what it did a few moments ago. Shit, it is aiming for us. Nami yelled. Luffy just grinned and raised his hand. The weapon, which he hadn't named yet, unusual for Luffy, popped out of his hand and became a staff. He held in hand and channeled his power into it, morphing it into a huge shield. He then threw it, which placed itself between the ship and the tentacle, stopping its attack completely without any harm to the ship. Luffy, what is that? Yuzop asked, stars shining in his eyes. That, it is a weapon that I found in the island I trained on. I don't know what exactly it is as it could change into whatever I want. But it is a perfect match for myself as my powers can easily flow through it Luffy answered. They all turned around to look at the Kraken, which looked enraged. It started swinging all its tentacles madly, which could cause damage to ship. Luffy's eyes narrowed. We have to stop and tame it before it could cause damage to the ship. Luffy said, Nami, don't you have something that could create bubbles around us so that we could leave the ship without getting drowned? Yes, but how do you know about it? She questioned. I don't know. I think I heard about it somewhere he shrugged nonchalantly. Luffy, I am also coming with you. Zoro stepped up. I am too. I have to show how powerful I am to these beautiful ladies. Sanji swooned. T-C-H. No one needs your help, swirly eyebrows. Zoro barked. Huh, what did you say? Shitty Moss head Sanji retorted back. Before they could continue their argument, Luffy stepped it. Sure, let's go then. They all got into separate bubbles, which were an extension of the existing bubble around the ship. This would ensure they could move as freely in the water without the fear of drowning or devil fruit users getting affected by the sea water. Luffy, could you tie yourself to some rope so that you are anchored to the ship and don't get separated? Hancock said, voicing out her concerns. Nah, it's fine. I could sense you guys pretty easily. Also, Zoro and Sanji could swim even if the bubble pops. So, we will be fine. The rope would only be in the way of the fight. Hancock nodded dejectedly, but Luffy had points. She trusted in Luffy. And he keeps his promises. So, she was partly relieved. Yosh, then let's go and make that kraken tame to us. With that, all the three jumped out of the ship bubble and started to move towards the kraken. Before they could get close, the tentacles started attacking the ship. Frankie, rocket launcher. Frankie stepped up to the front and fired a rocket towards the oncoming tentacle, stopping it from hitting the ship. But that didn't completely stop the kraken. It swung another tentacle at the ship. I think I might be able to do it even if we are underwater. Robin said as she crossed out her arms. Mel Fleur's hands started popping from the sides and joined with each other, creating parts upon parts. It eventually conjoined into two huge hands. Gigantesco Mono. The two hands stopped the tentacle in its path, but it also pushed the ship back as that was the only supporting structure underwater. 
Robin was sweating slightly as the seawater was affecting her powers considerably. The trio which went out of the ship were close to the Kraken. Luffy closed his eyes and stretched one of his hands outside the bubble. When he opened his eyes, it glowed white mixed with golden ring. His hair floated a bit, with the edges turning white. A hand outside the bubble expanded in size, mimicking something like Gear 3. Two tentacles of the Kraken charged at him. TCH, that octopus trying to stop him? Sanji sighed. The crew awaited with their breath held. Sanji huffed out his cigarette and vanished, his bubble staying the same place. The crew looked at Bubble with shock. Blue walk. Sanji was moving underwater at speeds which was hard for the crew to comprehend. He pushed water behind his feet similar to running with strength, making him move underwater. For two years, I ran from abominations. You call this monster. It's nothing compared to them. Sanji thought as he started spinning very fast. Diable jam. By and cue it. The spinning leg lit on fire. Flames traveling down to the heel. He then hit the tentacle with enough force sending the tentacle to warp around its body several times with burns on the spot where Sanji hit it. It was rather comical looking at the Kraken as it was wrapped with its tentacles around its body. Zoro then slowly withdrew two of his swords and swung it vertically. Two sword style, crossing of the four paths. It cleaved one of the tentacles of the Kraken completely without much effort. Kraken cried in pain from both the attacks. Boy, Zoro, keep the damage to minimum, Luffy said. He then charged forward, though he couldn't completely abandon his bubble as Sanji due to his devil fruit. Gamu Gamu no. His hand stopped its expansion. Though the hand stayed in the same place, Luffy's arm stretching as he moved forward. Elephant gun. The hand shot forward at incredible speeds. Luffy didn't look much bothered while underwater. The fist hit the Kraken right on the head, concussing it completely and knocking it out. What? How strong did he get in the two years? Yuzap yelled in shock. He knocked it out. What is that? Looks like a shark chopper commented, looking at a shark which came out of the snout of the Kraken. The shark shook itself and then swam off deep into the ocean. The stream of water suddenly changed directions as they neared the waterfall which would lead them into deeper ocean. This caused some panic inside the ship as they were battling not to fall off the ship while also maintaining the direction of the ship. Due to this confusion, Zoro, Sanji and Luffy got separated from the rest of the crew. The ship started to sink into the deeper ocean due to the current pulling by the influence of the waterfall. It took a while for everyone to get their bearings straight. It became very dark, and the crew had hard time finding out the positions of the rest of the crew within the ship. Ooh, looks like we all are alive. Yuzop commented as he tried to look around. It's cold around here. He shivered. We can't Luffy and others. They got separated from us. I hope they weren't eaten by sea beasts already Robin commented nonchalantly, getting panicked cries and scolding from the crew. We are about 20 feet down. We can't go out and search for them. The pressure is too high that it would crush us immediately. Frankie said. Oh no, what are we going to do? It's too dark for us to even see anything. Chopper cried. Don't worry about that. I have a feature on me with light function. Frankie said. Nipple lights. The light came exactly from where Frankie mentioned. Why is it shining down there? Yuzap yelled with a comical look. But that was muffled by the surprised gasps. There were huge sea beasts with sizes extending up to three times the size of the Thousand Sunny. There are also many forms of aquatic life forms such as jellyfish, seals, eels but their sizes were bigger than usual. It was the deep ocean untouched by light, that was the underworld of the sea. Even with Sunny's inbuilt lights, it was hardly visible. They were surrounded by large numbers of sea monsters. Hence, they had to carefully tread the path, without disturbing the monsters. There were several instances where they had close calls with them. What happened, Chopper? Frankie asked as he saw him being sprawled on the deck, sweating heavily. I don't know. It suddenly feels very hot Chopper said. Yuzop also affirmed the same, as he discarded the winter clothes that he wore minutes ago. They could also see smoke rising from the ground. Ah, uh, these must be. The hydrothermal vents. We are in the volcanic region. Nami yelled. It seems to be active. We have to get out of here fast. They used a mini coop to burst to get of the region. But they were low on air. They spotted a huge ball of light at distance. Frankie steered the ship towards it. Wait, don't go that side. Hancock said as her senses tickled for something big below them. Frankie immediately steered the ship up, narrowly dodging the bite of a huge angler fish. Shit, that was too close. Frankie breathed out. They heard someone calling names in the distance. A very large figure appeared behind the rocky structures of the seabed. And Koro, how many times did I tell not to eat the ships? Captain Vander Decken will be very angry. The figure shouted as it hit the angler fish in its head, causing a large bump to form. Uh, what is it now? Why did it hit the fish? Use up cried. Did it just save us? Nami questioned. Whatever, we must escape quickly. They both are monsters. Use up cried. Before anyone could reply, they started to hear someone singing. They turned to see a broken ship, with barely held structure and sails floated towards them. A ghost ship. Brooke shouted in fear. 
Even Hancock wore a worried expression. That ship does not belong in this world. One stormy night, a captain of the ship went mad and drowned all of his crew and cursed at the gods. He name was Captain van der Decken and his ship was the Flying Dutchman. To punish him, the gods decreed him to roam the seas for all eternity. Brooke told the history. And Koro, Wadatsumi, if you eat the ship, we can't get the treasures. A chilling voice sounded from the cursed Flying Dutchman ship. Smash them, aye aye Sir Wadatsumi. The huge blowfish man replied as he readied his fist to smash the thousand sunny. Frankie, you scooped a burst Nami said. We can't, we are out of juice. Frankie yelled back. Before it could hit the ship, a huge tentacle rushed forward and hit Wadatsumi square on the lower jaw, sending him backwards. Stop. That's enough the kraken reeled back in fear as the voice erupted from its head. The kraken barely suppressed the urge to shiver, but it certainly was visible that the creature was in deep fear. Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, you're all alive, Yuzop exclaimed. Yo guys, Luffy grinned. They landed on the ship and the bubbles popped out. Sanji and Luffy were in one bubble, and Zoro was in another. Seriously, did you tame that octopus monster? Nami questioned. Yeah, I wanted to take the best route through the seas, right Surum? Luffy smiled at the octopus, which it returned with scratching its head. Now, what is happening? Luffy asked. I think the sea volcano is about to erupt. Nami yelled. Luffy ordered Surum to take the ship and go to safety. The scorching heat from the erupting volcano were affecting many in the crew, but they eventually went to safety, or rather down another huge hole. The boulders from the eruption were thrown at their direction, but Usopp stopped it from affecting the ship by using one of his new bullet types. We are saved. Chopper breathed out in relief. They were out of the dark and the light was blinding here. Hey Nami, is that what I think it is? Luffy said grinning, pointing at something. Yes, there's no mistake. The needle is pointing that way. It must be the Fishman Island. Whoa, it is surrounded by a huge air bubble. Maybe there is air inside. The Island of Dancing Mermaids. The home of beautiful mermaid princess. This is what I imagined about. We're finally here, the paradise. Sanji sang and his eyes were heart-shaped. He was starting to bleed from his nose. How can you take orders from a mere human? A voice rang out from the distance. Heads snapped at the direction. There are several sea beasts, but they weren't on their own. They were tied to leashes which were held by fishmen. Your straw hats. I know you well. You crushed the dreams of Arlong pirates the voice said. He was Hammond, of new fishmen pirates. But two years ago, you protected Hatchie and punched those detestable celestial dragons. What are we supposed to do with you guys, huh? Hammond asked. So, tell me, are you with us or against us? Will you submit to us, or do you refuse? Nami requested Frankie to fill up the coop to burst as she assumed that they won't be able to fight 30 feet below the water. The pressure would instantly kill them. Robin agreed that that was their best course of option. But Hancock stayed silent. Now tell Straw Hat. Will you become our vassals? Hammond shouted. Idiot. No way. Luffy yelled back. Prepare the coop to burst. Frankie. Nami ordered. Wait. Luffy's voice rang, and everyone stopped in their tracks. It was powerful and commanding. We are not going to run from this. It would only make us look weak. We will send the message right to them that we are not going to join them as vassals. Luffy said. Zoro and Hancock grinned. Sanji just huffed, but he wore a slight smirk as well. Frankie and Robin also grinned, but the rest were unsure. Who? What do you think you could do to us? Hammond laughed. But it stopped right as it started as he felt a measurable chill spread in the air. He shuddered at the sudden drop in temperature. He looked at Luffy, who looked calm, but one could easily feel the blood lust off him. The crew also felt the temperature, but mildly compared to the fishmen. Their primal senses screaming at them to run from the place. The fishmen crew slowly started to back off. Luffy's eyes were black. You want our crew to be our vassals? You really think I would do that? Luffy's voice was low, but it was cold. Luffy raised his hands and made a grabbing motion. Grim state, soul destruction. A fish man near Hammond started to choke underwater. He thrashed and thwarted, but eventually he became still. Everyone understood what it meant. He was dead. Why you? What did you do? Hammond stuttered in fear. Hmm, why would I tell you that? Luffy shrugged, staring at him. You will pay for this. I will make sure. He yelled and retreated. Luffy just grinned. Now, who wants to go to Fishman Island? Luffy yelled, which was awarded with a crowd of cheers. The ship slowly approached the gate, which was guarded by two fishman soldiers. The gigantic bubble enclosure was a marvel to look at. As the closed in, they could make out several places in the Fishman Island. Stop your ship right there. A soldier yelled. Luffy jumped up on the figurehead while the others gathered around him on the deck. What do you want? The soldier questioned. Then the soldier noticed the jolly roger of the ship and his face paled slightly. This was someone who fought in the war of the best two years ago. They would have to tread the roads carefully. We want to visit the Fishman Island and explore it. Luffy replied with a big grin on his face. The rest of the crew murmured their wish as well. We will have to relay this to the kingdom before you can enter. Wait here. The soldier said and went to the gate. 
Hello, this is the front entrance. The Straw Hat Pirates are requesting entry to the land for sightsee. The soldier relied. You can let them in. I'll inform the royalty. Make sure to give them clear instructions and rules about this island and the consequences of breaking them. A voice replied from the other side. I, sir. The soldier returned to the pirates who were waiting. You can enter the island. You can go through the island and visit places which are only allowed to visit for the humans. You shouldn't cause any harm to the citizens of the country or cause any ruckus. If you do, you will be executed by the royal army. He warned. Luffy just nodded. It wasn't like he went looking for trouble. Totally he doesn't. The trouble just finds him. The gate opened and the ship entered. The straw hats entered the island. Their bubble was intact until they reached a shore of sort, above which there was air. Hence it took out the bubble. They anchored the ship at the harbor. Yosh, let's go and explore. Luffy jumped. Luffy wait. We have to decide what are the things we have to do here. Like stocking up on food, cola for the ship and buying dresses. Nami said. Awa, I don't want to go to shopping. Luffy whined. Then let's split up. I'll go with Luffy Hancock said. Hancock Chan. Then I'll be your shining knight in armor. Sanji swooned around her, his nose slightly bleeding. He was very close to her, which earned him a kick in the face, sending him crashing into the ship's railing. T.C.H. Don't come too close to me, you pervert. Only people I deem worthy could have that honor. Hancock said. Zora whistled and smiled gleefully. That was a nice shot. It will hopefully teach the Arokuk a lesson. Huh, what did you say? Marimo, Sanji said, getting up from the crashed position. Who are you calling Marimo? Curly eyebrows. Zoro unsheathed his swords to fight. Stop it. Nami bonked both of them in the head, earning bumps. Don't start a fight now. Understood Nami-san. Sanji started his swooning again. Hancock-chan. What a beautiful style even when you kicked me. You look like God is punishing his naughty servant. I wonder how you would look without the clothes. Hancock got a dark look on her face. You're creepy. One more word and you will find yourself without your mouth. Stay away from me. Or else nothing will stop me from doing something to you. Sanji shivered at the glare that was aimed at him. Ha ha, I am just joking G. Hancock Chan. Sanji stuttered. Nami sighed. All right, Luffy, Hancock. You two can go around the island and enjoy your adventure. Use up, Brooke. Buy cola and other things needed for the ship. Earning nods from both, she continued. Chopper and Robin can get the medicines needed if any and then explore around the island. Sanji, make sure the food is stocked up and then meet me at the town's marketplace. Hi, Nami-san. Sanji nodded vigorously. Zoro, go with Yuzop and help them around. Zoro just huffed. Frankie, you take care of the ship now, we will switch it up after a while. I'll go and get some clothes from the shops. Her eyes gained a greedy look. Everyone could tell whoever the poor shop owner is. He, she will get a major loss soon. They all dispersed. Luffy and a very happy Hancock started walking towards the coral structures that they could see in the far. One thing they noticed that the fishmen around them were giving them wide-eyed looks and they looked a bit pale and sweaty. Some looked with heart in their eyes, obviously looking at Hancock like a meat of a prey. But a glare from the pirate empress made them run away in fear. They eventually reached the coral structures, which looked like buildings for residency. They also spotted various mermaids at the distance swimming. Hancock silently fumed at the states of dressing. One glance at Luffy said that he wasn't even slight bit deterred from the usual facade of his. Luffy suddenly grinned. Hancock was confused as to why this happened. Did he see some mermaid who looked beautiful to him? Is he going to propose his love to them? Before she could panic about this situation, a hand grabbed her hand and started pulling her. Oh Luffy, where are we going? Hancock asked, to meet a friend. Luffy replied and started going faster towards the swimming mermaids. Kami, Luffy shouted. The person in question, Kami, is a mermaid with lime green hair and dark purple eyes. She had purple fins. She looked around to find the source from which her name came. Then she spotted him and her face split into a huge smile. Luffy Chin. She immediately jumped up from the water and hugged him tightly, not noticing the shocked look from someone behind. The other mermaids around in the water started whispering. When did you come here, Luffy Chin? You have grown up so big and tall. Kami said. Oh, we just arrived. We were walking around here when I spotted you. So, I came here. Luffy replied. Oh, but you weren't to arrive till next year, right? I was planning on guiding you to this island from the Sabati. She questioned. Huh, why though? It was supposed to be only two years Luffy said titling his head in confusion. Kami blinked, and blinked again. Then she yelled, oh shit, I missed the date by one year. Which earned a laugh from Luffy and almost a face palm from Hancock and other mermaids. Oh yes, I should introduce you to my friends. Kami said, everyone, this is Monkey D. Luffy, captain of Straw Hat Pirates she introduced and Luffy waved at them. The mermaids looked at him waving and blushed slightly. They waved back shyly and some flirtingly. But their senses screamed danger and when they looked at behind him, they could see Boa Hancock with a deathly glare. They immediately paled and gulped. Oh, I should introduce my crewmate too. 
He pulled Hancock to the front. This is Boa Hancock, my crewmate. The mermaids just nodded politely and waved slightly, mostly due to fear. But Luffy was completely oblivious to these. Kami just looked at the weird behavior with confusion, but soon shrugged it off. Luffy Chin, where are others? It has been long since I saw them all. Oh, everyone is in the island. We split up to do some errands. Though we are just going around sightseeing the island. Oh, that's great. I'll show you guys around if it isn't a bother Kami requested. Sure, it will be great if we do not get lost in these islands right? Hancock, Luffy replied. Yeah, that's true Luffy. Hancock replied, her face looking extremely unenthusiastic and partly angry. Then it's decided. Let's go. Luffy said. Hancock didn't have enough time to mop about the fact that her time with Luffy cut short by someone else joining with them. She was looking forward some private time with Luffy. But she supposed it was uncharacteristic of Luffy to ignore anyone's request when they are his friend. They moved towards the island's center, towards various shops scattered around the island, somewhere else on the island. What? That's ridiculous. We can't give all these with 70% discount. The shop cashier cried at the relentless assault by an orange-haired woman. These clothes are only worth that much. I am doing yourself a favor by giving so much money. I should be reasonably asking for 90% discount. Nami replied. Wah, B, but that's not how it works. He yelled. Boy, are you really denying what Nami-san is asking? If you do not give it, I'll beat you and take it for free. Sanji threatened as he stood beside Nami carrying several packages. Help me. He cried as he was approached by another figure. What is the commotion here? A voice called out. Uh, owner, please help me. These guys are asking for so many clothes at so little price. Who is it? The figure stepped on the table. Who had a starfish shape? Uh, Nami, Sanji, Pepagu. The starfishman called out. Pepagu, is that you? Nami asked bewildered. Yes. He jumped up and hugged her. Wait, are you the owner of this establishment? Nami questioned, Billy signs shining in her eyes. Paha, yes. This and many other establishments around the island. You can take anything you want for free from here. I'll allow it. He replied. Well, that's so nice of you. He got squished between her hug. Then he got released from the hug as he gasped for breath. Nami asked the cashier to provide her with the entire set of clothes in the current branch of the shop. Earning sweat drop from Papago. Fishman District, the deep sea. What? He threatened you, you say. A deep voice rumbled, sending shivers down the spines of people around him. Why yes boss, be but I assure you, I'll make him surrender next time Hammond assured. So, straw hat Luffy, he is finally here huh? The voice said, his sharp teeth shining as he grinned. Bring him to me. Why yes boss, Hammond replied. Kami, Luffy called I want to meet someone on this island. Who? The mermaid princess. Kami questioned. Hancock's brow twitched. No, I want to meet Jinb. Luffy exclaimed, smiling widely. Big boss Jinb. Yes, without his help, I wouldn't have made it two years ago. Hence why I want to meet him. Luffy said, we promised to meet up here. Oh, now that I think about it, I remember reading an article about you and Jinb two years ago. Kami said, as for Jinb, he is not in the island. What? Yeah, after the war ended, he left his position as warlord and former fishman pirates weren't allowed to stay here anymore. They all left this island with big boss Jinb. Oh, that sucks. I want to meet him though. Don't worry, I am sure you could meet him soon. Why don't we go and look around? Kami said. Uh, I have a great idea. I'll take you guys to Mermaid Cafe. Oh, cafe. I hope there are things to eat. Luffy said as he walked behind Kami. Safe to say Hancock didn't like it. Oi, Brooke, did we get everything we need? Yuzop asked as they carried everything that was assigned for them to buy. Yes, Yuzop san We are done with the purchases. Brooke replied. Great. We will go and drop off these things on the ship and then let's go look around the island. After they dropped off the goods. They walked towards the various buildings that was present around the area which the ship was parked in. They eventually spotted something that caught both of their eyes. Sometime later, uh, Luffy Chain, here we are. This is the mermaid cafe that the mermaids and I work in, Kami said excitedly as they walked into the shop. Oh, Luffy, you are here too. A voice called him from behind. Luffy turned to see Yuzop there, stuffing his face out with food. Luffy's mouth immediately drooled. They saw Brooke back at the corner with two mermaids on him. His face showed that he was having the best time of his life. Use up. Is that food? Luffy fixed his gaze on the best thing he considered to be on this place, even though there were several mermaids looking at him with blushes on their cheeks. Luffy Chin. Wait, I'll introduce you to our boss who takes care of this place. Kami intervened. Hey, can't we do that after eating? Luffy pouted. It won't take more than five minutes. Come. She dragged him inside and Hancock followed, glaring at the mermaids. One would wonder how close she is to murdering someone on that place. Madame Charlie, a large mermaid with purple nail polish, red lipstick, and blue eyes with slanted pupils that resemble shark eyes turned towards them. Oh, Kami, is it? She replied as she smoked. I want to introduce you to Ah. 
Luffy Chin don't touch that. Kami yelled. Luffy was about to touch a glass ball with smoky appearance inside. You insolent vulgar boy. Charlie raged. Kami was sweating. Luffy Chin. Apologize. Ha huh, sorry sorry. Luffy laughed. Kami huffed and continued. So as I was saying. This is Luffy Chin and that is Hancock Chin. Luffy Chin was the one who saved me from those slavers two years ago. Hancock's eyes widened. Now that everything was put into place, she could clearly see who that was. This was the mermaid who was captured by the celestial dragons, but was saved by Luffy. That was the incident which eventually led to her meeting Luffy. Her stance softened towards the mermaid. After all, she knew what it was to serve the celestial dragons. I see, Kami take a day off. Take them around the island, Charlie said. You sure? Yes, there hasn't been much human pirates here for some time. I have enough waitress to handle the customers. Charlie replied. Oh, oops, I forgot. Drop off the clams to Pepagu. He must be starving. Sure, Madam Charlie. Kami bowed and left. Luffy and Hancock following them. All right, Luffy Chin. You can have some food here. But we shouldn't be late to deliver these to Papago. It has been long since he saw you guys, Kami said. Luffy frowned at the time limit. But he couldn't exactly refuse as he also wanted to meet the starfishman. Use up. Order me food too. Luffy ran off. Sanji Kun. We are going there. Naomi called as she walked towards the mermaid cafe. What is that? Sanji looked at the sign which was placed in front of the shop. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready. You will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye. Is is. T that. Sanji's nose was already bleeding. Nami just sighed and went inside the shop. Sanji soon followed. He witnessed the inflow of emotions from being around so many mermaids that he stood shocked at the entrance. The door was still open and he stood there, his nose starting to bleed profusely. T this. This is my dream. He yelled as he shot backward onto the alley due to the sprout of blood that flowed from his nostrils. Sanji Kun. Nami shrieked in shock. Luffy, who was inside the shop, immediately picked up on the distressed emotion from his crew and also the low pulse from the other crewmate, was on his feet before anyone could notice. He was followed by Hancock, who was still wasn't much used to the auras of the crew, could still pick up the wavering aura and the shriek that sounded outside the shop. Yuzop and Brooke also rushed outside, clearly heard the shout of one of their crewmates. As they reached outside, they saw Sanji lying down in a puddle of blood. Aside him was Nami frantically trying to wake him up, which clearly wasn't working. Nami, what is happening? Luffy's voice sounded as he closed in the distance very quickly. Luffy, I don't know. He was entering the cafe. Suddenly he sprouted a lot of blood and he just fainted. He is still losing blood. Nami replied nervously. Guys, another voice sounded. They turned around to see Chopper running towards them. Chopper, perfect timing. Come here, Sanji is losing blood. Luffy yelled. Hey, losing blood. Oh no, we have to call a doctor. Someone call a doctor. Chopper shouted, frantically running around. Oi, you are the doctor. Yuzop replied sweat dropping. Oh yeah, I am the doctor. Move. Let me see him. Chopper wedged into the gaps and found his way from the growing crowd around them towards Sanji. He checked his pulse and other vitals. Oh no, he is losing a lot of blood. We need to set up a blood transfusion of S-negative type immediately. Otherwise, he might die. Chopper said, please, someone give blood to Sanji. Yes, please give him blood. Luffy also shouted. He would do anything to make sure his crew stays alive. Chopper, Mermen, mermaids and humans all have the same blood. We can get transfusions from each other. But, Kami trailed off. Before Kami could reply, different voices were heard as they called her urgently. Kami, a ship is coming. It might be coming. A ship from Palace is coming. Maybe there's nobody on it. Of course, someone's on it. Five different voices sounded at the same time. Kami watched them with amusement. Who's on the ship? She questioned. We don't know. But they wouldn't come without a reason. That's true. We will have to wait and see what will happen. Kami replied as she looked towards the eel fish carrying a ship on its back. A brass band played sounds which is usually played at royal festivals. Their excellencies, the Neptune brothers are arrived. An enormous, muscular shark merman, with a wide chest and large arms stepped out of the ship. He had a long face, framed by wavy fair blue hair flowing down to his shoulders, a sharp and pointy nose, and a dot of some sort printed on the middle of his forehead. He has gills on his massive neck and stood tall with a long trident on his hand. Another extremely tall and thin merman and is the second tallest of his brothers. He has wide eyes, long wavy dark pink hair, and beaver-like teeth. He had two swords strapped to his back which had green handle. There was another one who had rotund, stocky and large figure with white polka dots littered on his red tail. He also had brown hair and red fins on his head. These three were from the Neptune family, who were the royal family ruling the Fishman Island. The first was Funakoshi, the eldest of the three and the crown prince of the Neptune family. 
The second was Ruboshi and the last one was Manboshi. Fukuboshi stepped outside and came into view for Luffy and his crew as well as the mermaids to see. Oh, it's the princes. A mermaid shouted in joy. Are they important or something? Luffy asked. Kami explained about their importance. You there? A voice called out. Luffy looked up to see Fukuboshi pointing at him. Hancock slightly tensed as they had no idea why Luffy is being called right now. What? Luffy yelled back. Oi, you, don't you dare disrespect the royal family. Apologize immediately. A servant yelled. Stop. We don't want to create unnecessary tensions between us. It is fine. He is a pirate and this is to be expected. The prince replied and turned back to Luffy. We heard that you have entered the island. We also know you fought in the War of the Best along with Pirate Whitebeard. The only reason we have let you all inside the island is because of the respect we hold towards the great pirate, else we would never have let pirates like you enter our land. Luffy stayed silent listening. His face betrayed no emotions and he just stared back neutrally. Be warned, if you harm anyone on this island, we will be forced to take action against you and your crew. Fikaboshi warned. Luffy was quickly losing patience as he wasn't in the mood to deal with these. A crewmate of his is dying and he has to find a way to get help. All right, now that you said that, you could leave. We want somebody to help us give blood to Sanji. Luffy said, ha ha ha. A coarse voice sounded from behind. They all turned around to see Hamad standing there, along with several other fishermen wielding weapons on their hands. Stupid humans. No one on Fishman Island would be foolish enough to give blood to you. If they do, they will be judged by the night to death. Hamad yelled, look at that blood. Let him bleed to death. It is forbidden to share any blood with humans as said in the laws of these lands. Hamad laughed. The death of Fisher Tiger was no different. He was a hero. He risked his life to free the slaves. In that bloody battle, he could have survived if he was given blood. But you selfish humans didn't want to have your blood mixed with his. That's why he died. Hancock slightly stiffened at the mention of Fisher Tiger. Several memories started to pop up in her head, but she forcefully squashed it down to focus on the reality. Now leave that guy to die and come to Fishman District. Captain Hody Jones orders you to come. He said, I don't care about the laws of this country. Does anyone have S negative type blood here? We will do anything to you. Please just save his life. Luffy shouted back. To CH. We will have to take them by force. Hammond said. Bayonet. A large net advanced towards them to capture them. Luffy's anger was barely simmering on the surface. But Hancock quickly advanced towards the three perpetuators. Perfume femur her leg kicked them at high speeds. Sending them flying backwards into the corals. Knocking them out. Only one there was still conscious. Though he was on his knees. Breathing heavily from the blow. Hancock. A sea beast behind you. Use up yelled. Though Hancock had already sensed it with her observation, she just merely started at it and put forth her conqueror's hacky on it. The sea beast immediately subdued and whined at the force of her will. Usopp and others started at shock. Luffy smirked slightly. What? The sea beast gave up without fighting. Amazing. Usopp said. Luffy Chin, bring Sanji inside. There are humans who are willing to give him blood. Kami said. Luffy nodded and carried him inside. Wait, you can't leave while you are in the presence of royalty without their permission. The servant yelled. But he immediately started sweating under the glare of Luffy. Hey, I didn't send you so you could warn them about the island. A voice was heard from inside. Yes, father. I apologize for that. I'll speak of the main reason why we came here Fukuboshi replied. What do you want? Hancock stepped forward. Her face morphed into a fierce glare. Please, I don't mean any harm as long as you don't start at first. I came here to invite you all to the royal palace. Fukuboshi placated. What? Nami said, shocked. Kami and Papago who arrived at the place during the fight gaped at shock as well. Yes, you saved Megalo, who is a very dear friend to my sister, the mermaid princess. He is a shark who got lost a few days ago. Our sister was inconsolable at his disappearance. He arrived at the palace this morning and conveyed the story to our father. He invited you all to dinner tonight, Fukuboshi said. All right, but we have to save our crewmate first, Luffy said. Yes, yes, I will make sure to send our transport vehicle to pick you up from this place once he gets better, Fukuboshi said. Luffy nodded and carried Sanji inside. Noah, the fishman district. All hands on the oars. We are going to set sail now. Someone yelled. Quietly. Quietly. Uff. We managed to escape without them noticing us. Hurry. We gotta get out of this shitty place. I am never visiting Fishman Island again. We were surrounded by sea beasts 30 feet below. We had no choice but to become their henchmen or die. The captain of the ship, Crabhand Gyro said. They ran away, you say. Yes boss. They ran always. Dawson, they never learn. Dawson, Hammerhead Shark Fishman, an executive of New Fishman Pirates said, The humans run all the time. Zio, a Wabagong Shark Fishman replied, Ha ha, let's tear them from limb to limb. Daruma, Cookie Cutter Shark Fishman said, Mukai, then I will take care of them. 
Ikaro's much, giant squid fish man, who was another executive of the new fish man pirate set. Haha, <laughs> fine. Let's make an example of them. Hody Jones, the captain of new fishman pirate set. You don't have to go, Ikaros. I'll go Hody said as he picked up few of the red pills that was in bowl nearby and swallowed it. Immediately his blood started pumping and his limbs grew more. His vision narrowed and his eyes gained a red shine. You are taking too much again. Daruma said, leave it be, Daruma. It doesn't matter. We have checked ourselves and there are no negative outcomes present, at least in this modified version. Still, I can't believe we got our hands on something this good. Energy steroids, the power drug that is, in the sea. That's Hody Jones. A crewmate yelled, looking at the figure floating few hundred meters away from them. He found us. What is that? Handcuffs. Gyro questioned. Before anyone could react, Hody shot forward at impossible speeds underwater and busted a hole in the pirate ship. He is on the ship. Someone yelled. Uh, I have fought fishmen before. I can't let this end here. Gyro yelled as he charged at Hody. But Hody simply bit off his crab claws, severing both of his hands. Within a few minutes, most of the crew was destroyed and killed. As so, that handcuffs are just to show that he can sink us without using his hands. Ha <laughs> ha, looks like our boss is having fun Dawson. Dawson said, yes, fishmen are ten times stronger than humans. A single dose of energy steroids will multiply that into four times. Two pills double it again. It will help us in putting our plan into motion. These humans deserve it after all. They are responsible for the death of Fisher Tiger. We will carry on Arlong's will and we, the new Fishman Pirates will make sure to eradicate the dark and gloomy days of Fishman from the history. The Karos laughed. Tie them up. Hody said. Oh, you didn't kill them all. Zio questioned. No, we need them to convey the message to those in the surface. Tell them who did this. Let the humans fear us. We will take the throne from the weak sea god, Neptune and we will let the whole world know that we Fishman are superior. Hody grinned. Huff huff. Somehow, I managed to roll myself off the ship, which also managed to break the barrel. Caribou sighed. He looked around to see that he was in a coral region, which he supposed was in the Fishman Island. He couldn't exactly hear what the crew were speaking, but he did hear the yelling and the threatening that happened with the Fishman before they entered the island. He was terrified about the straw hat-wearing monster. Even the mere gaze held something far powerful than anything he had witnessed before. If anything, he would want to escape from this place without getting in the way of them. He spotted a pool with several mermaids swimming. His eyes gained a predatory look and unsettling glee shone in his eyes. Mermaids. He slowly closed the distance between them. He was thankful that the sea stone nails in the barrel didn't touch him in any way, only weakening him slightly. He did need his powers to do what he wanted right now, after all. The mermaids were on the shore, playing with each other. They didn't notice Caribou as he closed in on them. He raised his hands, realizing swamp mud all around the place, surrounding the mermaids. Then he made the mud slowly move towards the mermaids, thanks to his devil fruit. When the mermaids did notice the mud flowing towards them, they tried to jump around and escape, but it was for naught as they were completely surrounded by the swamp mud. They slowly started sinking down into the mud. They tried to yell for help, but they were swiftly silenced by caribou. It's too late. You can't escape. He laughed. It's a muddy bottomless swamp. The more you struggle, the faster you sink. These mermaids sell at the human auction houses for 70 million each. I guess I should be thankful to the straw hats for these. Coral Hill, Port Town, Ryugu Kingdom. What happened, Madam Charlie? Puff, this is going to be terrible. Charlie yelled. Find him. Find him. Find the man with straw hat. She cried. Straw hat Luffy. I didn't intend to look, but I got an ominous feeling to look into it. She said. It's terrible. What happened? What did you see? He will bring ruin to the entire island, or else he would be the cause of something that can only be imagined by the likes of us. She bellowed. Meanwhile on another part of the island. Whoa, we can see majority of the island from here. Usopp exclaimed. Yeah, Chopper agreed. The view from the back of the Megala while traveling up to the royal palace was something that was quite the experience. Luffy stayed unusually quiet, as he had sensed something that was troubling. The aura was malicious and dark, but the most intriguing or rather the terrifying part is that, whatever it was, had no thoughts. It was rather filled with intent to kill, maim and hurt others. It was unsettling to say the least, but he supposed he could ignore it for now, he would take care if it were to harm their crew. I wonder how long it will take for us to reach the royal palace. I am feeling quite hungry already. Luffy whined. Didn't you just eat? Use up sweat dropped. Really? Did you say that the straw hats had kidnapped several mermaids? A passerby commented. Yes, that's what the rumors say, that they supposedly kidnapped the mermaids on the shore. Another one replied, This is troublesome. What if does really bring destruction to the island? Are we going to die? Then he cried at the question. It was the fact that Madame Charlie's prediction always came true. But they were talking nicely to the mermaid, Prince Fukuboshi. Someone yelled and everyone looked up to see the prince's landing on the ground. 
Madam Charlie, did you really see the vision you mentioned earlier? He questioned. About Straw Hat Luffy destroying the island? Yes, I did see that. There is no denying it. She replied. Madam Charlie, your ability to foresee the future is known even in the castle. This is troubling. We intend to honor them for saving our sister's pet. The future isn't set, but we shouldn't let them on loose. He sighed. Whoa, this is the palace. This is so big. Usopp exclaimed as he got down from the boat taxi. I wonder how the light reaches so far down into the sea. It is almost as if the Fishman Island lights up this part of the sea. That's the Fishman Island's secret. It is not because that Fishman Island is here, sunlight shines, but rather because Fishman Island was located in such place that this would be the only place in the entire sea where light shines. A deep, guttural voice sounded from behind. Usopp screamed and turned back to see a giant-sized and muscular coelacanth merman standing proud with gold crown donning his head. He wielded a huge trident with gem fixed along the shaft and red poised tips, announcing, His Majesty, King Neptune. A soldier announced. However, no one batted an eye or bowed in respect to him, just staring and awing at the huge merman. Bow before him, he is the king of the Fishman Island. The soldier screamed, but Neptune raised his hands to stop him. There is no need. I can see he won't be bowing to anyone. His crew only bows to him. You can't force him to bow. King Neptune said. The soldier merely bowed his head in acceptance. I welcome you all to the Ryugu castle. Make yourself home. He boomed and stretched his arms wide in welcome. The straw hat smiled in response. This palace looks like fun. Luffy grinned. Oh, your majesty. This is unfortunate. Minister of Right spoke. You brought our guests. We just received word from Prince Fukuboshi. The minister of left said. What did he say? The king questioned. Where did Luffy go? Nami questioned. Hancock immediately stretched her hacky throughout the castle. She found Luffy lurking around the west part of the castle. She then relaxed knowing that he was still here. Don't worry, he is in the castle Hancock replied. Others shrugged, knowing Luffy wouldn't stay in one place when he is bored. The palace was huge, but with Luffy's excellent smelling scents, especially with meat food, he had no trouble going around it. He had smelled delicious aroma from the castle when he entered it, and his stomach cannot handle the weight for food anymore. So, he started walking towards it. He stopped in front of huge doors, made out of steel. It had several axes hanging off of it and it was dented in multiple places. He sensed something very powerful beyond the doors. If his memories were to be correct, it was the mermaid princess, but he wanted to check anyway. So, he entered the room. What he didn't remember was how the princess looked. The room was completely dark, but for Luffy, the food shined in golden light. He walked on a smooth, bouncy surface. He didn't understand why this place was so bouncy. But his excitement got better of him and he started bouncing there, eliciting squeaks and moans from the other side of the room. He then recognized the owner of the sound, but he remained quiet as he couldn't sense if she was a danger or a friend. Is someone there? Came out a low-pitched, feminine voice. She sounded young and vulnerable, completely opposite to the power she held. Lights were turned on and Luffy saw a huge mermaid with the hair tied to a bun. She was sweaty all over the body. Why are you stepping on me? She questioned, though that came out as a bunch of stutters due to fear. Who are you? Oh, a huge mermaid. Luffy exclaimed. Have you come to kill me too? I, I am not afraid. I am the daughter of King Neptune and a princess. She yelled. And she did the exact opposite thing one would expect from someone who just said they weren't afraid. She started crying. Dad. Brothers. Help me. Deep under the sea. Wadatsumi. Did I get an answer yet to my letter to Princess Shurahoshi? Vander Deccan yelled. Not yet, Captain. He replied, cowered at the fear. How many years have I waited for her answer? For about ten. And yet she hasn't bothered to reply me. It's all that Neptune's fault. He is planning to marry off Princess Shurahoshi for political reasons, I think. Vander Deccan ranted. Why else would he imprison her in that tower for ten years? I guess it is time for me to send her another rose axe. Vander rose from his seat and took a double-edged axe with a rose symbol etched to its middle. He held the axe in his left hand and threw it with as much force as he could muster. The axe spun at high speeds, heading towards the royal palace. Princess Shurahoshi. You are destined to be mine and mine only. You will never live with any other man. If you do, you will die. He laughed. Ryugu Castle, the kingdom of Ryugu. Wah. It came from the shell tower. A guard said. That was Princess Shurahoshi's cry. What happened to the security? Someone barked. Footsteps sounded as panic ensured outside the tower. Man, she is quite loud. What do I do? Luffy exclaimed. Hey, I didn't come to kill you. I didn't know it was your food. I just came here to eat. Luffy suddenly straightened up, his observation picking up on something heading towards them at extreme speeds. Hey, Luffy said, his voice laced with dangerous aura dawning around him. Shurahoshi immediately stopped crying, looking at Luffy with fearful eyes. Something is coming. It's an axe. He said, oh no, the doors are open, it is going to hit me. She started to cry. 
The huge axe entered the room, heading straight towards the mermaid princess. But Luffy raised his left hand, Haki covering his arms as he held the axe at its place. Stopping it from hitting the princess, the axe struggled to get out of Luffy's grasp. But Luffy held it in place, his face showing no signs of struggle. He then applied pressure on the axe. Cracks started forming around his grip, traveling down along the shaft of the blade. It suddenly broke apart, shattering into multiple pieces. Luffy calmly dusted his hands off and turned towards Shirahoshi, who was shell-shocked from the near death as well as the powers shown by the straw-hatted man. Not even her father could stop the axe. He could only change its course of direction and he struggled a bit to do that too. Before she could say anything, footsteps started coming from outside the door. Look, the gate is open. What happened here? We saw an axe, where did it go? Princess Shirahoshi, are you alright? The minister of left asked, panic evident on his face. Luffy was held tightly on Shirahoshi's hand, and her hand was behind her, covering him from the minister and the guards. I am sorry for worrying you, but everything's fine. I just had a bad dream. Shirahoshi placated. Oh, is that so? Then I am glad you're safe, he said. He didn't notice the shards of axe lying on the ground, which was subtly covered by the enormous tail of Shirahoshi. What happened to the axe? A guard asked. Axe? There was no axe here, Shirahoshi said quickly, hoping they would believe her. Huh, is that so? I think it must have my imagination then. The guard said, confused. Oh yes, there is something I have to tell you. It regards to the straw hat Luffy, who saved Megalo. The minister said. Huh, what is it? He and his pirates are suspected of kidnapping the missing mermaids, and it is said that he will bring doom upon this kingdom. It has been decided that they would be imprisoned in the castle dungeons. The swordsman has already been captured, he said. Luffy was silent, listening to all of this. Shirahoshi was sweating slightly, confused as to what to do in this situation. It won't be long before the others are arrested. Please be wary as the captain has disappeared. He could be hiding in the castle, the minister requested. Though, our five minutes are up. We must excuse ourselves now, he said looking at his pocket watch. Thank you very much for the warning. Please forgive me for worrying you. Shirahoshi said. As the minister and the guards left, Shirahoshi slowly brought up Luffy so that they were facing each other face to face. You saved Megalo right, your name is Luffy. She asked warily. Yeah, he answered, petting the shark. You are a pirate. Does that mean you are a bad person? She asked. Hmm, I don't know. You can decide that yourself. Luffy said, looking at the table, which contained various dishes. Your friends have been captured by the soldiers, she said, looking at Luffy who was eyeing the meat. Nah, don't worry about that. They could never be captured by you guys, he said confidently. Now, there was an issue which was on the back of his mind. He had seen some visions on a similar scenario before. About the axe, the one who threw that, does he go by the name Vadner? No, Vander Deccan, Luffy asked, looking straight at the princess. She flinched at the gaze of his. Yes, he wants to kill me because I won't marry him. He has the Mark Mark Devil fruit. He can hit any target he aims at. That's why it is dangerous for me to go outside. I can't even leave the Shell Tower. She said, her eyes gaining a sad look. I have been a prisoner here for ten years. Luffy jumped at the food and started eating. But that stopped when he heard the imprisonment. Ten years. Why didn't anyone do anything about this Deccan guy? They couldn't find him. No one could spot him and he usually evades the eyes of the guards. She said, looking at Luffy curiously. I only have Megalo to talk to. He's my dearest friend. That's why I wanted to have a banquet. That's awful. I don't think I can be in a place for ten years without doing anything. His mind started whirling of all the possibilities he could do. Usually, Luffy wouldn't go around helping everyone. But, at the core of his dream was to be the person with the most freedom in the world. And since this was someone who wanted to feed him and his crew, he really wanted to help her. You humans are small. But you seem to eat quite a lot for your size, she said, unknowing of Luffy's train of thoughts. The hairy guy said he was going to throw us a banquet, but I smelled food here and I was quite hungry. So, I just came, he shrugged. You are the princess of this kingdom, right? Yes, I am the daughter of King Neptune, my name is Shirahoshi. She introduced herself. Oh, I am Luffy, he introduced, though it came out as a bunch of gibberish as he was eating food. I don't think you are a bad guy, Luffy-san. I heard that pirates go on a lot of adventures. Does that mean you see the sun? In various plants and animals that roam around the lands, Shirahoshi trailed off. Wait wait, you are asking too much questions. I am eating, Luffy said. Can't you see that? Wah, don't yell at me, Luffy-san. Shirahoshi started crying. Luffy's sweat dropped. You're huge. Yet you cry like a baby he said. I hate you. Shishishi. Shirahoshi's heart was pierced by an imaginary arrow. Ah, uh, those horrible words. No one has ever said something like that to me before. She said, crying. Luffy burped out loud and patted his stomach in content. That was good. He said. So, you have been here. Cooped up in this small little room for what? Ten years. Luffy-san. Go away. You are a bad person. She cried again. 
Are there any places that you would want to visit? He asked. Oh, of course. There are many places that I want to visit, she said, tears welling up on her eyes at the thought. Then, how about we get out of here and take a walk outside? I can assure you nothing can hurt you outside. Luffy grinned. Hey, capture those humans. There are only five of them. A soldier yelled as they closed in on the straw hats. Please surrender guys. You will only make things worse for you if you try to resist. Kami pleaded. But we didn't do anything. We don't want to surrender. They are just making up excuses to arrest us. Usopp said, taking his cabuto and readying it. These pirates are very famous for all the trouble they caused. They are plenty strong even without the captain. Not to mention the former warlord of the sea, Pirate Empress, Boa Hancock is now part of this crew. Stand your ground soldiers. These are just a glimpse of what to come. Save your homeland, Minister of the Left said. What? We are only fighting because you guys attacked us, Usopp said, drawing out his cabuto loaded with bullets. You guys are nothing compared to the giant bugs on the Bone Island. King Neptune, we require your assistance, Minister said. I don't think people should be imprisoned on the basis of a prophecy. Therefore, we will only arrest you for now. The king thrusted his giant spear at the straw hats, though none of them were phased by it. The metal clanging into something similar sounded through the air. The vibrations traveled through the air as Hancock's leg clashed against the giant spear. Hancock showed no signs of struggle as she floated in air. The king on the other hand, was struggling to get the upper hand in their fight as he tried to block the incoming force that could hurt him. One of the ministers also tried to force into the fight by thrusting his spear at Hancock but another sword blocked it. The ministers and the soldiers yelled in surprise as Zoro held the spear at its place with a grin on his face and pushed it back effortlessly. Zoro, I thought you were in jail, Usopp said in surprise. I heard you guys were having fun, so I decided to join, Zoro said, grinning. Noah, Fishman District, wait right there. Captain Vander Decken is here Watatsumi announced. Right this way a Fishman pirate waved. Sorry about the late. Got caught up in a volcanic eruption, Vander Decken said walking into the huge ship. So you are the infamous Hody Jones, right? I would like to believe we both are famous, but our madness prevails in our identity. Isn't that right? Vander Decken. Hody laughed, extending his hand for a handshake. Yes, I suppose so. Oh, a handshake. Just wait a second. Decken wore a black glove on his right hand. At the questioning look of Hody Jones, he just waved it off and clasped his hand tightly on a handshake. Bah ho ho. Nice to meet you, Hody Jones. He said. This will benefit both of us. Let us crush the Neptune's army. They are the bane to the pride of fishmen and mermans. We will take the head of the sea god Neptune and bring total ruin to the Neptune kingdom. Hody laughed boisterously along with Vander Decken, unaware of a young god present on the island. Ryugu Palace, the kingdom of Ryugu. This is just too much. Yuzap yelled. Yeah, reflect on what you have done. You must ask for forgiveness. Brooke yelled at Zoro. Yes, Marimo. Can't believe you would do this Sanji shouted. You guys were the ones who started fighting. Zoro yelled back. Stop it. It wouldn't do us good just yelling at each other Hancock's voice cut through the conversation. Zoro grumbled and huffed. Brooke and Yuzop just walked around frantically, thinking about the consequences. Hi, Hancock San. Your word is law. Please let this lowly servant follow your footsteps to heaven. Sanji danced around. Hancock looked at him with disgust, but didn't bother to reply him, moreover gone through his character. I thought I would just have some food and go shopping around Nami said Sai. The area surrounding them was laid with struggling fishmen soldiers lying on the ground with broken hands and legs, cuts all over their body. The ministers were tied up with ropes, along with the king who was wrapped around with iron chains. What sort of evil pirates does this make us? Yuzop said. Stop. We are not evil for doing this. They were the ones to attack us. We were just defending. Remember, at the end we are pirates. We must do whatever it is to stay alive. Don't let your morals get in the way of your life. We are not saints, nor did we struggle for these two years just so we could die because they suspect us doing something Zoro warned. Yuzop stayed silent, but didn't refute his point. What should we do now? Rook asked. Nami grabbed the face of a minister and squeezed it. Tell me where it is. Which direction is the treasury? Her eyes gained shine, bully signing shining through. Oi, stop that Yuzop yelled. King Neptune, are you alright? Can't believe the great sea warrior has come down to this. Minister of Left said. I have a bad back pain and I am getting old. This is a huge blunder I am sorry. The king apologized. When the three princes get back, they will never let you get away from this place alive. The minister shouted. Where is Sunny? We need to get everyone together and go. Zoro asked. The Sunny lost its bubble when we entered the Fishman Island. Frankie is taking care of it right now. Nami said. And the log pose is acting weirdly since we entered this island. It hasn't settled down yet. Suddenly, a bell sound rang through the palace. That must be the Prince Fukuboshi. Minister said. Outside. Huh, that's strange, why are there no guards? Fukuboshi questioned. 
Zoro attended the Den Den Mushi. Hello who is this? Hey you can't attend this. Yuzop and Nami protested. Help us, Prince Fukuboshi. Shut up. Multiple voices sounded through the Den Den Mushi, most of them being cries of help. Brother, there must have been an incident at the Palace La Tai Du. Riboshi said. Yeah, I think so too. Is Father and Shirahoshi alright? Benboshi asked. It's me, Fukuboshi. What is happening on the other side? Open the castle gates and imperial gates right away. He demanded. We can't do that Zoro replied, with a bored look on his face. Which one of the straw hats are you? Fukuboshi asked. Fukuboshi, he's the swordsman of the straw hat crew. His bounty is 120 million bullies. He is pirate hunter Zori. Minister said. It's Zoro. Zoro shouted. Anyway, you heard him. We have the king and other hostage. If you want them back alive, you have to do what we say. We will need you to contact our shipwright and assist him on a new coating for our ship, Sunny. Then you have to contact the rest of our crew. One dark-haired woman and a raccoon-looking reindeer. Zoro said. Raccoon-looking reindeer. Brooke laughed out loud. We understand your demands. We will arrange for you and your crew to leave this island as soon as possible. But in exchange, you must guarantee the safety of the hostages. Fukuboshi said. Brother. Riboshi and Manboshi exclaimed. We have no other choice. This gate is the only way to enter the palace. Every other section is protected by countless layers of bubbles. Fukuboshi said. One thing, Zoro. Hem, I am reluctant to do this now, but I must keep my promise to Jin. Fukuboshi said. The former warlord, the first son of C, Jin left two messages for Straw Hat Luffy. Jin, King and the ministers exclaimed. That's right, Luffy did mention they are friends. Brooke said. Luffy isn't here now, but I will pass on the messages to him. Go ahead Zoro said. First, do not fight Hody Jones and the second is I await you in the forest of the sea. Hem, forest of the sea. Jones, Zoro questioned. Those were the two messages left by him Fukuboshi said. I wonder what those mean. Hancock said. They have finally done it. The Straw Hat Pirates have captured the Ryugu Palace. A bystander yelled as he received the news about the capture. What? Why did they do that? Commotion ensured as people talked and yelled about the news. Some disagreed about the capture, but most of them voiced out their hate towards the Straw Hats as they captured the royalty of their place. The alley suddenly grew silent as they started to hear screams. They turned around to see the streets covered with blood and dead bodies. Some had their body broken in brutal ways, twisted and bent in several places. Some looked alive, but it was for naught as they wouldn't be rescued since a huge number of mermen's holding weapons advanced towards them. With a malicious look on their eyes, they advanced towards the now dispersing crowd, people who were running in all directions to escape from this slaughter. But they couldn't get far as the alley was completely surrounded by the mermen's. They rushed towards them, slashing, kicking and piercing through them. Bodies started to stack around the place as it was filled with blood. The entire district was annihilated in minutes, which sent a tarrying message across to the nearby district that these mermen were out for blood and they had to do whatever they ask in order to stay alive. Many noticed that the force wasn't entirely consisted of mermen, but also had human pirates among them. It did nothing but fuel the hatred simmering in their hearts for a long time. Ryugu Palace, Kakaku Tower Hey, as I said, let's go outside. Luffy grinned. But, I cannot go Luffy-sama. I can't do such. She trailed off, looking sad. Look here, you said you had somewhere to go right. If I were to be locked up in a single place, I think I will go crazy. It'll be a thank you for all the food you provided me. I'll make sure no one harms you, Luffy said. But it is a selfish thing to do. It could cause great trouble to all the people in this palace. Where do you want to go? Luffy asked, ignoring the cries of the princess. Um, to the forest of the sea she said. That could only be a dream. I could never do such selfish thing. Why do you cry just to say that? Look at me. If you want to go, I will take you there. You don't have to think about being selfish. You were locked in this place for all these years because of someone's selfish desire to marry you. What if you are selfish for this one time and wander outside with freedom? I will make sure no one will question or harm you, Luffy said. Unbeknownst to him, his body gained a soft golden glow, which was noticed by Shirahoshi. Her eyes widened at shock. Before she could reply, the castle shook with tremors traveling across the walls, dust falling on top of the princess sending her into another cry of shock. Luffy's observation hacky pinged several auras approaching them at high speeds. He moved slightly in front of Shirahoshi, standing in the path of her and the approaching objects. The objects crashed into the wall of the dome. Shouts of them being human pirates ringed Luffy's ears. The soldiers, who were protecting the tower, looked shocked at the scene. Blood and gore covered the wall as some of the unfortunate soldiers who didn't survive the throw was hopelessly crushed against the wall. Bones broken sticking into the wall and covering it with blood and gore. Those who survived the crash slid from the wall of the dome, standing up like zombies. 
The soldiers readied their weapons to defend the princess from these human pirates. Meanwhile, Brooke was carrying the Minister of the Right on his back upon the insisting of the king to check up on the mermaid princess, even though Sanji offered his help upon hearing it. But considering his, ahem, mental condition, the straw hats didn't seem him appropriate in sending him. When they closed in near the tower, both of them gasped at the gory display and the swarm of human pirates around the tower. Oh no, the castle has been penetrated. It's now filled with bloodthirsty pirates. This is bad. His Majesty and the Princess are in danger. Minister yelled. Suddenly the tower shook with a resounding boom, sending vibrations around the floor. The pirates halted, looking around for the source of the sound. Another boom echoed around the palace as the door to the mermaid princess's room was blasted across its hinges, rubbles shooting in all directions. A huge whale swam out, though it looked struggling, as it had something on its mouth. Upon closer look, everyone yelled in shock as the mermaid princess was on the mouth of the shark, which they recognized as Megalo. They also noticed another figure on top of the shark. Luffy Sam, Brooke yelled in surprise. Straw Hat, Megalo, what are you doing to the princess? The minister shouted, trying to free himself from the shackles. Let's go. Luffy's voice sounded as he sat on top of the shark, grinning widely. Luffy Sam, where are you going? Father, brothers, I am sorry for this. I will be going out of the tower. I will make sure to return by the dinner. Shurahoshi thought as she hid inside Megalo's mouth. This is an emergency. We must report to the king. Carry me back to king. Skeleton, hurry back. Minister yelled. Before Brooke could reply, they were attacked by the pirates there. Brooke whipped out his sword and defended against the blows. Where's the switch that opens the passage between Fishman Island and Rigu Palace? Tell me. A pirate choked out as he advanced towards them. What switch? Brooke wondered. Tell us, or we will be killed. The pirate yelled as he jumped towards Brooke, swinging his sword. Forest of the Sea. Chopper and Robin were looking around in the forest. Chopper accompanying Robin as she searched for clues regarding the ancient history. They suddenly stopped as a crash resounded near them. They rushed to the scene to see a familiar face lying there, covered in blood and bruises. Hatchai. Chopper yelled. What happened to you? Who did this? Ahits great to see you guys. I is straw hat with you. Hatchai asked, coughing blood out of his mouth. He is not here. We need to make sure you get some first aid Robin said as she moved towards where their ship was anchored. It's better if you don't get involved with Fishman Island now. The new Fishman pirates are about to invade and the kingdom will lay to waste. Hatchai cried. Few hours prior. Noah, Fishman District. Hody, don't do this. Hatchai yelled as he stumbled into the Noah, holding onto crutches. Are you guys serious? Those steroids will kill you. Hatchai was shocked as Hody did nothing but laugh boisterously at the claim. Kill us. Don't worry. We have enough of this and we have tested it to see if it would kill us or have any ill effects. And it is none. WH what? Hatchai stepped back at shock. He gathered all his remaining hope into changing Hody's mind. Why would you want to destroy Fishman Island? And do not underestimate the great knight Neptune, he said, hoping it would deter him from continuing this path. Give me a break, Hatchai. I am tired of listening to you. You were one of our lungs officers. Now, you are just a coward. Neptune is just standing the way of showing humans that we are superior to them. Hody snarled, but Arlung lost. Vander Deccan, Hayuzu, why are helping the upstarts now when you didn't respond to Arlong's call years ago? I ain't anyone's servant. Hody knows that. Arlong wanted me to serve him. Deccan replied, I respected Arlong's strength and accomplishments, but he lacked finesse. I saw his mistakes, and we will be sure to not repeat them. Hody smirked. I am his successor, and I will make sure to achieve the dream of his. Also, isn't the one who took Arlong's dreams on this island now? Straw Hat Luffy. I was one of Arlong's top officers, yet Luffy called me his friend. He saved my life too. Hatch I said. Deccan simply touched his head. Locked on now. You can't escape he sang. Calling a human friend. I have had enough of you. Hody sneered. Suddenly, a knife zoomed past everyone and stabbed Hatch I. Vander Deccan laughed. You are my target now. Now, anything I throw will come and stab you. It will find you no matter what. He said as he picked several arrows. What are you doing with the arrows? I have heard rumors about your powers. It will kill me if those are thrown at me. Hatchai. Stop him. Hatchai yelled. I cannot stop him. We are at an equal alliance here. Besides, I am sick of you. Coward Hody replied. Hatchai tried to escape by running into water and swam as fast as he could. But the arrows didn't stop and pierced him all over his body, which fell on the forest. Baho. That's how I have been able to designate each of my targets. Each for one hand. I haven't washed my hands since I touched Princess Shurahoshi ten years ago. Do you understand now? This is my power. Deccan laughed and the pirates cheered. All right, human pirates, you have seen his powers. Now it's time for the first phase of our plan. Hody announced. Ryugu Castle is said to be impregnable. But Deccan has been hurling weapons at it for years. He will throw you guys towards the princess. You will probably crash into the tower. 
Your job is to open the castle from inside. But, that's impossible. We will be smashed from the impact against wall. They cried. Of course, Hody drawled. That's why I am using you humans. Your lives are less worthy than slaves. If you survive against the crash, fulfill the mission. And I will set you free. If you refuse, I will throw you into the water, you inferior species. Ryugu Palace. K. King Neptune. Shirahoshi has been kidnapped. The minister yelled as Brooke carried him into the chamber. And pirates are raining down on the tower. We are under attack. Kidnapped. By who? Neptune asked as the color drained from his face. It was Straw Hat Luffy. The minister yelled. Even some of the Straw Hats gasped at the news. They. Luffy kidnapping. That's impossible. He must have had some other reason. Usopp said. Yeah, knowing Luffy, that is most probable. Nami agreed. We are under attack. Let's cut him Zoro said as he readied his swords. Not really bothered about the kidnapping of the princess. He was sure Luffy wouldn't harm the princess nor any harm would be done to her. Do you want to come out of the shark's mouth? Luffy asked as he looked down. No, I will stay here for now Shirahoshi replied. How does it feel to come out of the tower after 10 years? Luffy asked. It's exciting, but I feel like I am doing something bad. She replied. How is it bad? You are just going on an adventure after all. Luffy laughed. So, what is on the forest of the sea? Is there anything interesting there? He asked. There's a grave. A grave I wanted to visit for the last 10 years, but never had the chance to. Shirahoshi smiled softly. Deep sea, the forest of the sea. 10 years huh? An assassination on the broad daylight. Has it been that long? A figure wondered. The prince has grown to be hardened warriors and although Shirahoshi has been confined in the tower, none of us has forgotten your ideals. The figure was a large blue whale shark fishman with a sun tattoo blazed on his chest. The Queen Ottoheim Jim said, sitting near her grave. Ryugu Palace. Ryugu Palace. Come in. Voice buzzed in all the speakers around the island. This is the border patrol. Fishman Island has been entered by some dangerous individuals from the Fishman District. We are making this announcement in public service. They don't look like they are here for a shopping trip. We sincerely hope nothing happens. People whispered and pointed as several figures moved across the sky towards the connection to the Rigu Palace. Hear me. Today all of Fishman Island shall be untied as one. Mermen, mermaids and fishmen must all come together. Humans are inferior that they can't even breath underwater. It's our destiny to rule over them. Today we are going to set things right Hody said. From this day on, the Rugu kingdom is finished. We will be the rulers of the deep sea. His crew cheered as he grinned wide. Far away from them, Luffy noticed the presence of the crew as he traveled towards the forest. He was a bit worried about the aura of a certain individual on that crew, but he knew his crew would be safe. Forest of the sea, northeast of Fishman Island. This is called the graveyard of ships. The currents bring all the sunken ship here. Dot 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 the whales and fish gather here. They know where the sea is fertile a voice spoke. I live in this mysterious forest to study it. It's fantastic wonderland in the lifeless depth of the sea. How did you get the jewel tree Adam would anyway? This ship is worthy of its materials. He wondered. I knew you would say that. Tom used exactly the same wood to make the Pirate King's ship. This design is my masterpiece. Frankie said. I'll handle the coating. Don't worry. You can trust me on that. He said. Thanks. Oh, uh, what was your name by the way? Frankie inquired. Den. Den. You don't look anything like Tom, even though you both are supposed to be brothers. Frankie asked. Haha, that's a very human way of thinking. Sure, it is true that relations tend to resemble each other on land, but we fishmen have their own genes. Den replied, on Fishman Island, no one is surprised no matter how the child looks like. I don't understand humans' obsessions over looks and resemblance. By the way, do you have any robot genes in your lineage? Den asked curiously. I am human. Frankie replied exasperatedly. I have heard about you in Iceberg in the letters. I also heard what happened to Tom. He lived a life he wanted. I am sure he will be proud of what you become. Den commented. Frankie smiled. You flatter me. He replied with his hair standing up into funk style. By the way, who is sitting over there? He asked, pointing to the figure near the grave. That's Big Boss Jin. Big Boss. He's waiting for someone. He is a wanted fugitive. So, he cannot enter the island. Den said. Main gates, royal palace. You. How did you get in here? Minister of Right yelled. That face. You are that accursed Vander Deccan, aren't you? You've decided to finally show yourself. Look, that's Hody Jones from the Fishman District. What are you doing here? He asked. No way, I came here to start a war. But the Neptune and his soldiers are all tied up. I can't believe it. Is this a present for us? Maybe it is a trap since it's all going too smoothly. Hody laughed. One thing after another. The palace is really active today. Zoro sighed. Maybe it's you guys collaborating with them. The minister pointed at straw hats. Mind your voice. Hancock glared. It's only because you invited us that we are here. Who are those guys anyway? Vander Deccan. Are you perhaps the culprit for kidnapping my daughter along with Straw Hat? Give her back. Neptune yelled. What are you talking about? Did she go somewhere? 
Don't play dumb with me. I know it's your planning. My Shurahoshi disappeared. Deccan yelled in rage. She is not yours. King yelled back. Calm down, Vander Deccan. The humans you threw at Princess are here. Which means she was in the palace just a short time ago. Hody said. You are right. You are a sharp one. Hody Deccan walked towards a large coral and broke it. He placed his right hand on it and threw it. It is not going towards the tower. I have loved her all this time. Deccan said as he jumped on the coral, traveling on it towards Shurahoshi. If I can't of you, no one can. I'll kill you. He yelled in rage, his eyes gaining a red look. Please untie me. Vander Deccan is going after my daughter. I will give you anything you ask. Just let me save my daughter's life. Neptune pleaded. You can have any treasure. You have my soldiers. Anything. To ch. Look at that pathetic display. Neptune. Hody laughed. To think the straw hats helped us to capture the castle. It was then Nami noticed the Arlong pirate's mark on the arm of Hody Jones. Her entire body immediately stiffened up and her face became pale at the recognition. Hancock, who also noticed the mark, became expressionless and her fists tightened, but this went unnoticed. To ch. Jinbei told us something was going at the Fishman district. To think that you would be the mastermind. Ministers yelled. I take no pride in serving Neptune. I only joined to learn how to fight. Thanks to you, I am strong now. Arlong said. We fishmen have been oppressed by humans unjustly for long. I looked up to Arlong because he turned the tables. Now the legacy will continue with us. I trained to become Arlong's right-hand man when he started his conquest in the East Blue, but a group of childish pirates thwarted him. As Hody talked, Nami's become paler and paler, and she started sweating. Her face was set on a tight frown as the memories of her oppression was brought forth as he talked. Those fishmen want to continue where Arlong left off. Are you crazy? Yuzop yelled. Arlong walked forward and grabbed onto the wall closest to him. His muscles tightened as he grabbed the wall, cracks forming around and continued along. Shark grip. Everyone was shocked seeing the strength of his grip. The new fishman pirates just smirked at the power of their captain. Some straw hats gasped at the strength, but paled realizing what was about to happen next. Zoro's eyes narrowed and he placed a hand on the hilt of his sword, intending to slash it, but someone beat him to it. Femur Magna, diagonal slash Hancock swung her leg at high speed, creating a sharp gale of wind which slashed through the ground, heading towards Hody. He just smirked, thinking it wouldn't hurt him, but the sharp pain that spread across his hand said otherwise. A gash formed on his forearm, blood flowing from it freely. A wave of rage and disbelief flowed through Hody. He didn't think these fragile weakling race could be capable of drawing blood from him. It seemed that he slightly miscalculated. He could already see that the wound was closing up and the blood seemed to stop. Only the gash remained. He smirked at the prowess of the drug. Straw hats grinned at the damage done to their enemy. But it soon turned into frown as the wounds healed quickly, too quickly for them to take any real advantage of the situation. The wall crumbled, giving way for seawater to rush in and filled the place. Hancock hopped up, using Skywalk, but she knew she wouldn't be able to stay like that forever. Also, her crewmates, especially those who have devil fruit powers won't be able to stay afloat and would quickly lose strength. Hancock, Zoro's voice broke her out of her thoughts. She looked down at the swordsmen who looked ready to fight. Take the crewmates who cannot swim to safety. It will be best for us to separate here and we will meet later. Hancock hesitated, as she hadn't seen the swordsmen in action, but also the fact the entire arena was being filled with water. Let's go, Hancock Chan, Sanji said, but he wasn't dancing around like a fool. That moss head could hold him off until we get everyone to safety. Don't be concerned about him. Though they often fought with each other often, Hancock could see the absolute trust and confidence on his crewmate which shone in his eyes. That assured her and she swiftly nodded and turned towards the crew who would need help the most. It was a good thing that three of the Devil Fruit users weren't on the palace at the time. It only left Brooke. Sanji dashed at him at full speed and caught him before he drowned. Yuzop was dragged by Kami. That left Nami. Hancock dived at her and caught her. She then held the navigator and dashed off towards the top of the palace. Hody dropped a hand into the flowing water and jerked it forward with enough force that small droplets rocketed towards the remaining soldiers, piercing them. Shark arrows. You dare harm my soldiers. Neptune bellowed out and he crawled forward into the way of the water droplets, letting it hit him instead of the soldiers. Soldiers protested in vain about the king getting hurt, but Neptune stayed, all the soldiers being protected by his body. You are a fool, Neptune. Hody shouted, dropping his hand into the water again. But Zoro unsheathed his sword and swung at him. Single sword style, bird dance. A large wind blade advanced towards Hody, who just smirked. He brought a crewmate of his own forward, who was standing beside him. The wind blade hit him, cutting him vertically from his abdomen towards his skull. To ch. He used his own man as shield, Zoro thought, though he supposed it was common in the world of pirates. Zoro slashed his sword again cutting the ropes and chains holding the king and the ministers. We didn't hold up our end of the deal. We promised the hostages wouldn't be harmed, Zoro said. 
Escape from this place. We will hold off for now. No, this is my country. I will fight till the end of my life to defend the country. Neptune refused. Minister, ensure the safety of the soldiers and find a way to inform the princes about Shurahoshi. He ordered. Ministers nodded. The water rushed towards them, submerging the place in water. King Neptune raised his spear, looking ready to fight. Group 2. Hancock Chin. Kami called out. Hancock turned towards the mermaid, who was swimming towards them with bubbles around them. Use these corals to make bubbles which would let you breathe and move underwater without being concerned about drowning and effects due to eating devil fruit, she said, handing out a bunch of coral things. Oh, thank you, Hancock replied, using the bubble coral to cover herself and Nami. What's our plan? Nami asked. We should go and help the swordsmen. Hancock replied, looking at Nami stating as if it was obvious. No, he would hold them for now, he won't get injured or die that easily. Nami replied. This is also the matter of Fishman Island. If you involve directly, it might affect the human merman relationship Kami said. We should move towards the forest of the sea. That's where Luffy went apparently. It will be his decision to make Nami said. Hancock nodded at that. They can't fight someone without the orders of the captain, especially if the situation is as serious as this. The coast of Coral Hill, near Forest of the Sea. Hey, uh, Luffy. Chopper's voice rang out, reaching the captain who was riding on the shark. Oh, Chopper. Luffy exclaimed as they descended towards the land. Are those your friends, Luffy? Shirahoshi asked. Yes, they are my pirate crew. The citizens around them were on the edge as the captain, who was the suspect of abducting several mermaids as well as the one who was holding the palace hostage was nearing towards them. Luffy immediately noticed the aura which was near Chopper. I am going down there for a second, Luffy said as he jumped from the flying shark, landing on the hill. The citizens immediately scattered back as Luffy approached Chopper. Hatchai, it's you. How are you hurt? Who did this to you? Luffy questioned. Megalo also landed on the ground. He couldn't hold his mouth tight for too long. He spluttered his mouth open, revealing the mermaid princess. Yehchehchech, Princess Shurahoshi. Everyone in the vicinity yelled. She was kidnapped. Sadly, before Princess could confirm that she wasn't kidnapped but came out on her own, they tied up Chopper and Luffy. Luffy simply let them, knowing that he could easily get out from the ropes without any effort. He wanted to see if the situation proceeds exactly as in the memories and he wondered what changes it would bring. We got M. We got the captain of the Straw Hats. The people around rejoiced at the capture and grinned. They would finally have a way to save the royal family without harm. Little did they know that the situation up there was much worse than they could imagine. W. Wait. You got it all wrong. Luffy was just sure how she tried, but her protests were in vain as they wouldn't hear any of it and simply thought that the princess was threatened to say so. Luffy's observation pinged at upcoming danger. He could already sense who it was in his future sight also confirmed the same. He still made no moves, stayed calm and sat on the ground. He kept his gaze pointed at the approaching person. Those who noticed his gaze turned around to see something approaching them. Boy, something is coming towards us. Someone yelled. Is that? Vander Deccan. They gasped. Shurahoshi's face paled at hearing the name. Years of memories being locked in a single tower rushed into her. Her breathing became ragged and she started sweating heavily. The fish folk surrounded her, yelling to move away from there and hide. Don't run. If you run away, I won't be able to protect you, crybaby. Luffy shouted. Everyone around him protested, telling the princess to run away. Shurahoshi stayed, putting her trust on him. Okay, Luffy. I, I will stay here her entire body protested otherwise. How dare you threaten the princess? A merfolk came forward with a stick on his hand. A sudden wave of pressure settled on the place as merfolk started fainting one by one. Luffy's conqueror's hacky burst forth from him and knocked out many. The bindings on Luffy burned off, leaving him free. He shook his hands and looked up, locking onto his target. He disappeared and cocked back his fists, delivering a square punch onto Deccan's jaw. He fell on the ground below, bleeding from the punch. This is between Shurahoshi and me. Why are you butting in? He yelled, then realized. So, you were the one who brought Shurahoshi here, and you are the one throwing weapons at her. Luffy vanished again before appearing in front of Deccan. Gamu Gamu no whip. He hit him on the chest, sending him flying into the mountain. Luffy turned back and went to Shurahoshi and Chopper who were waiting for him. Hey shark, get up. We are going. Luffy mounted the shark and Princess got inside its mouth as it started flying. People below yelled and cursed Luffy and tried to get the princess away from Luffy, but it didn't work. Chopper and Hatchai were also on Megalo as it went further inside the forest of the sea. Mugu Palace. Soldiers, listen to me. King Neptune bellowed as he slowly stood up, blood dripping from all over his body. Even though he was someone not to be underestimated in a fight, protecting all the soldiers from the water bullets had taken quite a toll on him. He faced thousands of little bullets hit him all over his body, leaving him dripping blood. Yes, your majesty. We will destroy Hody and his band of pirates right away. The remaining soldiers yelled. No, as I am unable to fight right now, you would only die in vain. 
We must surrender now and reunite with Fukuboshi and others. Neptune said, Surrender, this palace seriously. Surrender to me and I will think of leaving those little runts you have as soldiers. Cody laughed. You and me both know you won't be able to fight me and protect them at the same time. Zoro wasn't concerned about the lives of either the soldiers or the pirates. His crew was safe for now and he has nothing to worry. But he didn't interfere the fight as the king had his own duty to protect his subjects. It irked him that they couldn't keep the promise of keeping the royal family safe. He wanted nothing more to cut the overgrown fish into pieces. TCH, the water is almost to my neck level. This could prove bothersome in a while. Should I finish it now? Boy, you are talking too much. Should I finish him here now? Zoro snapped towards the king. King wanted to refuse it, as it would hurt his pride, but the life of his soldiers valued more. But before he could give him the answer, Zoro drew a sword and dashed towards Hody. Hody was busy taunting Zoro and the royal family that he didn't Zoro to suddenly attack him. He barely had any time before the sword struck his chest, leaving a deep gash on him. By now, Zoro was completely underwater, leaving the merman shocked. One-eyed swordsman, Neptune called the palace will be completely submerged soon. I will get my soldiers out of danger from here. I will create an escape path. Hold on to me tight. Neptune seemed to grab water, with water bubbling all around his hand. Merman combat, ultramarine. A giant water stream shot at the pirates, killing several of them. Several were defeated, unable to defend themselves from the attack. Captain Hody, do something. The attack took every bit of energy that Neptune had, leaving him immobile on the platform. Zoro was losing his breath very fast and the pressure underwater didn't help him either. Neptune pushed another stream from his hand as it was the only thing he could do in his current situation. The water shot out like a rocket, dragging along Zoro from the palace and out into the Fishman Island. Several soldiers were dragged out from the palace in the stream. The water stream entered into the tube connecting the two bubbles and popped them into the Fishman Island. Neptune could only hope that they had a safe landing. Ha ha ha, that was a very lame thing to do, Neptune. Hody opened his eyes, revealing the red orbs. His veins bulged, indicating that he had eaten another pill. I am not going to let them die under your hands. Fishman Island will never yield to you. We will see about that. Hody smirked. Meanwhile, Zoro shot out of the bubble, heading towards the ground at a very high speed. The rest of the soldiers were floating, indicating the use of bubbly coral. Zoro maneuvered his body midair to face the ground. He then swung his sword towards the ground, sending air blades. 108-pound cannon. As the air blade left the swords, the backlash was enough to slow down Zoro's momentum for him to land safely on land. He looked up to see that he had traveled quite far away from the palace. Whatever the king had planned, he managed to get many of his soldiers to safety. It didn't quite sit right with Zoro, but he had no other way to travel back to the palace. So, the only thing he could do currently was to return back to his crew and decide from there on. He looked around, trying to determine the place he was in. He focused on his observation hacky, which pinged him that there were people currently in the left side of where he was. Hence, he turned and started walking and walked in the opposite direction. Forest of the Sea Wow this place is nice, Chopper commented as they neared the forest of the sea. Shirahoshi was in tears as this was somewhere she wanted to go for a long time. I can see Sunny there. And Frankie too, Luffy said. Oh, is that you Luffy? Frankie shouted. And who is that beauty with you? Oh, this is a wimpy, Luffy introduced. Wimpy, huh? Frankie was confused. Shirahoshi was on the verge of tears, but controlled and introduced herself. Robin was here a few moments before. She wanted to look into something. Frankie commented. Luffy hummed. Oh, Luffy, is that you? I couldn't recognize you at all a voice sounded from behind. He had already sensed the aura. Luffy turned around with a big smile on his face. Jinbei, it is really you. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to see you. Luffy said. What? Didn't you get my message? Jinbei asked. Oh, Princess Shirahoshi, it's good to see why. Eh, hey, Princess Shirahoshi. Jinbei was shocked. Frankie, I am going to put Hatchai down, catch him. Chopper said and Frankie nodded. Chopper pushed Hatchai down from the shark and Frankie caught him gently. Hatchai. Jinbei was shocked again. Oi, everyone. Yuzop voice sounded as everyone turned towards the sky. They saw most of the crew float down or drop down. Oh, everyone's here. Luffy said. Jinbei, look here. This is my crew. Oh, it's nice to meet every oh wait. Hancock. Jinbei was shocked. Again. So, this is the place you wanted to visit, eh? Luffy asked Shirahoshi, looking at the structure behind him. Her mother, late Queen Ottoheim rests on that tomb Jinbei replied. Shirahoshi fell victim to Vander Decken at the worst time possible. Due to that, she wasn't able to attend the funeral of her mother. I am sure she has a lot to say. What happened to the feast that the big merman guy was about to give? Luffy's memories were still hazy about that part, but he knew it wasn't good and the faces of his crew only confirmed it. About that, Nami explained the situation. Is that true? Hody did that. 
Jinbei asked. His face was grave, like he was expecting this. I didn't realize Ryugu Palace was in danger. Shirahoshi was shocked and started crying. I'm sorry, you've been through a lot. There's a little time, but there's something I want to tell you Jinbei said. I am grateful that you have stopped to Arlong's rampage in East Blue. But you must allow me to apologize. Eleven years ago, I was the one who released Arlong into East Blue. Ugh. Jinbei. Hatch I tried. Jinbei, if you want to give us an explanation, we will listen to it. But be careful. Based on what you say, you may not live to see the next day. Sanji warned. Some looked shocked at the warning. Sanji-kun. Nami sighed. Jinbei looked down in shame. Nami's memories flashed. Years and years of torture and misery. She closed her eyes tightly to prevent tears from falling. It seems that you have endured a great deal of pain, Jinbei said. Sanji's eye twitched in anger. Yes, I don't pity Arlong no matter what happened to him. But, when we reached Sabai, we also saw that the Might Fishmen were being persecuted by the humans. Nami said, he admired the Sabai Park, but he went too far. Until 200 years ago, we were classified as fish rather than fishmen. When we joined the world government and made peace with them, we got our titles. But humans continued to hate us. Worst of all, the Great Pirate Era began. Humans wretched havoc on the island and we were powerless to stop them until he saved our islands. Jinbei said, This island belongs to me. Whitebeard's voice rang, but that didn't solve the hate. You all saw the truth. It's almost ironic. Those with greatest power fear the change the most. Even in the world government, their racism runs deep. He continued, There was one person who wanted to change the history and make way to a better future. That person was Queen Ottoheim. Buffy was sitting on a log near them, listening to Jinbei. Hancock was standing beside him. And the other one was the hero who saved all the slaves of the Mary Geois. There was a sharp intake of breath. Everyone turned towards Hancock who looked pale and sweaty. Her breath started to become ragged. Luffy placed his hand on her shoulder and her breathing calmed down. Usopp wanted to ask something, but Luffy shook his head, stopping him from asking anything. He motioned Jinbei to continue. He rescued the fishmen slaves and formed the Sun Pirates. Hachai and I were among his ranks. Jinbei parted his kimono to reveal a tattoo resembling a sun. Both Fisher Tiger and Queen Ottoheim took different approaches. I am not sure who is correct. The Fishman District began as a giant orphanage, but it soon fell into chaos and the managers of the orphanage lost control. It became a lawless area. At the time, Fisher Tiger was the boss of the Fishman District, but he sailed off in search of adventure. I myself was one of the king's elite soldiers. Arlong was the fiercest of the orphans and became pirate to terrorize others. Everyone was listening with rapt attention, but one event changed everything. That was when Fisher Tiger raided Mary Geois. He was hailed hero who freed slaves and reviled as the greatest criminal in the world. The citizens of the Fishman District rose to protect him from world government. The warships which kept attacking were sunk, for the liberated slaves might blend in more easily. Everyone received the sun brand that covered the brand of slaves. Hancock's shoulder tightened. Luffy's grip reassured her. And thus, the sun pirates of the Fishman Island were formed. Candy Factory Town, northwest of Fishman Island. I can't do it. I can't step on her face. Cries sounded as citizens were tortured to step on the picture of Queen Ottoheim. If you can't step on that face, then you want to be friends with humans, huh? Daruma yelled as he hit him in the head, knocking him out. Simple right. Just step on the picture or leave the island. Do it now. Hayuzu said. The same was happening all over the island. Those who tried to oppose them were either beheaded or beaten to death. People had no choice but to step on the pictures. Soldiers were killed outright. The princes who heard the commotion tried to stop them, but with the help of drugs, they were defeated by the new fishmen pirates. The forest of the sea. It'll be alright, princess. Don't worry. We will definitely save King Neptune. He won't be defeated that easily, Jinbei assured. Why yes she sniffed and answered. What happened to Fisher Tiger then, Jinbei? Yuzop questioned. It was chaos. We were being attacked by marines. We also attacked several slavers' ships and rescued several slaves. Fisher Tiger was soft in nature. He never wanted to kill anyone, but the members didn't receive it well, but didn't refute him and had great respect of him. We will fight and rob those who attack us, but we must never cross that final line. We will never kill, Fisher Tiger said resolutely, but I wanted to make an example of them. Let the fear sink in their hearts, Arlong voiced. Jinbei, Queen Ottoheim's quest is an idealistic dream. Doesn't she see any difference between me and Arlong? Fisher Tiger asked, standing at the helm of ship drinking sake. Please sign the petition. Sign it so that we can live under the sun. Queen Ottoheim cried to the public. No, your majesty, we don't want to live with the humans. Hey you, this child escaped from Mary Geois when you freed the slaves three years ago. But her home is very far away and we are not enough to take her there. Hello, and Koala, 11 years old. Thank you very much for what you did three years ago. It's a human brat on our ship. 
This is too much. Arlong yelled as he backhanded Koala across the deck. It can't be helped. She's only a child. Koala picked herself up and started scrubbing the ground. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't cry no matter what. So, please don't kill me. Hey, stop that. Are you afraid of us? Jinbei questioned. Yes, but I want to see my mother. So, I gathered my courage to come on this ship. If I stop working, you might kill me, right? Koala said. So, I will make myself useful by working. So, don't kill me please. Carry her to my cabin. Fisher Tiger ordered. Captain, what are you doing? The crew yelled as they saw the girl lying unconscious on the ground. The skin of her back charred as sizzling hot iron was pressed onto her back, where the slave mark was present. Oh, I passed out. I'm sorry, but I didn't cry. So please don't kill me. I will do whatever you want. Cry if you want to cry. We are not like those idiotic celestial dragons. Tiger yelled. We will never kill anybody. Let's go. We're taking her back to home Fisher Tiger ordered. Koala cried. Koala, get off the ship. This is your home. Where's your village? I will walk you there. I'll tell everyone in the village. Lots of fishmen are good people. Koala said. Bye. Koala. Was that the sound of gunshot? It came in the direction where Captain went. Look at the sea. It was a trap. Abandon ship and dive deep down. Why won't he go down? Be careful. He attacked Mary Geoise by himself. The sun pirates were ambushed and their captain was gravely wounded. Captain, what are you talking about? You lost too much blood. You will die without a transfusion. But the blood on this navy ship is human blood. That's right. Humans and fishmen have compatible blood. We can use it. No, I'd rather die than have their blood. Fisher Tiger's voice resounded. I will never yield to the humans. Their blood is unclean. I didn't want to tell you. But on my last journey, I saw the human nature. I was captured and I spent several years on Mary Geois. I was a slave. I witnessed the barbarity of humans. I barely escaped with my life. But I couldn't abandon the other slaves. He said, I have lived the life I wanted and everything I did went against what Queen Ottoheim wanted to accomplish. She is right, everyone wants peace. But we can never change this island. It's the job of youngsters like Koala who know nothing of the past. There are plenty of compassionate humans in this world. But my reason is overpowered by the demon in my heart. I cannot love humans ever. And thus, the leader of Sun Pirates, the great Fisher Tiger, died. With the death of Fisher Tiger, the hero who freed the slave, Arlong's hatred burned bright. The Sun Pirates, under the leadership of Jinbei, continued their unending war. Ryugu Palace. There was no other way for Tiger. I finally understand the pain in his heart that day. I will be alright. I will not fail. Ottoheim struggled day after day to realize her dream. She organized rescue operations for wrecked ship, but it was for naught. As Jinbei joined as one of the seven warlords, Arlong was released. It served nothing but divide between the two. Ryugu Palace. This is Border Patrol. We have a giant wrecked ship, requesting emergency entry. A celestial dragon on the ship. Bring them in. Queen ordered. I am going there right now. This place reeks of fish man. Bring me my mask and save me you fools. Sint. Maya's guard yelled. Bring me doctor. Get me a doctor quickly. We should kill him. That kind is the world's worst trash. Cody said. Guns were pointed at the world noble. The power you wield on the surface is only guaranteed by the admirals. You're on the sea floor. As long as the islanders keep quiet, you are just another shipwrecked corpse. Gunshot rang, but it never reached the world noble. It was stopped by Queen Ottoheim who intercepted the bullet with her own body. Put down your guns right now. She ordered. The children are watching. What's a celestial dragon, brother? Shurahoshi asked. They're humans, Shurahoshi. One of the scarier types. Fukuboshi answered. Why are you protecting him, your majesty? I feel the suffering in your hearts. I know how much you hurt. But don't let yourselves hate the humans and don't teach your children to hate them. Hey, mother look out. Shurahoshi yelled as the world noble cocked the pistol and aimed at Ottoheim's head. Shurahoshi cried loudly for help and waves spread across the sea. The ground rumbled and sea kings rose from the depths, crushing the ships into pieces. Shurahoshi, you are. Long ago a mermaid princess had the uncanny ability to control Neptunians. That legend was what lured the first Vander Decken to the sea floor. I have finally found her. Vander Decken yelled. A few weeks later, the celestial dragon recovered from his wounds. I will accompany him to the surface. Queen Ottoheim proclaimed. The people protested. I won't allow you do anything reckless like that. I will go and talk with them. Neptune protested. No, it means nothing if you go. If someone weak as me go there and return, it will prove for us that the surface is safe. Believe in the woman you love and in the humans, too. As days and nights passed, the entire kingdom worried about the queen. A single week felt like a hundred days. After some days of negotiations, Queen Ottoheim was able to appease the celestial dragon. Moreover, a piece of paper she held would become a ray of hope for all of Fishman Island. I, too, approve of friendship between the fishman and humans. As stated in the petition she said, 
if we were to present lots of signatures at the reverie. This one piece of paper could make our dreams become a reality. People signed, boxes filled, hope bloomed, people from all over the kingdom gathered at the plaza with their signatures in hand, day after day. Shurahoshi summoned them. Yes, none of us can speak to Neptunians. According to a legend, a mermaid who can communicate with the Neptunians is born every few centuries. Along with that special mermaid will come one who can guide her to use her power for good. And when the time comes, the world will change. But if used maliciously, it could sink the entire world. It's a formidable power that can be utterly destructive. If anything, truly traumatic should happen to her. She might unwittingly cause the Neptunians to run havoc. That's why you princes must grow up to be brave warriors as her brothers and protect her with your lives. The box went up in flames, with all the signed papers burning into ashes. A sudden gunshot was heard, but it wasn't caught on in the commotion. Blood dripped from her as she stood, bullet pierced into her heart, consciousness slowly fading, body weakening. Queen Ottoheim has been shot. Who did it? Where did it come from? Everyone was shocked. Vander Decken took this opportunity to touch Shurahoshi with his right hand. The Neptune brothers and Shurahoshi rushed to their mother. Side by side, my little angels. Calm down, I let my guard down. I was so happy about the signatures. Whoever the culprit is, don't be angry on my behalf. Don't let hatred consume you. Shurahoshi, stay strong. Shurahoshi started to cry. Her emotions running haywire. But the sudden dance of the princes distracted her. Mother, look at us. We're gonna stay right here and protect our little sister let I do. We'll gather the signatures again and the three of us will become great warriors like we promised. So please don't worry, Fukuboshi said, eyes riddled with tears. Soon, we'll look upon the real sun. Queen Ottoheim died that day. We found who the assassin was. It was a human pirate. I wanted to hide him. But Hody went ahead and announced the killer to the entire island. Jinbei said, the king locked himself up in a tower for a long time. There was something else that happened. Princess Shurahoshi started getting love letters from Vander Decken. Pizazitit. Attention citizens. Oh, it's Prince Fukuboshi. Mother said that soon we would see the real son. The next reverie is in two years. Maybe that's too soon for your hearts and minds to become as one. We will realize our mother's dream even if it takes the rest of our lives. One day, when your wounded hearts have healed, let us dream of the sun once more. People's tears flowed. Princess Fukuboshi, Ryuboshi and Mamboshi led the way. That's the story of the island's prejudice over the last 16 years and the origin of the Fishman Pirates. The responsibility for Arlong's reign of terror in your homeland rests entirely with me. It was my intention to stop him if he ever run havoc. But Arlong bribed the local navy officers and made sure the information didn't reach navy headquarters. Everyone was paying attention clearly. Luffy felt that this whole story was connected to him somehow. But he couldn't exactly place it. He had nothing about this in his earlier memories as well. All right, now kill yourself. It won't undo the crime, but at least Nami will feel a little better. Sanji yelled, pointing at Jinbei. The Straw Hats had divided opinions, but neither wanted Jinbei to die. Hence, they argued over it. Sanji. Luffy's voice rumbled. The place became deathly silent. Everyone was listening with rapt attention. No one showed any outward reaction, but Luffy's voice chilled them to the bone. It sent shivers over their body. Sanji's face became a little pale. This isn't something that you decide. I understand that you care about the crew and Nami, but this is something that she should decide. I won't interfere in her decision and neither will you. He said, Sanji wanted to protest, but Nami stopped him. It's fine, Sanji. He didn't mean any harm. Nami said, I will accept any punishment. Jinbei bowed. Stop it. It's Arlong that I hate, and I'm glad you weren't an accomplice to his atrocities. You're Luffy's friend, right? She continued. It's true that I suffered because of Arlong, but I met some great people because of that. It's all connected. I can't just hate you because you're a fish man. So please don't apologize to me about my life. It's not all bad, Nami said, looking at Luffy and her crew. Your words, touch me deeply. Thank you, Jinbei replied, tears flowing from his eyes. Forest of the sea. Sorry, I couldn't control my tears when I think about my mother Shurahoshi said, wiping her tears. I know we just met. I feel peace around you, Nami-san. I guess we have some things in common, Nami replied, smiling. So, Hody attacked the royal palace and took King and some of his soldiers as hostage. One of your friends is there, Jinbei said. Oh, don't worry about Zoro, he will be fine. Luffy replied. Jinbei nodded. Jinbei. If Hody's scheme is working, then the whole island must be descending into chaos right now. Hatchai stuttered out. Oh yes, you were at the Fishman district, so you know about his plan, right? Jinbei inquired. After he left the army, I knew he was planning something, but he never acted out in front of me. Yes, I know. This is the year of reverie. He hates humans more than Arlong does. He is the embodiment of pure accumulated hatred against humans. But, unlike Arlong, Hody will kill any Fishman standing in his way in cold blood. 
There could be people dying right now in the island. Hatchai replied. We have already got a lot of signatures. This is the year that Neptune wants to announce to the world that people of Fishman Island wants to immigrate. And Hody wants to prevent that. Jinbei asked, alarmed. Yes, but not only that. Hatchai trailed off as a large transponder snail appeared and started displaying a video in front of the straw hats. Attention citizens of the Fishman Island. I am the captain of new Fishman Pirates. Hody Jones. He announced. I have an announcement to make. Hody. Jinbei gritted his teeth in anger. This kingdom will fall and it will be reborn. Behold, your new king, Coral Hill. Is he going to usurp the throne? Where is he broadcasting this from? Hey isn't that the guy who shot the queen's assassin? Citizens went into frenzy as they discussed the broadcast. Several looked pale and were sweating heavily. Those who wants to be friends with humans will have to go. You all witnessed how your beloved queen fell. Even if you trust humans and welcome them with smiles, all that awaits you is betrayal. Soon this island will be filled with the people of Fish Men District. Hody continued. No way. Those lawless fugitives are gonna come here. The Neptune family has lured into a path that leads to death. Look, the snail zoomed out to show the figure behind Hody. The citizens gasped as it showed King Neptune bound in chains and looked ragged, blood flowing from several places of his body. Forest of the sea. Father, Shirahoshi cried. Behold your great knight. He is nothing but an old man now. Hody grinned. It's time to say goodbye to this old man. Three hours from now on in the Kinchcord Plaza, I will behead this fool of a king. I also found something very interesting at the Rugu Palace. Ten years ago, Queen Ottoheim risked her life to collect signatures from the Celestial Dragon. And once this is destroyed, it can never be replaced. Also, this box contains the signatures of more than half of the citizens. So many who wants to be friendly with humans. There are the names that would defy my new order. In other words, these are the names of the traitors. Hody snarled. I will make sure to execute each and every one of you. And lastly, the Straw Hat Pirates. I know you guys are watching this from a monitor somewhere. These are the humans who broke the ambitions of Arlong Pirates. By the time the king has executed, the target will turn to you. Straw Hat Luffy with the 400 million bounty. I will behead you and make an example of you to the humans at the surface. It's time for the Ryugu Kingdom to be cleansed and be reborn as Proud Fish Man Island. Forest of the Sea. Deeper part. It's a bit different from others, but I have read something similar to it before. It's like a letter apologizing to someone. Who are you, Joy Boy? Robin thought out aloud as she read a Ponglyph. TCH, he is trying to pick a fight with us, Sanji said, blowing out smoke from his cigarette. Hem, I didn't know my bounty went up. Or did I know? Luffy pondered. What should we do now, Luffy? Hancock inquired. A part of her didn't want to just stay quiet about the situation. With the prior explanation of the oppression that the fishmen faced in the history of Fisher Tiger, and now with Hody Jones threatening her beloved, she just wanted to go to Plaza and beat that fish bastard into pulp. But now, she serves under Luffy and his decision would be hers as well. Not that she had any issues listening to her beloved's words. Hmm, should we do anything though? Luffy asked. I mean, we don't have anything to do with the issues here. I don't think we should be interfering with this. The straw hat stood shocked, unable to say anything. The change in Luffy was astounding. Two years prior, if someone had challenged him, Luffy would charge straight into battle without any second thoughts. Now, they didn't know what to tell. Part of them was glad that they wouldn't have to go into a battle just after gathering together, but they did want to save the king, part of them guilty that they were partially responsible for the capture of the king. Ah, uh, but I want to fight though. What should I do? Luffy said again and the straw hat's sweat dropped. Of course, who were they expecting to be mature? It was Luffy. He would fight. Luffy Kun, you were right earlier. I don't think you should participate in this battle. This is something that we should handle on our own, Jinbei said. Before Luffy could reply, Shirahoshi climbed onto the back of Megalo and started traveling towards the plaza. Princess Shirahoshi, where are you going? Jinbei yelled frantically. I have to go. I have to save my father. She replied, tears welling up in her eyes. No wait, princess. Jinbei tried. But Jinbei-san, I have to. Ishi hiccuped. Oi cry baby. Luffy's words though indicating fun. Had a serious edge to it that stopped Shirahoshi in her tracks. Her eyes became wide as she turned around to see Luffy looking her with a slight frown. Though his gaze looked like it pierced her soul. Luffy-sama, where do you think you are going without me? Luffy asked. I promised I would protect you till you get back to the palace. Now you are trying to go far from me. If you go far, I won't be able to protect you. And Jinbei said I shouldn't interfere in the fight in the plaza. Luffy whined. Shirahoshi looked at him, unable to talk. Luffy was someone who had a great sense of honor. It reminded of her mother. Luffy wouldn't bulge no matter what she tried. She had no other way as she sent a pleading look at Jinbei. She mustn't go there. Jinbei Hachai spoke as he slowly leaned onto a wood log. It's her ability that Arlong fears the most. So, having King as a hostage is a way to prevent her from using it. 
He fears it so much that he wouldn't even think of using her as a hostage and use the power for his own gain. He would just kill her, mercilessly. I have heard about this ability of mine, but I haven't talked to any Neptunians. I am not sure if it exists Shurahoshi said. No matter what, let's make sure Hodi doesn't find it out. Jinbei replied. I want to go there. I want to save my father. Please, Jinbei-san. Do something. She pleaded. I am going to fight them by myself. I am confident I could handle Hodi alone. Jinbei said, cracking his knuckles. Jinbei-san. He's got something. Something that boosts his power. And he got a massive army to serve him as well. He won't be able to fight someone like that alone. Hatch I said, desperation seeping into his voice. Jinbei, let us fight in this battle. After, after hearing about what happened to the Fisher Tiger and the history, I don't want to let this island get ruined. Nami said, but, it's not simply that I could allow someone to fight in this battle. Think about it. What would happen if you started fighting Hody on the Fishman Island? Every time when a fishman opens his heart to humans, it ends in tragedy. Humans are brute and they despise fishmen as what rings in their heads. Jinbei said, it's a natural fishman's thought. If you guys, the ones who defeated Arlong entered the war and were to defeat Hody, the thoughts would continue down. Another fishman slayed because he fought for our privileges. It would seem as if the history repeated itself. But, Jinbei Luffy spoke as Jinbei became silent. I can't let you or Shurahoshi go into the war, which is literally a deathbed laid out for you. You know you would die if you go there. Hachai, you said they beat you up, but you never said the reason. Chopper spoke, why did they beat one of them? You were also in Arlong's crew. Can't you see why? Robin entered the clearing from the depth of the forest. It's because he sided with us. Robin San, Sanji ran, uncaring of the situation. Hachai, is that true? Hody beat you up because you... Nami asked, clasping her mouth in shock. Nayu, well, Hachai couldn't reply, which more served as a confirmation for them. See, this is what I said. We have friends here, including you. We can't simply let you guys die. And that bastard. I wouldn't care if he were to talk anything about me. But he beat my friend just because he sided with us. I can't let that slide now, can I? Luffy asked, his eyes gaining a hard look. The temperature looked as if it dropped several degrees at that question. Yes, we have a reason to fight, Jinbei. We have Kami-chan, Shurahoshi-chan Sanji said. This place is the mermaid paradise, the place of my dreams. He thought, we can't sit here and watch. I still won't allow you to participate in this battle. Jinbei said. Luffy was getting impatient. He took a deep breath, calming himself down. Then how about we plan about this? Robin suggested. Plan? Jinbei questioned. Ara, were you planning on heading straight into battle without any plan? She asked. Jinbei looked sheepish. Straw hat sighed. It reminded them of their captain. Ryugu Castle. Why do you want to leave the Ryugu Castle boss? Why not do the execution here? Why you ask? Because people wouldn't believe if they didn't see it in real. Hody smirked. Ryugu Castle is an impregnable fortress. We just need some soldiers to open the gate for us. Boss, what about straw hats? That swordsman and the women made me angry. I think I am running low that they were able to injure me. Give me more of the energy steroids. The citizens from the fish men ready would be ready to move. They can soon move into those who are going to die or leave the island. Hody said as he gulped down a handful of the pills. It had an immediate effect as he doubled down on the ground, clutching his stomach in pain. The fishmen around him looked at him terrified and confused as they didn't know what to do in such situations. Captain Hody, are you alright? I it hurts. T to breathe. Hody gasped out. It feels like my body is torn into pieces. This must be the side effect of that drug. It shortens your life for temporary power. Neptune said as he was transported into a huge seahorse. Side effect. Hody laughed. Did you really think I wouldn't take something like that into consideration? We have already got this drug changed by some of the humans we captured from the surface. The legend does tell that it shortens your life upon giving you power, but this doesn't shorten your life. Neptune looked shell-shocked at the news. He was a monster, but one we could have taken care of. Even if it was the original pill, he could have had a small life. But this, he's a monster that cannot be stopped. Oh, who is gonna save my country? My children. Hody's entire demeanor terrified the people around him. Even his crew looked warily at him. The sea beasts were sweating, but didn't dare let out a noise at the fear of getting killed. But their instincts were screaming at them to run away. His hair changed completely white and his body transformed. His muscles being displayed more prominently. Deep Sea. Jua. She rejected me. Bander Deccan cried as he looked at his shaved head. You are not my type. These words kept repeating in his head. I want to kill her now, but she's alive. Everything I throw at her is being thwarted off by that bastard, Straw Hat. Captain, don't worry. There are other fish in the sea. The crew members snickered. Don't patronize me, you idiots. Deccan yelled. Oh, oh, I just got a brilliant idea. Oh yeah, what is it? That's it. I'll smash everything. Everything that's dear to her. He laughed. MMM. This is indeed a brilliant idea. He said, looking at a giant ship. 
Concord Plaza. King Neptune. Is he really going to get executed? The door to the plaza is locked. We should be able to climb the walls to look into what is happening inside. The murmurs of people echoed across the island as everyone was nervous about the execution. People were restless and afraid of the future of the Fishman Island. Sounds of the new Fishmen pirates could be heard in the nearby towns, sending shivers across the spines of the people. Just, how many are there? Inside the plaza, execution platform for the Neptune family. Giorara, look at them. They tried to save the royal family and now they are dead. The pirates laughed as they looked at the fallen soldiers of the royal family at the ground. Oi, that soldier is trying to do something Zio said, pointing at a soldier who was slowly standing up. He probably wants to blow us all with dynamite hick. Hayuzu commented as he drank sake from his bottle. Aol, I would be turned into dry squid then. The Karos laughed. Hody, who was sitting on a throne-like structure, merely raised his hand, letting a drop of water collect on his palm. If I can just take out one of them, I will have done my duty. The soldier yelled as he ignited the dynamites tied around his body and charged at the new fishman pirate crew. But before he could get closer, Hody fired of a water bullet from his hand, which pierced the soldier through his heart, killing him instantly. But that didn't stop the water bullet as it pierced through the back of his body and flew towards the wall, breaking the top of the wall behind the soldier into pieces. It continued flying till it broke through the bubble surrounding the Fishman Island, merging with the depths of the ocean. How far did it go? How powerful is he? People's fear became more prominent as they witnessed Hody's power. It was amplified by the fact that King and the princes were tied to spears and hung off the ground by chains, waiting to be executed. In the skies above the Concord Plaza, hurry up Megalo, Shurahoshi said. Oh, look at that, big boss Jinbei. It's father. Hey, it's me. It is really me, Shurahoshi. Voice echoed from the shape that represented Neptune. What? I don't think it is. Wait, Princess Shurahoshi. Jinbei yelled. But that went deaf in her ears as she went straight towards the shape. Concord Plaza. Oh, we are drawing in quite the crowd. Hee <laughs> hee. It's not something you see every day. Jahaha. Excellent. Hody laughed. I'm sorry father. Fukuboshi said, his eyes downcast. Don't apologize. Their power is gained through unnatural means. But the kingdom is theirs now. Let's execute them, captain. No, let's burn them. Let's impale them. Shut up. Hody snapped. I haven't received any information from the Deccan's lackeys that Shurahoshi isn't dead yet. All this is meaningless if we can't lure her here. Don't touch our sister. She is not a warrior. She can't be of harm to you. Mamboshi yelled. Prince Mamboshi, do you think of me as a fool? I know all about her ability to talk to Neptunians and control them. She is the mermaid of legend. I want to kill her more than any of you. He replied. Captain Hody. Everyone turned towards the voice that echoed through plaza. Waves of shock spread through the plaza as they saw Shurahoshi, Jinbei and the shark stumbling on the ground all bruised up. Princess Shurahoshi and Jinbei fell into our trap. A soldier yelled joyfully, an emotion not shared by many in the plaza. Hody's eyes narrowed for a second, but soon it vanished, alighting his eyes in joy. Shurahoshi, how? Neptune and the brothers yelled in worry. Father, brothers, I'm sorry. She apologized. The timing was crucial and this had to happen for the plan to work. She knew that they were worried deeply for her, but she couldn't show any weakness now. Jahaha, how can I so lucky to get two of my prey in a single net? Hody laughed boisterously. I knew you would come Jinbei. To save the human-loving fools. What happened to you Hody? Jinbei looked at the pale, whitened figure in front of him. It wasn't that scared him. It was the blood-red eyes and the bloodlust that rolled of him. It was uncanny. It's big boss Jinbei. I thought he wasn't at the island after he quit being one of the seven warlords. Did he save Princess Shurahoshi from Straw Hat Luffy? You all are so predictable. I knew you would come to save these guys. Only thing left now is the unpredictable straw hats. Hody laughed. But I dare them to do anything the ground rumbled as fishmen and humans alike holding various weapons marched into the plaza. The marching didn't stop as more and more keep coming in. Filling up the entire plaza to the brim and the outside of the plaza was surrounded by vicious-looking fishmen and mermen. They all extruded the same bloodlust that Hody gave off, albeit less compared to him. Nonetheless it was terrifying to see such a large number of fishmen gathered there and it gave off dread in the stomach of people present there. Look at this. Weapons trained and boosted fishmen 400,000 strong. And the human slaves captured over two years. 100,000. A total of 500,000 lawless fugitives from the fishmen district. Everyone looked horrified at the scene. Neptune anguished at the scene in front of him, contemplating on where it went wrong. 500,000 was a very huge number of people that he failed his duty to. Creating commotion in a public place. You've gotten rather brave, didn't you? Hody Jones a voice sounded on top of the cliff as they looked at who was speaking. Hody raised an eyebrow. Long time no see. Madam Charlie. People bristled at the calm demeanor that she was projecting. 
wondering if she saw something related to the execution in her visions. I saw a vision regarding someone who will bring ruin to the Fishman Island. She trailed off. Though, I wonder if it will come true, especially if it is me. Hody smirked. The person I saw in my vision was the captain of Straw Hat Pirates, Monkey D. Luffy. What are you trying to say? Hody asked, containing the shimmering anger under his skin. All I know is that you would never be the one to conquer the island. T that's right. Madam Charlie's prophecies always come true. They had no time to react as Charlie's abdomen was pierced by a water bullet. She cried under the pain of the impact as she fell on the ground. People around her rushed to aid her, but one look of Hody stopped them in tracks. I am nothing like your brother. I have gained real power. I will be the one to conquer the island. I started this plan ten years ago. Do you know who killed your beloved Queen Ottoheim? It was me. He laughed. Everyone stilled on shock as what seemed like hundredth time. No one could process the statement that Hody just said, except one on the plaza. Neptune and the brothers looked like they had their breath taken out of their lungs. All their lives they believed that a human was the one responsible for the death of her and felt it was easier to blame on him. But hearing this now, it was like their entire world was turned upside down. I just paid a human pirate to shoot the box of letters and set it ablaze. While everyone was focused on that, I shot the queen myself. She was in my way, Shurahoshi. Can you believe that? She preached in and out about how humans are good and that we deserve to live with them, among them. It grated my nerves that all I felt was to choke her to death and watch her suffer to death. Everyone couldn't do anything but hold their breath as he talked, his crazy demeanor spilling out. The bloodlust was rolling, sending shivers down their spines. That's why I had to kill her. Your mother deserved to die. And by my hands, I am the assassin. Hody laughed. I knew that. She said meekly, controlling the tears from spilling out. It seemed like the people couldn't handle any more shocks, but they had no choice in the matter. What? What do you mean you knew it, Shurahoshi? Tell me, Neptune demanded, something that he never did before to Shurahoshi. Even the brothers looked worried at their father. If Shurahoshi was afraid or saddened, she didn't show it. What do you mean? You knew I killed your mother, Hody asked, confused. After a few years of the incident, Megalo told me the truth of the incident. He used to be the mascot of the Neptune army. He saw everything that happened on that day. If I had revealed it back then, you would have tried to get revenge on Hody San. I couldn't let that happen as mother would be sad. It was the last promise I made to her, that no matter who killed her, I wouldn't hate them. All these years, you held on to the truth because of the promise. Fukuboshi asked, You've been faithful to our mother's wishes all these years and kept this fact to yourself all alone inside the shell tower. She refused to hate the man who killed her mother. Even if it was the last wish of her mother, is it possible really to do such feat? What a strong-willed lady. Jinbei wondered. Jahaha, this is golden. What you did is call stupidity in this world, Shurahoshi. Hody said, because you couldn't make yourself hate me, the whole island is going to get destroyed. It's your fault that everyone on this island, your father, your brothers are going to die. Don't listen to him. What you did was noble and good, Jinbei said, although a part of him disagreed. Hody turned back at the Neptune family and fired of multiple water arrows, piercing them in many places. King Neptune, the one with most injuries, fell forward as exhaustion and pain took over. This is terrible. He is going to get killed. There is no one that could save him when the entire plaza was surrounded by 500,000 of his men. The citizens whispered nervously as the pirates laughed. Madam Charlie, when will Straw Hat come to destroy this island? A boy of six or seven asked nervously while others around him flinched. Madam Charlie, who was lying on the ground, thankfully the bleeding contained for now, looked at them in sadness. I can only see what happens. I can't say when it happens. It might be today, tomorrow or in ten years. No one can tell. She said, frowning in sadness. I w wish he would come now. I know it will be bad for us, but it will be bad for them too. I don't want to see T the king die. He cried. The adults looked ashamed and thoughtful at the same time. You are right. It would be the best time for that. They muttered. Straw hat l-u-f-f-y. If you are going to bring ruin to this island, do it now. They yelled. Shouts of Luffy's name echoed the plaza as they prayed for him to destroy the island in desperate tinged voices. T-C-H, this is pathetic. Are they all imbeciles? This is just ridiculous, Hody said. Feudal desperate cries of hope, I'm sure. Ikaros replied. Watch, as I destroy all your hopes. I am going to blow the head of your beloved King Neptune. Hody said as he readied his sword over Neptune's head and held his head by the name. Father, Shurahoshi tried to shout, yell, scream at him to stop it. But all came out was a whisper, silently pleading him to stop, which went unheard as Hody raised his sword directly above the nape, intending to behead the king. Don't do it Hody, we beg you. The brothers protested as much as they could given the position they were in. Kill us instead and release him. The very place seemed to still as everyone held their breath, protests dying in their throats as Hody let out a maniacal laugh, enjoying every moment of this execution. 
The only thing that ran in Shurahoshi's mind was trying to find a way to save her father and each time it reached the same conclusion as before. Luffy-sama, please save my father. She screamed into the heavens, her cries echoing through the plaza. It didn't affect Hody a bit as he brought down the sword. Time seemed to slow down as everyone widened their eyes at the sight, dread filling their chest. All of a sudden, thumping of drums resounded throughout the plaza, making Hody stop the sword just before it hit the king's nape. Everyone looked around to find the source of the drums, but they couldn't find the source. Hody was annoyed that someone clearly wanted to distract him from the execution. Whoever it was, he would take care of him after the execution. But, before he could react, a powerful kick impacted into his stomach and sent him flying into the far wall, crushing it into several pieces. The citizens were shocked to see the newcomer standing nonchalantly on the place where Hody was a few moments ago as none of them saw him appear or move save a few. A powerful presence settled across the place, making the hairs on their neck stand up. They could clearly hear the thumping of drums from the newcomer. Upon closer look they realized who it was. Straw Hat Luffy. He really came. Citizens and pirates yelled alike as they saw the captain calmly standing there, assessing the situation and then turned back, walking towards Shurahoshi. He saved King Neptune. Did you hear that? Princess Shurahoshi called him to help. Luffy-sama. Shurahoshi wailed, but in relief as she saw her father saved by him. I suppose the plan couldn't be followed here. Not before risking the execution of King Jinbei said. Then now is the time to act. All of you. He yelled. Everyone looked confused before a voice spoke up. Relax Jinbei. Luffy knew the plan wouldn't go as planned. He warned us to act faster and get ready anyway. Nami spoke as she appeared from thin air. Mirage cancel. Hey. She appeared out of nowhere. Is this what you wanted Jinbei? The document from that the celestial dragon signed. She asked. Also, I have given the keys to Robin. The locks on those who were captured came loose as Robin used her powers to unlock it. What? The document and the keys are gone. Air above them rustled as everyone looked up in the sky to see two figures approached. They squinted their eyes to make a clear picture, until they realized what it was. The pirates felt strange foreboarding that something was going to happen. Gaon Cannon The sunny's mouth part opened to reveal a huge cannon that charged up and fired at the crowd, blasting several pirates into pieces. That is the straw hat Luffy's ship and the other thing is the whale of the royal family, Ho. Now, go whale, rescue them, Frankie said as he readied the ship for landing. The whale swooped in to pick up the king and the brothers. The pirates trying to attack the whale, but they were still recovering from the blast of the ship and couldn't attack fast enough to stop it. What happened? King Neptune asked bleakly as he slowly recovered enough energy to speak. It looks like Jinbei had a plan. Fukuboshi answered as he looked down on below the field, dreading of what's going to happen next. Landing successful. Frankie laughed as the ship landed with a resounding boom. Oh, look how many are there. It's like they all are here for a feast. Chopper wondered. Part of him felt silly to compare a battlefield to a feast. Moi oi, are all of these guys our enemies? Isn't this a bit too much? Yuzop said, his voice wavering a bit. It would be good if we had Zoro here too. To ch, we don't need that moss head to take care of these small fries. But still, where did he go during the important moments? Sanji sighed as he puffed on his cigarette. I can see that there are more than 400. No, there are more outside the plaza too. I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than 500,000 people here. Yo ho ho, that is a bit worrisome. F 500,000. Yuzop and Chopper trembled. I can see all of you itching for a fight. Yosh, let's put on a flashy fight everyone. Frankie grinned. Before anyone could move, they heard a yell from behind. They turned back on the railing to see someone approaching at high speeds though the crowd. Sanji and Hancock narrowed their eyes and slightly shifted into a fighting pose. But then they relaxed hearing the voice that sounded all too familiar. Ah, stop it. Zoro's voice echoed through the place as they approached them at high speed, Zoro hanging off of neck of what seemed a snake. Oh, Salome. Hancock gushed and relaxed. The snake climbed onto the sunny, dropping off the swordsman and a starfish on the deck abruptly on their ass, before rushing towards Hancock, who eagerly hugged her pet snake. Oh, Marimo, you're here. By the way, what was that pathetic display that you did right now? Sanji snickered. S shut up. Zoro blushed in embarrassment, cursing the snake for making him look like a fool. I saw Pepe go while I was heading here, and since he wanted to go to the plaza as well, I took him and walked towards here, but the island kept moving and I couldn't identify the place. Then that stupid snake saw us and wanted to bring us here. And well, he trailed off. The rest of the crew sighed as none of them believed what he sprouted just now. Zoro got lost. Pepagu tried to help him, but couldn't as Zoro kept getting lost. The snake came in and took them here. The explanation Zoro just gave was automatically translated in each of the experienced crewmates. Even Hancock couldn't help but stare at him in disbelief for a brief second of all the bullshit he just sprouted while keeping a straight face. Oh everyone, meet my pet snake and companion, Salom. Everyone nodded, except Yuzop. 
who watched it warily, but shrugged as he trusted his crewmate. Chopper was the most enthusiastic as he greeted the snake happily. Look at that. The people on top of the cliff whispered and murmured. It's the straw hat crew. They really showed up. Hey, was that the swordsman of the crew that just showed up pathetically? Shut up. He might hear us. Wow, look at all these guys here. Zora whistled. What? Are you afraid, Mosshead? Sanji asked. Huh, who is afraid? Curly brows. If you want, you all can go and sleep. I'll take care of them myself. Zoro grinned as he held his sword in anticipation. I am going to prove my worth to my beloved. I will do him a favor by making everyone here surrender to his feet. Hancock proclaimed confidently as she looked down on the pirates. Fufufu, everyone is fired up Robin said as everyone got off the ship. Landing on top the plaza with building excitement for some and in fear for some, but their face settled into an impassive mask as they approached their captain in rhythmic steps. The fishmen couldn't help but stare in awe as they saw the straw hats walk towards their captain with respect while holding a presence for themselves. Look at them. The straw hats are getting off the ship and heading towards the center. Hey, straw hat, do you really plan on destroying this island? One yelled, distressed and anxious of the outcome. Why did you occupy the royal palace? Do you guys also want to kill the royal family? Do you guys kidnap the mermaids and want to enslave them so that you could sell? Answer us. This is important. Are you a friend or a foe? Shouts sounded across the plaza as people pleaded for answers. Friend? Foe? Luffy laughed, the sound of drums thumping loudly. Why should I care for that? I am only here because my friend asked for help. So, decide yourself. Fishmen District, Noah. Hey, the Che. Captain Vander Decken. Pirates yelled in fear as they heard huge rumbles vibrate through the seabed and in the water. W what is going on? Can't you guys tell what is going on? Deccan laughed as he looked at his right hand. A long time ago, the people of Fishman Island built this mysterious ship called Noah, and I just touched it with my right hand. In other words, I just launched this gigantic at my beloved Shurahoshi. This ship is half the size of the entire Fishman Island. In other words, Shurahoshi and the entire Fishman Island will die. Oh no, I can't believe it. It is really moving. The pirates screamed in shock as the ship slowly lifted up in the water, moving towards the Fishman Island. Hody and others looked at Luffy and his crew warily as they stood with unwavering gazes in front of them. He thought they might still not have had a reality check yet and would probably fear once they heard the numbers they were against. But something in Luffy's eyes put him in his guard. After all, how hard will it be to deal with a measly ten-member crew compared to the strength he had? See Jinbei, I told you the plan wouldn't go as we planned. Luffy smirked at Jinbei. Yes, I know. But this is fine. This is similar to what I imagined the entry of you guys expected to be Jinbei Sai. A few minutes earlier, Forest of the Sea. Oh right, I have a plan. Jinbei spoke up, thinking about the idea that Robin proposed. Tell me, tell me, Luffy said, who looked like he was about to jump into the battle right away. All right, so I will go and get myself captured. Then I will call you guys for help once the time is right. You guys come in and save us, becoming the hero of the Fishman Island. Jinbei said, proud of his own plan. Some looked at him with an annoyed expression. Nope, I don't want to become a hero. I am a pirate, Luffy said, pouting. Hey, that's your concern, Nami asked exasperated. Yes, a hero must share his things to everyone. I won't, Luffy said, his eyes flashing golden as he laughed, possessiveness seeping into his voice. If you guys are going to fight Hody, you have to follow this plan, Jinbei said with a tone of finality. Some wanted to point out various flaws in the plan, but stayed silent as to what Luffy would say. All right, I am only doing this because you asked for, Jinbei. But I don't feel this plan is going to work. And if it doesn't work you have to give me a lot of meat. Luffy said, his mouth dripping at the thought of it. Jinbei sighed. All right, I will give you lots of meat if this plan is going to fail. He said, supposing this is the best possible outcome he could get for now. You and others get into Megalo's mouth and reach there. Once you are there, we need to somehow retrieve the document signed by the world noble. Jinbei trailed off, thinking of a way to do this task. Leave that to us, Jinbei. Me and Robin are more than capable of handling that task. Nami said proudly. All right, the rest of you should arrive at the plaza when you guys get signal that the battle has been started, Jinbei said. As for how to know that, good luck with it. Boy, that is an obvious hole in your plan. Sanji yelled. Don't worry about that. Luffy, once the battle starts, spread your presence for a moment. We will stand by close enough so that I should be able to sense it and we will arrive in moment, Hancock said. Others looked impressed by this plan. I am not going into the shark's mouth, Luffy said. And why is that? Jinbei sighed for the umpteenth time. It will be icky and gross. I will be invisible by just using my devil fruit. Luffy grinned. You can do that. How? Jinbei questioned, curious. Even the straw hats looked intrigued as they wanted to know if this was related to the second devil fruit he had. I will just use the surroundings and pull the ground as blanket over me to hide myself. Luffy said. I have awakened form of my devil fruit which lets me control the environment like rubber too. 
But what if someone sees you doing that? Oh, don't worry. I will be fast enough that no one will be able to see that happen. Luffy grinned, and the straw hats nodded. If their captain is sure about his powers, then they would trust him. Jinbei looked unsure for a moment, but nodded. He has seen miracles happen and he knew people can move very fast. It wouldn't do him any good to untrust his companion's words. Hmm, is there anything else bothering you, Jinbei? Nami asked, confused. We need a name for this operation, he said, with a completely serious face. Nami's eyebrows twitched in anger about being surrounded by idiots. Who needs a name? Let's go, she yelled, others nodding their heads. Straw Hat is talking to Big Boss Jinbei. Did they too plan this? Are they here to save this island? People at the top of the cliff were filled with a small but growing hope as they looked at the crew. Hee hee, look at these guys, getting filled with so much energy just because the human hit our captain once. Don't think you have won just because of that, straw hat. This isn't over and you will learn the true wrath of our captain soon. Zio yelled. I am sorry for keeping about Hodi and Mom's murderous secret, Jinbei-san. Sure Ahoshi said, feeling guilty about this whole situation. No, it's me who should be apologizing, princess. It's a noble thought that you wanted to stop this cycle of hate and you're a great being who could do this. One day, when all of them are going to be an intelligent creature who are able to look beyond the hatred, they should be able to understand this brave deed that you just did. Jinbei said, You have nurtured this bud for so long, now it's our job to protect it. I thought you were nothing but a wimpy and big crybaby Luffy spoke, mischief in his eyes. But you are not wimpy. You are very brave for doing that. Although you are still a big crybaby. He laughed, much to the embarrassment of Shurahoshi. Don't worry, you are much of my friend as others are. No one will be able to harm you anymore by the time I leave this island, and those who wish to harm you must come through me first. He laughed, his voice tinging a bit on the maniacal side. The fishmen pirates nearby felt their soul being laid out bare before the straw hat's feet as they heard the laugh. Boss, they are completely ignoring you, a pirate near Zio said. I intentionally whispered so that they don't learn our plans, Zio replied, his pride not allowing him to admit that he was being ignored. The pirates nearby sweat dropped at the attempt to save his pride, but didn't open their mouths at the fear of being killed. Here, take this Shurahoshi. This is the document signed by the noble. Nami smiled. Thank you everyone. This is the hope that my mother left behind for this island. She said as she held the document, reminiscing. To CH, I told them Shurahoshi had to be killed immediately. A voice rumbled as he walked towards the center. Cody looked completely fine and the place he had been hit was healed with not so much a scar or hint of blood. He looks completely fine after being hit with such force. Yuz up gasped, looking at the white-haired monster in front of them. Jinbei, you are such a traitor. You are just as bad as the human-loving fool of a queen and her family. Siding with those lowly creatures even after you witnessed how bad they treat our kind. After how they killed our beloved fisher tiger. Hody shouted, each word filled with malice pouring off. But it's fine. You all are going to get killed anyway. You can't match against the power of 500,000 pirates. This is the year when reverie takes place. I will make sure to kill all the nobles and kings that come there once I become the ruler of this island. Then I will make those humans my slaves so that no one will be able to defy the power of the underground kingdom. He laughed. I alone will be worthy enough to become the pirate king. Pirate king. No one but Hancock heard the whisper of him and instantly was on alert. There were only two things that could make him truly furious. One seeing his friends and crew getting hurt. And the other is when someone tells him about being the pirate king. Who, there are 500,000. Meaning we have to take around 50,000 each, Sanji said as he eased into fighting pose. Numbers don't matter anyway. It's not like they are navy troops, Zoro said. Don't tell me you are scared at the numbers. Huh, what was that? Sanji teached as he glared at the swordsman. Before Zoro could retort, they felt the temperature chilling down and a low hum of beat reaching their ears. They turned to see Luffy calmly walking towards the fishmen pirates, his eyes shadowed by his straw hat. They slowly moved out of his way as he walked towards the center. Those who felt the temperature plume it down stayed rooted in their places, pale due to fear as they looked at the approaching captain. Sadly, those who didn't grin at what they felt was a walking prey into the nest. What seemed a relentless onslaught of pirates closed in, encircling him with a malevolent intent. Their weapons poised to strike Luffy down to his death. Yet, in that crucial moment, time appeared to freeze, and an ethereal dance of red and black lightning crackled with intensity around Luffy's body. A profound aura emanated from him, enveloping the surroundings with an indomitable presence as his conqueror's hacky surged forth, unleashing its might. Those within its reach slowly succumbed to its overwhelming force, yielding to unconsciousness as blood spilled from their mouths. The sheer magnitude of Luffy's hacky reverberated across the entire island, its weight settling upon all present on the island. Even among his own crew, some struggled to remain upright under the weight and potency of the Haki's power, a testament to the immense strength Luffy possessed. Some people on the cliff also fainted, 
unable to withstand the power. Hancock immediately lunged towards Luffy and placed her hand on his shoulder. Luffy, that is enough, she shouted, hoping it would reach his mind. It seemed to work as the presence recoiled, and Luffy looked back at Hancock, his eyes shining black in anger. Hancock's breath hitched, but recovered immediately. Stop it. It could harm our crew members as well, and innocent people are here, she replied. Luffy's eyes widened and the hacky's presence stopped, but they could feel it contained inside the straw hat's body as red-black lightning occasionally crackled and danced on his body. T that was, that was hacky, Robin said, a bit shaken by the display of power by her captain. How could he do this much in just two years? As Haki feels so potent, Jinbei said, surprised at the growth of Luffy and a bit apprehensive as he had felt Whitebeard's Haki before. This felt powerful than that, although he could say that the old man wasn't in his prime when he felt it. Color of Supreme King Ha. Huh? That felt so powerful. I knew he had it in him, Sanji said as he puffed on his cigarette. He should be able to do this much. Otherwise, we would have better candidates for Captain Zoro grinned. The presence he just felt excited him more and more towards fighting the opponents. Although when he looked around, he can't help but feel disappointed. While what just happened, even the commanders of the new Fishmen Pirates were shaken up by the power they just witnessed. Hody felt shivers running down his spine as he felt the power focus only on him for a moment. He felt unsure if he would be able to stand for much longer had it been focused longer on him. No, H how can he be so powerful? He took out half of us in a single shot. A fishman pirate yelled, shocking others around him, although some questioned how he got to that number. What? You mean 250,000 of us got defeated already? They yelled, stepping back in fear. They didn't know that Luffy could have made everyone on the field and more unconscious had Hancock didn't stop him. I know you are angry Luffy, let me handle this fight. I will show him that he won't be able to defeat a member of the future Pirate King's crew, let one become one. Hancock said, her eyes shining in unkempt anger as well as determination. Luffy felt contemplative for a second, but soon grinned and nodded. You said you will become Pirate King, Luffy said, as everyone snapped their heads to Luffy, who was grinning widely, which was a bit unnerving to many. You could have been the king to whatever nation, island, sea or the world if you wanted, had you stayed quiet and not crossed my path. But not only you made a mistake of declaring your intent to be the Pirate King in front of me, you also dared to hurt my friends. The weight of Luffy's words hung heavily in the air, an ominous warning. Soon enough, you will come to understand the dire consequences of crossing paths with someone destined to become the future king of the pirates. Amidst the looming darkness and imminent demise, a chilling specter of death materialized before their eyes. The very thought of surrendering to unconsciousness seemed tempting, as it promised respite from the agonizing fate that awaited them. Yet, among the overwhelming despair, a courageous few refused to yield, though their efforts seemed feeble against the approaching horror. A wicked smile adorned Hancock's face as she relished the terror etched upon their visages, a twisted delight shared only by one other among the crew. Stepping forward, Zoro took up his sword with a fierce grin, prepared to carve a path drenched in crimson if it meant his captain could forge ahead towards his destiny. Luffy calmly walked back and took place near a terrified yet hopeful Shurahoshi. The crew members shook themselves out of stupor and readied for the fight. Many felt more confident at the lowered numbers, while some felt disappointed. Prepare yourself, Hody, for what will be the last few minutes of your life, Hancock said as she leaped in the air. Perfume femur, Magna. With an incredible display of power, she raised her feet high in the air before forcefully smashing onto the ground. The impact ripped out huge pieces of land into jagged fragments, unleashing powerful waves all across the plaza. Those closest to the epicenter were dragged down into the rebels. Many around it lost their footings on the shockwaves struggling to maintain balance, surrender or be annihilated, though that isn't an option for all. Zoro grinned as he dashed ahead swinging his swords in helical arc, three sword style, 1080 pound cannon. Air blades rushed through, tearing those who stumbled upon its path into pieces. The blades seemed to devour the fear permeated as it continued in its path, claiming several thousand more. Come on, Luffy, this is no fun. He complained looking at the numbers which seemed very diminished to his eyes. You could have left more than 250,000 to us. You should learn to share. To those fish men pirates who stood near him, felt the urge to complain about how 250,000 is not a small number as the swordsmen seemed to make it. Ah, uh, sorry, Luffy said, though the statement was not apologetic in the slightest. His eyes seemed to be fixated on Hody, who properly looked terrified to the soul, but couldn't show it as it would make him look weak in front of his crew. I will take out 100,000 of those Sanji commented, leaning forward in contained excitement. Isn't it super? I think this will be the best place to test out the new weapons don't you think? Frankie smirked. Who wants to join this? Yuzop and Chopper were the first to respond as they heard the word weapons and knowing Frankie, they knew it was something that's going to awesome. What is it? They chirped, fear all gone, filled with thrill and excitement of using the new weapon. Nami also joined in the quest. 
primarily to protect herself from the onslaught of fishmen pirates surrounding the area. Well, wait and see for yourself. Those are my finest inventions in these past two years, Frankie replied, walking inside the ship, followed eagerly by Yuzop and Chopper and a reluctant Nami. It wasn't that she was reluctant of Frankie's inventions, no, but she knew it would be something stupid and that thought made her hesitate. To ch, what has this come to Hody shook his head, glaring pointed at the Shurahoshi for the stunt that she just pulled. He felt stupid at himself for not realizing why Jinbei had surrendered so easily. Water gathered up on his hands slowly as hatred towards the giant mermaid rose. His glare intensified as he aimed at her and shot the water bullet, which soared through the sky, but was met with a large boom, confusing Hody. He then looked below. Jinbei was standing tall with a water shot on his own hands. Captain just turned into a monster and made his water bullets insanely powerful, but it was met with another one in the air. Jinbei, that man is also a monster, Doruma commented, slightly mortified at the fact about these monsters present on the island. No matter how much power you put behind those shots, it would only be so much effective if one's basic techniques are still novice. Jinbei commented. Hody snarled in rage at the comment. The idea of his technique being no less than perfect made him temperamental. Fishman pirates around charged at Hody, sensing his anger might turn to them if they continue to stand idle at the same place. But what they didn't take into account was various straw hats shielding Shurahoshi from danger. Mill Fleurs, Gigantesco Mono. Enormous legs formed seemingly by several petal-like arms combining, but no one had the time to realize on the fact as they were busy running away from the gigantic legs that was about to crush them. Stump. The legs came down with tremendous speed, which surprised many at the plaza, crushing many pirates under it causing a massive booming sound. There are historic origins surrounding this area. Be careful about damaging them Robin said, her face set in grim determination. Yo ho ho, Robin San is sure fired up Brooke laughed. Then, I guess I should do something as well. He said as he walked towards a group that was advancing on the princess. Excuse me, you are not supposed to go there. Hence forgive me for stopping you. Brooke bowed before the group who looked warily at him. But their wariness vanished, replacing with pleasant, tranquil expression as music played on the island, sending them to their dream islands. But the time they realized what was going on, they saw Brooke was behind them, slowly walking while sheathing his sword. Quinto tears, Fantasia. Cuts appeared all over the pirate's body, blood spraying out as from a fountain. The pirates looked at him with a shocked expression as they slowly fell unconscious and Brooke kept walking towards the next group. After all, he had work to do. Diamond Shell Squad. Get him. The Diamond Shell Squad surged forward, their shields gleaming with unyielding resilience. Thousands of pirates, driven by the illusion of invincibility, closed in on Zoro, who stood unfazed, his countenance a picture of calmness, though a glimmer of anticipation danced in his eyes. Zoro sheathed one of his swords, leaving him with a formidable pair held firmly in his hands, poised for battle. Two years, huh, time sure flies fast. Yet here we are, resuming our journey towards the path that once was insurmountable. After seeing him, I don't think this is going to cut it. I have to become stronger, much stronger so I could make him the king he is meant to be. In that moment, his haki surged forth, enveloping the blades in an Inkai black sheen. Zoro brought the two swords together in a perfect X. His muscles rippled with raw power and in one fluid motion, he unleashed a powerful slashing attack. A burst of compressed air transforming into a colossal blade that tore through oncoming wave as if they were papers. The rushing gust cleaved through the ranks of the oncoming squads, creating a huge whirlwind of blades, continuing to cut through them. Two sword style, thundering blade. He stalked off towards Hody, cries of agony and screams echoing in the background. TCH, look that idiot moss head showing off Sanji huffed as he looked at the sea urchin fishman pirates advance at him, or rather Princess Shurahoshi. He looked towards the sky, which looked strangely calm in this fledged war. The pirates pounced at him, foolishly thinking he was having his guard down. At the same time, a squad from the sky approached Shurahoshi in hopes that they would be able to reach her, ignoring two barriers that stood there. I thought I was strong, what a joke. Two years ago, it was proved that it was false. While everyone was having their imaginary world turn true, one was fighting for his life and life of someone close to him. After two years, I thought I was strong now. But looking at him a few moments ago, Sanji thoughts trailed off he blew out the smoke from his cigarette. The sea urchins which attacked him had their spikes broken. Not because of any retaliation from Sanji, but rather the force at which they attacked him seemed as if they all hit a stone wall and the close proximity of other urchins affected them by piercing into their skin, sending everyone there into pain. None except one noticed this and his gaze grew curious. It was a harsh training. I couldn't see Nami-chan, Robin-chan, though now they have grown more beautiful, with the added view of Hancock-chan. His nose slightly bled as he had various, interesting images running in his mind. It seems like it's all in the distant past now. I ran away from those hideous monsters. I kept running and running. 
Even when I was cornered, I kept running into the sky. Sanji seemed to vanish amidst the sea urchin pirates as they fell on the floor with painful howls occasionally heard. He started flying into the sky using the technique of moonwalk used by the Cypher Fall agents. Luffy raised his eyes in surprise as he saw Sanji using the technique that he thought only two in his crew could do. Skywalk. He positioned himself between the princess and the approaching pirates. I would let you bastards hurt the cute princess here. He looked behind towards Shurahoshi and showed a thumbs up. Think me as your knight in shining armor. I will protect you. He said, unabashedly smiling towards her, which many would have considered creepy had they been with knowledge about these. Shurahoshi was restrained of most of that information growing up. She just smiled gratefully at him, which seemed to empower him more. Poiluo Friel, Spectre, Sanji's feet blazed in bright yellow flames as he rained kicks on them, sending them crashing down on the ground with burns all over the body. The speed of kicks was very high for them even comprehend what was going on and soon everyone fell with broken bones and charred skin. Meanwhile, Hancock advanced towards Hody, stalking towards him akin to approaching a prey, while beating down those who tried to stop her. The kicks were powerful and swift, turning them into stone in the milliseconds of contact and break them into pieces instantaneously. While there was a slight disadvantage as many didn't feel lustful towards her, as she was a human, it didn't pose a big challenge considering most there were weak to resist the power of her kicks. They are getting carried away. Kraken. Hody called out as a massive figure rose upon the plaza walls. Come out here and fight. Crush these lowly humans out of my sight. Oh, it's the legendary Kraken monster. The straw hats don't stand a chance. The pirates cheered, ignorant of the powers. Hey, it's Serum. Luffy laughed as he saw the gigantic octopus. Do you remember me? The Kraken felt equal amounts of relief and dread seeping into it. It smiled and grunted while thrashing its arms in joy as many pirates were crushed in the massive impact it had. It swept around the plaza, reaching towards where Shurahoshi and Luffy sat, preening under the attention that Luffy gave in happiness. What are you doing? Hody gritted his teeth in anger as he glared at the Kraken, which paused its activities, sweating heavily in fear. You do realize who are in stake right? If you can't do this properly not only are you going to die, there is someone else that's going to die as well, no. He smiled evilly at Kraken, which seemed to pale under the implications that Hody made. If you don't carry out your duties properly, I'll make sure to deliver the message to your brother by sending him to hell. What? He is holding its brother as hostage, Jinbei exclaimed. The Kraken snapped and slowly slithered its arms around Shurahoshi's body towards her neck, tightening the airway. Shurahoshi tried to get out of its grip as she struggled to breathe. The pressure increased as her weak body struggled to fight against the pressure. Ugh, Surum, you're hurting me. She gasped out, trying to wiggle out of the tentacles. The Kraken grimaced but continued to choke Shurahoshi in the fear of Hody harming its brother. Suddenly, a massive presence settled on the Kraken. Its primal instincts screamed to run away from the place as it looked on Luffy who glared, sending chills on its entire body. The Kraken slowly loosened its grip, sweating heavily from the intensity of the power. It felt dread as death approached slowly, waiting to claim its life. And just as it came, the presence vanished completely, leaving the Kraken to breathe heavily. Your brother is in danger, huh? Luffy spoke as its breath hitched. Slowly it nodded its head, fearing for its life. I know you are only trying to protect him he said as he looked at its eyes. So, leave me to protect him for this time and trust in me he grinned. Instinctively, the Kraken believed him, it did not know why, perhaps it was his power, or his charisma, but it knew the word was to be believed and it will be fulfilled. But the presence came back in full force as he directed its gaze at the Kraken, this would be your last chance. Make another move to danger one of my friends and you will know what death would feel if cooked alive. Luffy warned. The Kraken nodded so quickly that its neck joints might have popped if it had any. Luffy narrowed his gaze, making sure his message was received and then released it from its power. Hancock turned towards Hody again, increasing her pace towards her enemy. Dawson and Akaro stepped forward, bloodlust pouring off them due to the pills that they took. Veins bulged as they raised their weapons to strike Hancock. Hody narrowed his eyes, feeling as if he is missing something. As they swung down their weapons, they were stopped by Zoro and Sanji in midair, allowing Hancock to continue forward. Don't get in Hancock Chan's way, Sanji yelled, pushing Akaro's off to the side, completely ignoring the supposed increase in power that they were to have. It spoke of their training and hard work they went through. Hody clicked his tongue in irritation, standing up to face the pirate empress herself. He underestimated the danger he had brought upon himself. Unbeknownst to him, a simmering rage burned within Hancock's eyes as she fixated her gaze on him. With measured steps, she advanced towards Hody's suppressed fury blazing inside. In an instant, she vanished from sight, leaving Hody stunned and disoriented. He frantically scanned his surroundings, his senses on high alert, which weren't enough to warn him of the attack that followed. Hypnotic strike. Hancock's legs shined colors, distracting Hody the moment she appeared in front of him. 
She kicked hard on his stomach, sending him scraping along the floor towards the wall. He bounced several times before coming to a stop. He groggily stood up, trying to make sense of the situation around him. But his senses were clouded, leaving him perplexed. He heard muffled steps around him and his vision were compromised, appearing blurry. Oi, Captain has been hit. Iron Shell Squad, cover him up. He needs our help. Hody could only hear certain words like Iron Shell and help, but that was enough for him to try and understand what was going on. He wanted to yell at them to stop interfering in this fight as they were no match for the one standing in front of them. If one from the crew could easily cut diamonds without breaking sweat, Iron Shell squad were as good as dead even before they could face them. Hancock smirked, wicked idea forming in her head. While these guys inherently weren't useful in terms of knowledge nor are they any powerful to cause problem in this fight, but that doesn't mean they aren't useful at all. Love Queen's enthrallment. A potent wave of allure washed over them before anyone could so much as prepare for it, leaving them panting for breath as their eyes became glassy. A look of contentment took over their faces. Drool dripped out of their mouths as they kneeled before Hancock, lustfully gazing at the pirate empress. Oh, my Iron Squad dears. Hancock spoke in a very sweet voice, making the soldiers look at her with even more adoration. I am afraid that my friends might get hurt. I couldn't bear that. I will be very sad if that happens. You all don't like me being sad, don't you? She asked, everyone nodding their heads vigorously. A slight angry look took upon their visages, clutching to their shells tighter. Then could you go and protect them from the evil people for me? She said as she batted eyelids in a captivating way. They immediately nodded, rushing off towards several sides, attacking the fishmen present at the battle. Hancock laughed at the look and their energy, making them attack their own men, fall into her magic. She could have just skipped past them and attacked Hody directly, but she wanted some fun. That was enough for Hody to finally regain his senses. He looked at the pirate empress with trepidation and a bit more fear. She wasn't someone he could underestimate, though he also thought he should have realized that fact way earlier. He gathered water on his palms, sending water bullets towards her, hoping to throw off her momentum by a bit initially. Hancock skillfully evaded each incoming water bullet, her keen observation hacky guiding her movements effortlessly. However, her graceful evasion gradually morphed into an air of boredom, as if she found the challenge beneath her. She then just marched straight into the oncoming bullets. Hody smirked slightly, foolishly thinking that it was a moment of tiredness that was causing that to happen. But the smirk faltered when he saw the bullets ricochet of her body, akin to raindrop bouncing from an umbrella. To compound his unease, not a single droplet adhered to her, leaving her utterly untouched by the liquid assault. The surrounding pirates stared at her in shock not for the first time, at her unharmed figure. Hody surged forward closing the distance between them. The ground quaked from the harsh halt that he came to be, unleashing a powerful punch at Hancock. Yet, with an effortless grace, she met the punch with a kick of her own, the collision sending impact waves around the field. Multiple barrages of punches and kicks resounded, Hody desperately trying to get a hit on Hancock. But it was for naught as she evaded and clashed with him with a profound ease, insulting his pride. He roared in anger, increasing the speed even more, making it harder for the bystanders to follow. Look at your pathetic efforts. It's nothing but trash if you are trying to get a hit on me Hancock said. Hody raged and put more of the pills into his mouth, his hair starting to become red. He glared at her and charged, roaring cry echoing at the plaza. Meanwhile, at the sunny. Oh ho, what is the new thing that you want to try out? Tell us Frankie. Usopp gushed as they stepped down into the lower deck of the Thousand Sunny. They stood at a platform surrounded by doors with numbers going from 1 to 8. Usopp and Chopper looked around in palpable excitement while Nami was confused. It's some of my newest creation. Let's do it. Frankie yelled. Channel 4. Sound of gears turning were heard as the door marked as 4 slowly opened. Black Rhino FRU 4. The door outside the ship also opened, revealing a huge bike with a rhino-shaped front. It had spikes on both sides of its wheels with two large guns at either side of Frankie. The rhino's mouth opened to reveal another cannon which powered up and shot at the gaggle of pirates that were aside, sending them flying by a small albeit powerful explosion. W wow it's a rhino bike. Luffy yelled looking at the bike with a happy glint in his eyes. Even some of the pirates joined him in the excitement, forgetting that they were the ones that are targeted. Some who were preparing to poison Robin as she was vulnerable with her huge hands and feet were swept from their feet by the rhino bike with ease as metal did not get affected by poison or venom. Brachio Tank 5 A huge tank rolled out of the door marked 5 on the Thousand Sunny. It aimed at the pirates readying themselves to attack Frankie's bike with morning stars with spikes made of metal, which they hoped would be the best choice to damage his bike. Shoot, a thunderous sound echoed around for a brief second as the cannon at the tank fired at the pirates. The ground trembled at the explosion, considering this was only second to the main cannon on the Thousand Sunny. The ground dented in impact, with the pirates scattered around. Their bodies lay on the ground smoking from the explosion. 
I am Commander Chopper. Chopper shouted, trying to control his tears from excitement of being able to something he dreamt as a child. Let me take care of the instructions. Did you see my shot, Commander Chopper? Usopp spoke as he lowered the handle of the cannon. I don't miss my targets. It's a tank. Luffy yelled again in happiness. Awesome, Commander Chopper. Shoot, Chopper cried again, cannon firing in response. TCH, those guys won't be of any use against that thing. Daruma said, he walked forward, jumping into the ground and digging into it without ease. Let's see how they escape this trap of mine. He dug various trenches around a certain area where he felt those two would run upon. The Brachio tank slowly rolled onto the same area where Dharma dug the trenches on. But before the ground could break due to the weight, Frankie reached behind the tank and lifted it up with ease. The parts of bike and the tank slowly started merging with him, shooting out the Yuza, Chopper and Nami, along with Papagu who tagged along in the ride. Uh, what the hell was that? Nami yelled in anger at being forcefully ejected from the tank and making her land on the ground harshly. Yuzop and Chopper also looked at Frankie in confusion and a bit of sadness. Sorry, but this is the time for transformation. Frankie grinned. Black Rhino FRU4, stand by. Brachio head, docking. A. Hey, docking. The parts mixed and various gears turned as it revolved around Frankie, encasing him with the parts. A long sword appeared on its back, and a huge metal figure stood in the place of Frankie, looking like the replica of the man himself. The middle had a straw hat pirate emblem on it and its head had a pointy shape, which were the only notable differences. Iron Pirate, General Frankie. The awesome, he is a robot. A real, the kind we all dreamed about, robot. Usopp and Chopper cried in happiness. Luffy shared the excitement with stars on his eyes. What the hell is that? More than few of the pirates turned to look at the robot in excitement and fear, though the former in majority. The Sword of the Pillager, Franken. The robot pulled a long sword from its back, holding it horizontally. General, watch your step. The robot started rotating on its axis, the sword spinning along with it below the waist level of them. Some were caught unguarded by the surprise type of attack, cutting them in the waist below and killing them. Many couldn't stop to stare at their men as they had to jump or get sliced in half. Ugh, he's got so many tricks. Nami and Robin stared at the figure with an unimpressed look. Oi, this one looks weak, a pirate said as he closed in on Nami from behind. He swung his sword, hoping to cut her in half. Nami already heard the footsteps from behind and was prepared for the attack as she met the strike with her foot and kicked it to the side, the sword impacting the ground rather than her. TCH, no matter how much I trained, I am still not fit for physical fights, she said, trying to ignore the small string of pain in her leg from kicking the arm aside. Don't underestimate me. I am not simply a navigator of the straw hat pirates, she said as she pointed her staff at the pirate who charged at her. Gus sword. A massive burst of air released from the staff, impacting the pirate at the chest. He was sent flying backwards onto his crewmates, all groaning from the attack. Nami smirked as she pretended to blow out the smoke from the staff. Oh, awesome Nami. Yuzop cheered. Now then, I have to something otherwise I'll get ripped in half. Yuzop readied his slingshot, with a green pellet in the middle. Special attack green star. Bamboo javelin. Massive bamboo with pointy ends sprouted from the ground as the pellet impacted the ground beneath the incoming pirates. The spear-like bamboo impaled them in various places, leaving them bloody. Those who managed to somehow defend from the impaling were thrown onto the sky, and then crashed in the ground, breaking several bones. They were out of the fight now. Dharma was still digging in the ground, unknown of what was happening above. He suddenly heard someone else digging beside him. He stopped, trying to figure out where it was coming from. His senses alerted that it was heading straight towards him. He had little time to prepare before he was struck from below, sending him towards the ground. Who the hell is that? He yelled in rage. Me. Chopper yelled as he popped up into the air from the ground below. Horn point. Chopper's horns were massive and elegant. His hooves were larger and his forearms were more muscular. He was taller than usual, matching to the height of Dharma. Make no mistake, you are not the only one who could do that. You just caught me off guard for a second. I am sure this won't be repeating again. Dharma replied. You guys sure boast a lot. I wonder if you have the power to back it up. I'll show you how it will be. Messing with straw hat pirates. Chopper grinned and dashed off towards his opponent. Weak fools. They are just falling like flies. Hody gritted his teeth as he breathed for air. No matter how much he tried, he can't get upper hand on Hancock, who was very quickly proving to be a superior opponent. No matter. I will kill you all by myself and then make a new fishman island. Hody said, then I will prove that fool that I will become the pirate king. Hancock's rage surged like a tidal wave, causing her grip on her hacky to falter momentarily. A potent surge of her powerful aura escaped, radiating outward with an intensity that left those nearby helpless and unconscious. The very ground quivered under the weight of her unleashed power, cracks forming as if it struggled to contain the immense pressure. Hancock swiftly reigned in her unleashed hacky, knowing the potential harm it could inflict on innocent bystanders. 
Yet, even as she regained control, one could sense the barely contained furry simmering just beneath the surface of her skin. Are you a fool? Hancock's voice sounded like a whisper, but it was heard clearly by Hody. What? I asked Hancock eyes met Hody's, who instinctively flinched a bit, but barely so it wasn't noticeable. Are you a fool? Hancock slowly started walking towards Hody, who was up on his guard, ready to react. He didn't expect to laugh suddenly. You go on and on about becoming the pirate king and killing the humans or making them slaves, she said, but you don't know the true power that lies in between the man who sits there on his throne. That man has done many impossible things to reach the place he is now the air crackled and the black lightning danced on her arms as she advanced towards Hody. Can you really think you can do it? Can you think you can defeat me in the first place? Your insolence and arrogance have perhaps blinded you, so I will give you an option. Either you surrender right now and I will make your death quick, or we fight and you will die brutally by my hands. She declared, what are you sprouting on about? The one who will be killed is not me but you. Hody raged, looking ready to attack. You fool. That wasn't an option she spoke as she disappeared from his sight before immediately appearing in front of Hody. Perfume femur, cascade shot. Hancock lunged towards Hody. Her legs adorned in an ominous shade of dark red. With blinding speed, she unleashed a devastating strike aimed directly at him. Hody instinctively raised his left hand to shield himself, but the sheer force of Hancock's attack pulverized his arm, tearing it away from his shoulder in an instant. A moment of disbelief washed over Hody as the excruciating pain surged through his body. It took him a few heartbeats to fully comprehend the loss he had just suffered. Before neither of them could reply, a large shadow covered the entire plaza, making everyone pause their fight to look up. The citizens of the island look at the approaching object with shock, as it was the first time anyone has seen it move. But the shock gave way to fear as they saw it approaching towards them. The massive ship, Noah was heading towards them. Luffy had sensed the lone presence inside the ship and the malicious aura that gave way, confirming the identity of the culprit. He looked at the approaching ship. And based on the information that Shura Hoshi gave earlier, he could tell that it was being done by the devil fruit of Vander Decken, aimed at Shura Hoshi for rejecting the marriage proposal. That must be Vander Decken's work. That fool, this complicates the plan, but not in a bad way. We might lose the land here, but we will be able to kill all these lowly humans and teach them the power of fishmen finally Hody thought as he looked at the ship. Sound of someone falling echoed as a large figure crashed onto the plaza. Ah, uh, Captain Decken, I accidentally fell from the ship. Let me inside the ship, Watatsumi yelled as he lifted himself up from the ground. Please captain, don't kill me, I will be useful. That's Watatsumi, if I could get him to my side, it will be useful. Hody thought, don't worry, I am sure he will come and save you once we win in this battle. Hody spoke, the bleeding on his arm had stopped in this commotion. So, fight and crush these human pirates. Shurahoshi understood what was happening the moment Watatsumi spoke of Dekan. She knew she was the one being targeted with the ship. If the ship's bubble were to touch the island's bubble, it will pop, flooding the island immediately. Even the merman folks won't be able to survive for long due to the very high pressure that is present in the depth. Only those like her and fish men folk will be able to survive such pressure. So, she immediately used the bubble coral that Jinbei gave her to inflate a bubble around her and shot out towards the incoming ship. Hey, where are you going? Luffy shouted, but she ignored it and went ahead. Sorry, Luffy-san, everyone. If the ship were to crash into the island, many lives will be lost. I will save the island myself even if it costs my life. Everyone, Luffy addressed his crew, who paused their battles briefly to look at their captain. Don't worry about the ship or Shurahoshi he said, looking at several faces which were filled with worry about the mermaid princess. I will take care of that and make sure to save the island definitely. So, I will leave this place to you. Take care of it. He grinned. The straw hats returned the grin as determination set on their faces. So then, bring it on he smirked as his hairs caught on flame. Gear 5 Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready. You will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.